On this day, the weather outside was pleasantly warm. The residents of the small town gradually filled the streets, greeting each other and inquiring about their well-being. Children frolicked outside under the careful supervision of their parents. Suddenly, an unknown man in a dark cloak appeared not far from the little girl who was happily running to her mother. The child looked back and examined the stranger with surprise. The girl asked her mother with interest if it was the one she was thinking of. The woman replied with a dismissive cluck. Looking at the short man dressed in dark robes, she ordered her daughter not to look at him. The people around him regarded the familiar man with equal disdain. They watched in disgust as the corpse collector moved away toward the shopping plaza. After a while, the guy ended up near one of the commercial buildings near the center. From the name of the signboard, we could tell that the local merchant was a miser of various junk. The old man sitting behind the counter looked toward the entrance with irritation as the door opened. When he saw the guy in the cloak, he asked why the corpse collector had come to see him this time. The other visitors also looked at the man with rejection. As the boy approached the counter, the other customers hurriedly hurried toward the exit. The guy pulled a sack out of his sinus and unfolded it and dumped some bones, claws, and feathers on the tabletop. Immediately, he said that he wanted to sell it all. The miser examined the unexpected merchandise and thought that this kid had brought him some trash again. A second later, he pulled a few bronze coins out of his pocket and tossed them on the table, said he wouldn't give any more for this junk, and ordered the boy to get away. The guy looked at those pennies in surprise and realized that this time he had only been given 20% of the usual price. Furious, he asked the salesman why he was paid so little this time. Suddenly, the old man called the boy a miserable bastard and said that he didn't have a single right to say anything against him since he was just a miserable corpse collector. In this world, there is a danger that awaits anyone at every turn. These are monsters that people have had to live with for decades. However, there are also those who hunt these monsters. Those who decide to dedicate their lives to this and test their fate are called adventurers. Such people mine a lot of expensive materials every day and fight monsters every day. By defeating monsters, they increase their level. Even a slight difference in this metric makes a huge difference in strength. After all, level is the foundation of this world. The hero looked at his hands and almost cried. For him, the bitter realization was that in such a cruel world, his level was one. This guy's name is Ark, and despite his despicable status, he is also an adventurer. After being chased out of the store, the boy went to the market square. As he approached the familiar shop, the boy greeted the old man in the apron and asked if he had some bread for him. The vendor recognized Ark, and pulling a bag from under the counter, said he'd left some bread he hadn't been able to sell yesterday. The boy was a little upset, but still handed over his hard-earned money, realizing that he shouldn't complain. Suddenly, the old man turned to the boy and asked if he should leave his job as an adventurer. This unexpected question put Ark in a stupor. The salesman went on to say that not all people succeed in finding their calling the first time around, and perhaps the boy could find something more suited to him. Ark barely squeezed out a smile and said that he couldn't leave his business after all. He was a notorious corpse collector and no one would just want to hire him. Ever since he was a child, Ark wanted to be an adventurer. But when his dream came true, he learned of his curse. To his great regret, he was among the small number of people who possessed the ability of zero experience. Unlike most adventurers who possessed many useful skills, the lad had rather received a special curse. No matter how many times Ark tried to fight monsters, his level still didn't increase. Even trying to defeat the weakest slimes, he wasn't getting any use out of them. And yet, for several years, the hero tried not to give up. Time after time, he entered the dungeon, hoping that sooner or later he would be able to level up. But each such foray ended in failure. Ark remained on the first level. In the end, he finally lost all hope. But still the boy wished to become an adventurer, and then he found an unconventional way out of this situation. Ark began collecting materials from the corpses of monsters that had previously been defeated by the adventurers. That's when the whole town became aware of him as a notorious corpse collector. Trying to chew the slightly stale bread, Ark thought that the materials from the first level monsters were worth too little, and he should look for better monsters. The boy realized that by collecting every little thing, he would not be able to live for long. Suddenly, several people walked past the protagonist, one of whom accidentally poked the guy in the shoulder. Ark dropped the bread and immediately fell to the ground. The adventurer, who had confronted him a second earlier, saw the familiar cloak. A moment later, he walked over to the bread Ark had dropped and stepped on it with his foot. The boy looked up and said that it was his last meal. However, the man named Jarg looked down on him with contempt. The adventurer immediately recognized the corpse collector. His partners were very pleased with the leader's action, 
Ark once again looked at his assailant with an uncomprehending stare. Everyone in the city knew him as a corpse collector. Because of this stupid nickname, the boy can't find any other job. The hero looked at the trampled loaf and wondered again why this was happening to him. Ark thought frustratedly that his only desire was to follow his dream. But still, no matter how much he was despised, he couldn't just stop searching corpses. Realizing that otherwise he would simply starve to death, the protagonist looked into the goblin cave, populated mostly by low-level monsters. As he looked around the endless ramifications, Ark hoped that at least this time he would find something worthwhile. Suddenly, there was a horrible stench in the tunnel directly in front of him. The hero thought that most likely something very badly rotted here. When he looked ahead, he couldn't believe his eyes. In front of the boy lay a large dragon carcass. Its whole body was covered with wounds and it was beginning to rot. Examining the huge corpse, Ark realized that most likely this monster was around level 200. Then the boy thought that now was not the best time to think about it, and he should finish examining the corpse as soon as possible because most likely he would be able to get some good materials from it, from which he could make money. The corpse collector looked deep into the dragon's innards and realized that no one had left him any dear parts. His attention was drawn to an organ that looked very much like a stomach. Ark realized that it wasn't usually touched, as it had a very strong stench inside. But he was not afraid of it, for corpses were his main livelihood. Suddenly the boy felt something inside his stomach. He was glad that there seemed to be something inside the organ. Ark immediately prepared a knife to open the stomach. Overcoming all dislike, he thrust the knife in close. After the incision was made, the protagonist could not believe his eyes. Inside the state organ, there was a gleam, and the boy saw an object that looked like armor. Finally cutting his stomach open, Ark realized that he had stumbled upon some armor. Suddenly, several bright lightning bolts burst from the metal breastplate. The boy was startled and he jerked backward. Ark figured that if the case involved something dangerous, he wouldn't be able to resist it. Suddenly, a voice from the cut stomach urged the boy to put on his armor. The boy was very surprised that some armor was talking to him. The terrified hero realized that these were definitely very dangerous items anyway. Ark decided not to tempt fate and turned around and headed towards the exit of the cave. But at the same moment, he noticed that someone was blocking his path. There were several goblins standing right in front of the boy, waving their hands threateningly in his direction. Ark realized that even such a seemingly uncomplicated obstacle would be a challenge for him. The guy couldn't understand how he couldn't sense the approach of so many opponents. As he drew his sword and prepared to fight, he realized that now he would have to pay for his inattention. Ark looked fearfully at the approaching goblins and realized that although they were of the same level, his equipment level was too low. Suddenly, three monsters pounced on the protagonist at once. Already after the goblin's first blow, the boy could not keep his sword in his hands, and it flew off to the side. He looked fearfully at the monsters again and couldn't believe it would end like this. It was probably the most shameful of all possible outcomes. But now it was a foregone conclusion. Ark couldn't believe that he would take his life in a place like this, having accomplished nothing in so many years. But at the same instant, the armor suddenly called out to the boy once again. It urged the protagonist to put it on. Ark realized that he wasn't a lifer anyway, and it looked like he was going to have to take his chances. With another glance at the goblins, the boy shouted to the armor that he was agreeing to wear it. At the same instant, the monsters once again attacked the boy. Looking at the attacking monsters, Ark realized that it was better to trust fate completely than to die so easily. Suddenly, the armor responded that the new host's intentions were confirmed, and the new owner's registration was complete. The armor shuddered, and a voice said, activating the fast vestment. Ark turned around and saw several black lightning bolts flying towards him. A moment later, there was a small flash around the protagonist, raising dust in the cave. The goblin stopped and looked at the enemy with some surprise. The system announced that the donning of the abyss armor was complete. At the same moment, Ark stood before his enemies in his new armor. Peering at the clawed gauntlets, the lad wondered if this strange armor was on his side. Armor replied that she was on the hero's side, at which point Ark said he would check that out now. In the same instant, Several goblins swooped down on the guy at once. In addition to the armor, Ark also received a sword that was clearly better than his last blade. The boy swung his weapon and with one blow calmly cut down one of the advancing goblins. In the same instant, the monster's entire body was covered in an unknown glow. As the goblin's body fell to the ground, a blob of energy began to flow from its torso towards the protagonist. A second later, a beam of light pierced the body of Ark, who didn't realize what was happening. But there was no time to think. 
for two more goblins were advancing from the right. Turning around, the hero handled them with equal ease. A smile appeared on his face for the first time in a long time. The carcasses of these monsters also began to emit an unknown glow. Ark only had time to think that his body was very light, but immediately two blobs of energy flew back into his body. As he looked at the remaining opponents, the guy thought he was getting the feeling that he was getting stronger and stronger with each blow. The remaining goblins were slaughtered with the same speed as the last. After defeating the last of his opponents, the guy stopped, trying to figure out how he felt. The first surprise for Ark was that he survived. For the first time, he was able to fight back against the monsters. But the big surprise was that the boy managed to defeat five goblins at once, being at the first level. An unknown glow also poured out from the bodies of the last monsters. But suddenly, the system notified that the adventurer's level had been raised several times at once. Ark couldn't believe his eyes. He had just been told that the guy had raised his current level to sixth. The boy stood still, unable to move from shock. Announcements of this nature were new to him, and he didn't understand what it meant. Plus, it was very strange, considering he had a curse from an early age that prevented him from gaining experience to level up. Suddenly, a system screen popped up in front of the protagonist, notifying him that thanks to the Abyss Armor, Ark had the ability to use the level absorption skill. The boy had never heard of anything like this before. It was then that he saw that he had indeed reached the sixth level. However, it was not done by gaining additional experience. Looking at his arm, Ark realized that this armor allowed him to steal levels from monsters and other creatures. In the same instant, he cried with happiness, not believing what was happening. The boy stood alone in the empty cave, trying to contain his emotions. In that second, Ark realized that he was now starting a new life. After calming down a bit, the boy raised the sword in his hand and realized that he had held the blade before without much difficulty. However, now he had the feeling that all actions were easier and faster. In just a few minutes, the protagonist was able to get five levels at once. Now Ark could quietly go about his pumping without any difficulty. After happily running back and forth across the cave, he stopped to catch his breath. His gaze fell once again on the dragon lying on the ground. Now that he had taken it to the next level, the smell of that corpse felt even more unpleasant. But still, the protagonist had to pay tribute to this dragon, because thanks to him he was able to move to another stage of development. The boy looked around and examined the goblin corpses lying to the side. Suddenly a startling thought struck him. At that moment, Ark thought that if he defeated the remaining creatures in this cave, he could become many times stronger in a short period of time. Examining his body once again, the guy realized that most likely, thanks to this armor, he would not be able to be wounded. That was why there was now the perfect moment to kill all the goblins using such an opportunity. But no sooner had the boy thought about it than suddenly, a loud stomping sounded behind him. Ark saw something huge appear behind his back, casting a shadow over him. The protagonist tried to figure out what kind of feelings he had just experienced. Looking around, he thought, there certainly shouldn't be any strong goblins in this cave. But when Ark saw what appeared behind his back, he was stunned and unable to say a word. The goblin lord towered in front of him. The system said that his level was 35. A crowd of several dozen smaller goblins had also gathered right behind him. The boy tried to assume a fighting pose, not realizing where one of the higher monsters had come from. After assessing the situation, he realized that he would definitely not win this fight and needed to rush to the exit. However, behind his back, several small monsters were already climbing onto the dragon carcass, thus blocking the exit. The terrified hero realized that these creatures were attracted to the smell of rotting meat. Suddenly, the armor warned the wearer that the main opponent was level 35 and recommended that the guy retreat. No sooner had Ark thought that escape wouldn't be so easy than the Supreme Goblin struck the first blow at the same instant. The boy had managed to deflect, but he was now in a vulnerable position. The monster that realized this immediately re-attacked the protagonist, who managed to block the blow at the last moment. Yet the force of the goblin's swing was so startling that Ark was thrown several meters aside. The protagonist flew into one of the cave walls with all his might and fell, unable to move. After gathering his wits, the boy barely lifted himself up. He looked straight in front of him and saw a high goblin walking towards him. Ark was surprised at the monster's monstrous strength. After looking into the eyes of this horrible creature, the protagonist realized that he was still too weak. Being cornered, Ark lost his composure for a moment and shouted with all his might. Barely holding back tears, the boy couldn't believe that only a short time ago, he had just succeeded in reaching a new level. And now, he was once again in a hopeless situation. And yet, after a few more dodges, the guy still managed to sneak out into one of the narrow passageways. 
However, there was now the question of how the protagonist would get out of this trap. The main exit is guarded by an army of goblins that he certainly couldn't handle. Looking around, Ark tried to think of some other method to get out of the cave. Noting his weakness once again, he thought that one logical way out might be to simply wait for the goblin army to move away from the exit. Suddenly, a knife-wielding monster appeared right in front of the boy in the hallway. This level 1 goblin was all alone and posed no danger at all. After the creature jumped, trying to attack Ark, the guy grabbed the monster's head. In the next instant, he spun around and smashed the goblin's head against the cave wall. After making sure the enemy was dead, the guy let go of the breathless body. Absorbing the creature's level, the protagonist stated that in this world, level decides everything. Then, he also thought that any monster should understand the difference between the two, just as Ark himself understood his difference between him and the Goblin Lord. While the boy was thinking about it, the system alerted him to a level up. A blob of energy flowed into the hero's body, and suddenly Ark came to another thought. After all, at that moment, there was nothing stopping him from gaining a level in the dungeon to defeat the Goblin Lord later on. Whereas before he couldn't kill, now everything has changed. In his new reality, he has to kill to survive. A few minutes later, the hallways of the cave erupted in a frenzy of screams. Ark found one goblin after another and immediately cut them down. With each new victim, the level gradually increased. The progression was very fast. After a short period of time, any goblin ceased to present any difficulty and became merely a chore. Ark would knock out monsters in groups. After that, he waited for the level to be absorbed. Then he thought with indifference that in this world only the strongest survives. Those who want to survive must have a high level, and anyone who shows weakness will always obey the strong. Ark knew that from his own experience. After how many minutes of carnage, the guy continued to make his way deeper into the caves. By then, he had already reached level 15. Suddenly, Ark saw a passageway in front of him, which was illuminated by two torches. The mysterious branch in the corridor interested the hero. Plus, the armor suddenly said that on his recommendation, the lad should check out the side caves. The protagonist, interested on, went towards the passageway, hoping there was something of value there. When he had passed through the passage, Ark could not believe his eyes. He saw a small room filled to the top with gold coins and various riches. Inspecting the untold riches, the boy realized that the goblins had stolen all these treasures from the humans. This was not surprising, as ordinary humans cannot cope with even the weakest of creatures. Looking around the space around him, the hero decided to look for something he could use and that he could use. Suddenly, his gaze fell on a strange box to his right. Ark walked over to the interesting object and pulled the cover off of it. The box was filled to the top with various elixirs. Armor explained that it was presumably a recovery potion. The boy took one of the flasks in his hand, and after examining the liquid inside, he realized that it looked like it was. Deciding it was a useful item, he took a few with him for the battle. It was then that Ark learned through the system that there was a special space in the armor specifically for potions. Suddenly, the left side of the armor glowed brightly, startling the wearer. After the flash ended, the guy noticed that he now had a special notch for potions. Satisfied, Ark immediately slipped the first flask into the vacant cell. Thus, he emptied the entire container, mentally thanking the armor. After examining the untold riches lying around, the boy thought it would be nice to take a few bags of coins from here but they would get in the way in battle. Despite his rapid pumping, Ark's main goal now was to return to the city alive and unharmed. Now that the hero is stronger, he will be able to return and take on the business of selling materials from higher-ranked monsters. But in order to do so, he had to pass a very difficult test. After pondering a plan of action, Ark decided to set off when suddenly someone's voice came from behind him. The boy was very much surprised by this, for the voice was clearly human. Turning around, Ark ran towards the boxes from behind which someone was calling for help. Running around the clutter, the guy looked around the place where someone had yelled from. Suddenly, the boy saw that a frightened girl with bound hands and feet was sitting across from him. Then he realized that the goblins seemed to be kidnapping people as well. At the sight of her savior, the girl cried with happiness. Ark decided not to delay and immediately untied the captive. As he untangled the rope, he looked at the girl with a sympathetic look and said she was very lucky he had noticed her. A captive named Mill, who lives in the village of Rakuru, thanked her rescuer heartily. Just then, she shyly asked the stranger what his name was. The protagonist hesitated to answer, realizing that he was also known in that village. After gathering his strength, he answered that his name was Ark. The girl was horrified for a while and recognized who stood before her. Seeing that Mill was shocked, the protagonist explained that everyone knows him as a corpse collector. The girl said confusedly that she had heard of such a man from town rumors. 
At the same instant, she looked under her feet and saw the rope untied, her face instantly filled with joy. Mill learned that you shouldn't judge people based on rumors. She confidently stated to Ark that he was completely different from what was being told about him throughout the neighborhood. The protagonist was surprised by this, and he turned around asking what she meant. The girl happily said that he had just saved her life. And even based on that fact, in her opinion, the boy didn't look at all like some kind of corpse collector. Mill smiled and said that for her, Arxon was now a hero. These words of the man he rescued had a profound effect on the boy. All his life he wanted to be an adventurer who saves people from danger. Looking at the girl who had collected a few gold coins in her purse, he said it was time for them to go. Turning his back to Mill, Ark said he would walk the girl to the village. The rescued child asked the boy what he just said. However, the boy said to just follow him. The protagonist thought that, even if only a little, he was happier after all. The travelers progressed down the long corridors toward the exit. Suddenly, a powerful roar was heard ahead, making the blood run cold. Ark turned to Mill and said she needed to sit behind the rocks for a while and keep her head down. Looking ahead again, the boy realized that there were many goblins ahead of him, perhaps even a whole army. The protagonist was not mistaken with his assessment of the situation, and in a few seconds a large squad of monsters appeared in the darkness. Their numbers were very large, and they walked confidently toward the uninvited guests. Drawing his sword and preparing for battle, Ark assessed the makeup of his opponents, counting about 20 level 1 goblins. Mentally, he thought that these goblins had better get ready. Pointing the ball toward his opponents, the guy said those would soon be his level. After these words, the goblins instantly ran towards the boy, waving their weapons and shouting at the top of their voices. Ark immediately went into battle mode, starting to slaughter one monster after another. The speed and strength of the blade allowed it to dominate this battle unchallenged. The protagonist spared no one. It seemed that he was getting even for the years of humiliation he had experienced before. One by one, the goblins' bodies began to turn into an experience. Blobs of energy were directed towards the player time after time, and the system announced the level up. As he continued to chop his opponents to pieces, Ark realized that he was attacking faster and faster thanks to his level increase. In addition, the protagonist developed a reaction that allowed him to immediately interrupt all monster attacks. Suddenly, the kid was attacked from behind by four goblins at once. Ark reacted easily to the unexpected situation and soared upwards in one leap. After staying in the air for a few seconds, it once again descended upon the monsters, slicing them one by one. Time after time, the system continued to notify me of the level increase. Now the guy could just have fun with his opponents. Tossing one of the goblins aloft, Ark rushed after him in the next instant. A second later, he sliced that opponent in half as well. The monsters on the ground looked up with some surprise. The boy flashed a glance, determining his next targets. The goblins, seeing the confidence appear on their opponent's face, seemed to realize that they didn't stand a chance. In the next instant, several swift blows wiped out the remaining group. After a couple of seconds, Ark stopped, finding himself among the cut corpses of goblins. The system started recalculating the owner's level and then raised this indicator to 35 units. Mill looked out from behind the rock fearfully and asked the guy if she could come out. However, the main character said that it wasn't time yet. After these words, the girl looked around fearfully, thinking that another monster was lurking somewhere. Suddenly, a loud roar was heard in the distance. Ark looked away, surprised that the goblin lord had come only now, after so much of his kin's blood had been spilled. Opposite the boy towered a huge creature holding a huge-sized cleaver in his hand. The goblin was many times larger than Ark. He seemed to be able to crush the protagonist with just one of his feet. The boy decided that now was the moment when he would defeat the goblin lord. The monster cocked its head upward and shrieked furiously at the sight of the stranger. Ark shouted. Now he was no longer the weakling who had cowardly fled not so long ago. Immediately after saying that, the goblin lord readied his cleaver and swung it around to attack first. The boy shouted again to his soulless opponent not to think the battle would be easy. The moment his opponent swung around to strike, the protagonist attacked first, slashing into the monster's stomach. The creature immediately grabbed the affected spot and shouted in rage throughout the cave. Finding himself behind the enemy's back, the protagonist immediately found himself surrounded by several more smaller goblins. After counting the small monsters, Ark realized that there were no more than ten of them. Accordingly, they wouldn't be much trouble. With that thought, the boy figured that as long as the goblin lord was still alive, he wouldn't want to be distracted by any minnows. That's when the main character called out to Mill and told her to throw knives at him. The girl grabbed a belt of throwing blades from the ground and immediately turned her around. Swinging around, she hurled the unloading belt in the direction of her savior. In flight, 
Most of the knives fell out of their cells and flew chaotically toward Ark. Mill, realizing that she had made a big mistake, shouted for the guy to excuse her. However, the confident boy said it was all nothing. Moments later, he jumped up and caught two daggers while surveying the battlefield. With his first throw, Ark accurately pierced two goblins at once. The hero then changed his dislocation slightly to make it more convenient to catch the remaining daggers. Taking aim, he again spotted the monsters standing next to each other and also killed two of them with a single throw. Ark then ran past the remaining six goblins, picking up falling blades along the way. A few seconds later, he stopped in front of the crowd, holding the six knives he had caught. The protagonist looked at his opponents and muttered that today just wasn't their day. He then added confidently that no one should disturb him when he was at work. Swinging around, Ark shouted that the servant's desire to help their master had only made their situation worse. A second later, the guy swung his arms and released all six daggers at once, which struck the remaining six goblins. After making sure that all the minnows were dead, the hero reached for his sword again, seeing the notification that his level had been raised to 45. Suddenly, a powerful roar sounded from behind the boy's back. It turned out that the goblin lord, who had already come to the family, found himself behind Ark's back. At the same moment, the monster attacked his opponent. The guy only raised his sword above his head, not even turning to his opponent. In the beginning, the hero thought that since his level was now higher than that big guy's, it should be easier for him. However, the big man seemed to be getting stronger blow by blow. The incessant attacks forced the boy to back off a bit. He didn't understand how the wounded goblin continued to exert such pressure. As a result, the boy backed away, catching his breath and thinking about what he should do next. Suddenly, the armor alerted that the monster had an artifact that increased its performance in battle. In the case of the goblin lord, it was the bracelet on his right arm. That's when Ark saw what the artifact was and immediately understood everything. After a while, any adventurer has a situation where they can't raise their level as easily. To do this, all adventurers use a variety of artifacts that enhance one or more characteristics. But Ark couldn't even guess that monsters could also use such things to improve their fighting ability. Then the boy prepared for battle and realized that his purpose was now clear. Without destroying this bracelet, he wouldn't be able to win the battle. Therefore, it was necessary to attack the artifact first. The monster once again threw a reckless strike, which Ark easily dodged. Yet after the creature applied the artifact, its speed also increased, and getting the bracelet wouldn't be easy. It looks like the hero is going to have to go all out to win. Ark lunged at the monster once more. The goblin immediately blocked his blow. At the same time, the boy put all his strength into this strike, hoping to break through the block the monster had put up. It was obvious from the high goblin's face that he was having a hard time repelling this attack. At some point, however, he prepared for a counterattack by taking a different position in the prop. At the same instant, he swung with his cleaver, tossing the boy aside. Ark couldn't do anything with that much force and flew off to the side. This time, however, he managed to group himself in midair, and he didn't hurt himself on landing. His attention was drawn to the daggers stuck into the bodies of the minions he had recently killed. Picking up two throwing knives, the guy thought of another option to get close to the monster's amulet. As a distraction, he threw a knife at his opponent on the run. The thug easily repelled the throw with the blade of his cleaver. Then Ark threw another blade on the run so he had a chance to get even closer. This time, the knife hit the handle of the cleaver, but still did not do any damage to the thug. But the point was just that these throws helped them the protagonist get as close to the enemy as possible. Seeing the boy in front of his face, the high goblin held out his cleaver in front of him, blocking the passage to vulnerable areas. After the monster fended off his blow, Ark soared upward, aiming for the final blow. Then, the boy flew toward the ground at great speed and was behind the monster's back. As he flew, he muttered that the most important thing in battle was to stay alert. The Supreme Goblin had time to see the approaching danger. However, it was difficult to react to it. Nevertheless, the creature turned around and tried to block this unexpected attack with its right hand. That's when the guy's blade struck the artifact. Having finished the first phase of the battle, Ark jumped to the ground. The enormous-sized goblin still loomed before him, but his face, however, no longer had such confidence on it. Confident in his future victory, the protagonist muttered that he would not tolerate any surprises now. As a last chance, Ark offered to let the goblin lord escape, at least if he could do so. However, the monster didn't even back up after saying that. On the contrary, he took a few steps towards the boy. The adventurer realized that in such a case the outcome of the fight was already predetermined and rushed towards the thug. Taking advantage of the surprise effect and the speed advantage, Ark flanked and swung his sword. The goblin had time to react to this sudden attack, but now their forces were completely unequal. 
The now monster flew several dozen meters into the nearest wall after blocking the blow. Blood gushed from his mouth from the force of the blow. Ark walked up to his almost defeated opponent and asked what was the matter now, and was he really afraid of him? The boy shouted that the creature's life was now at stake and threw several swift blows. During one of the attacks, the goblin lord dropped his cleaver, which flew off to the side. It was a few meters away and stabbed its blade into the stone floor. Ark looked at his opponent and realized that this was his big chance. If he defeated this huge monster, he would be rid of his weakness and the ridicule of society forever. However, the monster didn't seem to be about to give up and in the next second tried to hit the guy with his fist. However, the boy was ahead of the enemy and plunged his sword into the monster's body first. The huge carcass of the defeated enemy began to fall forward by inertia. Ark said he would be much stronger because of this battle. The big man collapsed to the ground with his whole body, raising a large cloud of dust. Meanwhile, the guy thanked his opponent for the opportunity. Dozens of small clots of energy began to emerge from the monster's body. One by one, they headed towards the hero's body, gradually raising his level. After a while, the system once again recalculated Ark's experience. Now he had reached the 80th level. The boy looked toward the cliff where he was leaving his companion and said she could go out now. The girl walked over and looked in surprise at the carcass of the defeated monster. She could not believe that a man, who everyone around her had recently known as a corpse collector, could now defeat such a powerful creature. Unexpectedly, Mill cheerfully said that Arxon was now the strongest adventurer of the area. Such a title flattered and surprised the lad at the same time. After a while, he began to dismember the monster's huge body. In the end, he managed to take the large fang of the Supreme Goblin as a nice trophy. Looking longingly at the long-awaited booty, the boy could not believe that the day would come when he would obtain such a rare material. Suddenly, Mill held out her hand and said she could carry all this stuff in her sack. Ark trusted the rescued girl without a second thought, and besides the fang, he also gave her the cursed bone and the sword of the Goblin Lord. The guy thanked the girl for helping him with the materials, to which the companion replied that it was not difficult for her because the boy saved her life. Suddenly, Mill asked what they were going to do with that huge monster body. Ark replied that he had already collected all the good materials that could be extracted from it. Then the hero thought that now with this armor and the new high level, he no longer needed to hide from anyone, and he could safely return to the village. The girl immediately said that if they left even one of the living goblins here, the kidnapping from the village might continue again. These words had a powerful effect on Ark. He realized that now he could earn the village's respect again by saving its girls from the monsters. The boy turned towards the corridors going deep into the cave and asked Mill if she would stay with him a little longer. The girl answered that she didn't mind, but asked where they were going to go. Ark replied that his main concern now was to prevent the kidnappings from continuing. So he decided that the right thing to do would be to kill all the goblins in this cave so they wouldn't bother anyone else. A short while later, the two companions returned to the village. The two companions returned to the village a while later. He was surprised at the fact that he had made a good amount of experience gains in the last 24 hours. When he left the village, he was only level 1, but now he was already level 100. Besides, with so much experience, he was now able to handle almost any monster in the immediate area. The boy glowed at the thought that he could now be called the ultimate adventurer. A tired mill asked her savior what he had just said, and the boy recounted his thoughts to her. After a few seconds, the girl yelled out that she had never seen adventurers with triple-digit levels in her life. She replied in surprise that the guy was definitely not a newcomer, but instead the strongest adventurer of the village. For his part, Ark couldn't answer anything. He himself had never seen adventurers with such a level. Looking at his companion, the guy said she was absolutely right about everything. It was then that the boy reflected that he must now move on somewhere else, for the local neighborhoods were no longer of such use to him for his pumping. The protagonist recalled how he had shown Mill his ability to absorb opponents' levels. The companion was clearly surprised by this. The girl muttered that with such strength, Arxon could become even much stronger. She smiled sweetly at her rescuer and said she would keep her fists up for him from now on. Suddenly from the side, someone approached and marveled at the scene taking place in front of him. It was just the adventurer named Jarg with his troop. He said hello to the corpse collector. Ark looked coldly at his opponent and grudgingly greeted him back. The guy with white hair asked his interlocutor rudely, what was that armor he was wearing and where did he get it from? Without waiting for an answer, he chuckled and realized that the boy couldn't rely on his curse and decided to fix that problem with armor. Mockingly, with a wave of his hand, Jarg said that anyone who was ever a corpse collector would always remain trash. 
The adventurer added confidently that the boy would remain a first-level weakling, and no amount of armor would fix that flaw. However, while his opponent taunted him, Ark wasted no time and decided to move from words to action. A moment later, the protagonist was in front of Jarg, thrusting one of his daggers forward. In the same second, he said he was sick of all this. With a cold look at the arrogant adventurer, Ark said he was bored with all this talk and ordered the boy to shut up. The white-haired guy stared at the weakling, who was now suddenly right in front of him with a knife at the ready. He looked angrily at the boy and said that a freak always stays a trash. A moment later, Jarg snapped out of this threatening state and found himself at Ark's side. An attempted leg kick was unsuccessful, and the protagonist calmly blocked the attack. The devastated Jarg shouted that he wouldn't let some snotty corpse collector get cocky. With those words, he reached for his sword. But no sooner had the lad taken out his blade than he was immediately thrown into a chill by what had happened. Ark was already standing in front of him. The hero anticipated that his opponent would reach for his weapon and immediately knocked the blade out of his hands. Jarg sat on the ground and shouted that this simply couldn't be. His aides had already circled the enemy from behind and had drawn their blades, but they were still hesitant to attack. Ark turned to the adventurers and asked coldly, Did they really want to try it too? Both fighters were dumbfounded and did not dare to move. Jarg, sitting on the ground, exclaimed that he was already level 20 and he had been defeated by some corpse collector. He realized that the rumor of his defeat to a first-level weakling would spread throughout the village and town. Upon hearing that Jarg was only level 20, Ark laughed and called his opponent a weakling, saying that he was several times weaker than him. Suddenly, one of the adventurers standing aside, trembling with his whole body, asked his superior to check the level of this weakling. The guy lifted himself off the ground and opened the information panel, not realizing what the problem could be. But what he saw plunged him into the deepest horror. Jarg shook his whole body and couldn't understand why this weakling had suddenly obtained the hundredth level. The boy looked up fearfully at the man he had wronged for so many years in a row. In a trembling voice, he asked if it was really true, and how did Ark turn into such a monster? The main character exhaled and said that first everyone called him a corpse collector, and now someone was going to call him a monster. Then he looked with a merry look at his opponents and said that he was only the simplest of lawyers. However, it suddenly appeared that there was no one at the place where Jarg had been sitting a second ago. All three of them ran off without a backward glance, shouting that they didn't want to mess with that monster anymore. He was surprised at how fast they could run when they were in danger. A tired mill looked at her savior and said that it seemed that Ark had really changed. She smiled sweetly at the guy again and said she was very happy for him. It was as if the girl had a burst of strength and she ran aside and called the boy after her. Seeing a companion on the village street, Mill suggested that everyone around him spread the word about his new abilities. A few minutes later, the door of the hoarder's store swung open abruptly. The old man looked through the doorway and saw the man everyone knows as the corpse collector. Not holding out any hopes, but peering at the guy's armor, the hoarder said he was willing to listen to suggestions. The boy with a smile on his face walked up to the counter and said he once again wanted to sell materials. When the protagonist came closer, the old man marveled at how the guy had changed in such a short period of time. Still, he looked at the regular visitor and said that the one just shouldn't waste their time, since the kid had probably brought some trash. Nevertheless, Ark did not leave, but instead showed the old man his sack, asking him if he really thought it was trash. The hoarder couldn't believe his eyes at what he saw. He could tell at a glance what kind of artifact the young corpse collector had brought him. The guy who used to bring things no more expensive than a few bronze coins was now holding a large fang of a goblin lord in front of him. The old man took the artifact and examined it with some distrust. Ask him if it was a fake and how did the boy get it? Ark said without hesitation. He came to the dungeon and personally killed that goblin. The stunned old man still said he couldn't take the word of the man who was always carrying his junk around. The guy had a trump card up his sleeve. He called Mill and she confirmed that it was true. To confirm his words, the protagonist completely untied the bag and dumped a bunch of various artifacts and materials on the table. The hoarder practically didn't say a word and just stared at it silently. A satisfied Ark asked the old man if he would buy or if they would go to another person who needed it all more. The guy looked at the jewelry and said there would probably be an easy buyer for such a big score. The old man panicked and immediately shouted that he would buy everything, for it would be sacrilege to refuse such valuable materials. The guy smiled and said he hoped his labors would be appreciated. Immediately afterward, Ark and Mill headed to the market to see the protagonist's grandfather. The old man was overjoyed to see his grandson back after a very long time. However, what was his surprise when the boy showed him a sack full of gold coins? 
Grandpa couldn't believe what he was seeing and immediately asked his grandson where he got that kind of money. Ark replied that he was finally able to defeat a very strong monster after all. The boy immediately smiled at his relative and congratulated him on the occasion. The old man immediately rushed to hug his grandson. The satisfied guy said that he is really happy that he has now reached the next level. But suddenly the protagonist heard some strange noise behind him. Many villagers crowded around the main gate. They watched with interest what was happening in the field. Ark said he'd be here soon and asked Grandpa and Mill to wait here. Meanwhile, it was turbulent in the pasture. The village was raided by werewolves. These monsters have already managed to break down several fences and bite residents. One of the monsters pounced on a local villager who tried to run away in tears. The girl wouldn't have succeeded if it hadn't been for Ark, who came in time to cut the werewolf in two with a single blow. After tackling the first monster, he asked the woman if she was okay, to which the terrified fellow villager told the guy that she was fine. The boy looked at the remaining werewolves and wondered what they were. Examining the snarling, dog-like monsters, he suddenly thought that it basically didn't matter. Striking a confident pose, he shouted to the werewolves that they didn't belong here, and they shouldn't have come here. Pulling out his sword and pointing it in the direction of the monsters, Ark muttered that these things wouldn't make their way into the village today. After these words, the small group of werewolves was joined by a few more individuals who had previously been prowling around in another part of the village. Looking at the group of level 8 werewolves, the guy thought that it would be advisable to fight them in a non-village area. Many villagers ran away in panic, shouting that it was urgent to call Jarg and his group. And at that moment, Ark remembered that the village's only defenders had just recently fled away. As he looked around the group of werewolves again, he realized that since he had caused Jarg's escape, he would now have to take full responsibility. At the same instant, the first werewolves launched their attack. Dodging the werewolves' swift attacks, the guy thought that since they were level 8, their attacks posed no danger to him. Meanwhile, the monsters gradually began to scatter and, contrary to the protagonist's opinion, did not concentrate the entire attack on him. On the contrary, they spread out to attack the inhabitants. Seeing this, Ark realized that his priority right now was to protect his fellow villagers. If no one intervenes in this massacre, sooner or later all the people will simply be slaughtered. One of the werewolves almost ate the young man, who had no way of resisting the fast and strong monster. However, Ark arrived in time, just seconds before the tragedy, saving someone's life. Looking around, he assessed the situation and chose his next target. Nearby was another werewolf, who was also successfully struck by the protagonist's blade. Standing in a fighting stance and surveying the battlefield, the boy asked the man who had fallen to the ground if he was injured. The shivering villager replied that he was fine. To his great surprise, the lad recognized his rescuer as a corpse collector. Ark replied that he didn't care what they called him, but right now he had a job to do. In the next instant, he rushed to where another group of werewolf had rushed. The protagonist realized that although the other people still considered him a corpse collector, he couldn't just let them all die. Time after time, this situation was repeated. None of the residents who had ever seen the corpse collector believed that this weakling was now saving their village from ruin. The guy had perfected his movements to the point of automatism managing to help the poor people in the last moments. Most of the werewolves didn't even have time to react to the approaching strong enemy, who hit them clearly in vulnerable points. After hitting the last werewolf, Ark stopped to collect all the levels. To his great surprise, the system increased his rank by another 72 positions. However, by his calculations, there had to be a 10th werewolf still running around somewhere. After killing the entire group of werewolves, the protagonist should have gained 80 levels. It only meant that Ark had missed one of the werewolves, who was now hiding somewhere. When he looked around, he saw that the werewolf had climbed to the roof of the building and had already marked its prey in the form of a little girl. The distance to the target was long, and the protagonist realized that he was unlikely to get there in time. And at the same moment, the monster jumped off the roof and flew towards the defenseless child. There seemed to be no way the guy could protect one person. Upset. He figured that even with such a high level, he still wouldn't be able to save everyone. It was only seconds before the werewolf fell that the girl saw danger approaching from above. There was no way he could accept that, Ark thought. But the only way out of the situation was to try to throw the sword directly into the monster's body. The risk of force majeure was greatly increased, but the boy had no choice. With that thought, he drew his sword and swung it like a dart. Taking quick aim, Ark hurled his blade towards the werewolf. The sword flew towards the falling monster at a tremendous speed. By sheer luck, the blade entered clearly into the monster's throat. The force of the throw threw the werewolf's body into the wall of the house so that its carcass did not crush the child. The frightened girl squatted down and clutched her head as the main character approached her. The child looked up and saw his savior as a corpse collector. 
she shyly asked Ark if he was really here to save them all, to which the protagonist replied that he was. The satisfied kid thanked the guy heartily for saving the village. Ark, with a smile on his face, waved his hand to the next person he saved, inwardly rejoicing that he had managed to keep everyone alive. As he looked around, he suddenly realized that the locals now had some serious talk for him. There were a lot of people crowded around him, and all of them had questions. A man in a business suit approached the protagonist, saying that on behalf of the village, he was inviting Ark to talk to him. The boy thought to himself that surely these people would be unhappy with the fact that they had been saved by some pathetic corpse collector. The representative of the delegation turned to Ark with some nervousness. The protagonist, realizing where this was going, turned around and said he had to go, because he realizes that no one here wants to see the face of a corpse collector. But suddenly the man in the business suit asked the guy to wait. Ark turned and asked what else they wanted from him. But suddenly, the man thanked the guy for saving their lives. This turn of events surprised the protagonist very much. People recognized that the guy had done an incredible deed, saving many lives. And all this despite the general dissatisfaction with Ark's work. The guy in the business suit said that thanks to the hero, none of them were hurt. And the boy himself was ready to sacrifice his life to save them all. So on behalf of all the villagers, the man asked the corpse collector to accept their gratitude. This sudden change in his relationship with the villagers really touched Ark. Suddenly, a woman approached the guy, next to whom was a girl, which the hero saved not quite recently. The girl looked at her daughter and also personally thanked her child's savior. This one she bowed to Ark without a hitch. The boy was very embarrassed by this ceremony and asked the woman to raise her head urgently. He added with a smile on his face that all he wanted to do was save everyone and everything worked out the way it was supposed to. The hero turned to the man in the business suit and said that he used to collect loot from corpses. And that, alas, would not change. However, as of late, he has developed a power that allows him to help people. After looking around at the villagers, Ark said that he would now become an adventurer to help the people. So the guy asked his fellow villagers to look out for him as well, and for that he would be grateful to everyone. That day, Ark finally went from a pathetic corpse collector to an adventurer who saved an entire village from destruction. The next morning was equally unremarkable. Sleep-deprived people crowded the streets of the village. A girl in a green dress with a red sash was running down the alley. She barely caught up with the protagonist going about her business. The girl said hello to Arkson as she walked and wished him a good morning. The guy turned around in surprise and saw Mill, who he hadn't caught after last night. The girl looked at the protagonist in surprise and asked where he had put his beautiful armor. The boy smiled and said that he had been wearing the armor of the abyss all along. In the same instant, he snapped his fingers to demonstrate his recent find. A second later, the main character was wearing all of his armor. He explained to the girl that he had discovered yesterday that he could put on and take off this armor whenever he wanted. The girl clapped her hands and mouthed that it was very cool. Ark looked at his armor again and said with a smile on his face that they were the reason he was able to become a true adventurer. The boy remarked that he had been very lucky when he had found them in the cave. However, the main issue was different. The entire set of uniforms he had found in the dragon's body but what was the carcass of such a large beast doing in the goblin cave? On the other hand, the boy is unlikely to know the answer to that question anytime soon. Meanwhile, strange events were taking place in the goblin cave. Jarg shouted to his group to move faster and get out of here. The assistants would tearfully run away, begging the boss to help them. But suddenly, something instantly killed them both. Jarg ran, trying not to look back and not realizing what was happening. Losing his mind, he turned around and shouted to the monster across the room what he was forgetting in this low-level cave. This question sounded in the pitch darkness, from which only a huge yellow eye was visible, staring intently at Jarg. Suddenly, the darkness was cut by flashes of electricity. Jarg squatted down, realizing that he could not escape any longer. His whole body trembling, he did not believe that this was the end. Meanwhile, the eye began to concentrate a huge amount of energy into one point. Moments later, a powerful purple energy beam pierced the cavernous darkness, killing Jarg. The rumble of such an explosion was felt even by Ark. Turning around to the direction where the goblin cave was roughly located, he wondered what could have happened there. A few minutes earlier, Jarg's group had been chasing a blue cyclops that was running through the woods near the village. The squad leader lamented that they had almost finished this monster, but now they might miss it altogether. His 16th and 17th level subordinates sped up at the order of their captain. Suddenly, the group saw Cyclops run into the goblin cave. This behavior of the monster surprised all three of them. However, there could also be some disadvantages to it. Jarg was nervous because while the village had been attacked by werewolves, their group had been elsewhere, 
and because of that they had been fined. Accordingly, killing the Cyclops could have boded well for their monetary reward, which could have helped restore the adventurer's financial health. Now their prey was fleeing through the branching dark corridors of the dungeon. Almost at the entrance, the monster smelled a strong odor of rotting flesh. Cyclops immediately headed towards the source of that odor. He soon found himself in a large room where the rotten corpse of a dragon lay. After the odor intensified, the Cyclops' body began to shake. His mouth began to open on its own, and from the looks of it, he could barely restrain himself from pouncing on the dead carcass. The adventurers who entered the corridor oh heard a chugging sound ahead and headed in the direction of the sound. At a certain point, there was an intimidating sound, not at all like the voice of a Cyclops. Nevertheless, the group continued onward. At some point, all three of them smelled a foul odor of rot. Better ahead of the squad, Jarg was suddenly stunned when he saw an unknown monster in front of him. He asked his subordinates if they saw what he saw. To their great horror, in one branch of the cave, the corpse of a huge monster lay on the ground. A cyclops lay on top of it, greedily devouring the rotting flesh. Judging by the expression on his face, he was enjoying the action immensely. Suddenly, the guy in the group muttered that something doesn't add up here. Indeed, at a certain point, the Cyclops' body took on an unknown form that no one in the squad had heard of before. Jarg trembled with fear and could not move. For a moment, he thought it was all just a bad dream. A few minutes later, Ark reached the Goblin Cave. As he had expected, all the tracks led to this place. The boy realized that it wasn't just a strange feeling. Here, he felt the presence of something unusual. Everything around him said that the further journey should continue in the cave. For a moment, the protagonist thought he had a special connection to this place. Suddenly, he heard a long roar followed by a scream inside the cave. At this point, the hero tensed up a lot. It became clear that this was not an ordinary case. Walking down the main corridor, Ark plugged his nose. The smell from inside the cave was getting stronger and stronger. There should be a dragon corpse just ahead. But what the guy saw at the corpse scene shocked him beyond belief. Opposite him stood a cyclops of enormous size. Two human corpses lay at his feet, and he held the third on his outstretched arm. Still, this creature was very different from the usual cyclops. For unknown reasons, it had small wings on the back. As soon as the protagonist entered the hall, the monster immediately noticed him. He was no longer interested in the victim he was holding in his hand. The monster threw the corpse into the wall with incredible force. The monster then turned towards Ark and looked at him fiercely. Its body was of phenomenal size. The boy thought that there was no such thing as such a large cyclops. The protagonist did not expect such a strong and frightening aura. He had not encountered such demons of such a strange form. However, the boy thought that he didn't care right now, because he was already 180th level, and with such a level, it was impossible to lose. Ark decided that the best defense was offense, so he decided to attack first before this monster regained his senses. Suddenly, the armor suggested that the difference in level between the wearer and the creature was too great, and any battle was recommended to be avoided. The protagonist was greatly surprised and confused by this news. In the same instant, before he knew it, the monster gave him the strongest blow to his chest. Ark had never experienced this kind of pain before, and this blow shocked him greatly. The protagonist's body flung backwards a few meters into the wall without a word. Falling to the ground, the boy barely tried to get up. His entire body was trembling and aching. He didn't understand how such superiority was possible in such a low-level cave. The system opened an information panel with a recommendation to view the monster's level. It was a waste that Ark hadn't checked his opponent's level first. What he saw shocked him. Opposite him was a creature called the Cyclops of the Abyss. It was currently at level 200. At the same time, the armor warned that the enemy was accumulating a huge amount of energy in the head area. The system recommended an urgent retreat, but Ark didn't have the strength to even get to his feet. The repeated requests from the system and armor for the main player to immediately retreat did not stop, and the monster only seemed to give it a chance. Ark tried to get to his feet with great difficulty, but even if he had gotten up, it would hardly have changed the final outcome. The boy could not believe that he had once again come to this cave that was once again trying to take his life. Suddenly, the system started counting down the seconds until the monster's control shot. Seven seconds before the attack, the guy used his sword to pull himself up. However, there was no strength for further movements. It was the maximum that Ark's body could produce at that moment. After a time, the monster emitted a strongest energy beam from its forehead. The flow of energy did not penetrate the main character's body through, but it fried him and threw him aside. 
The guy flew off to the other end of the cave and once again typed into the wall. It seemed as if his whole body was fractured. The boy was still trying to keep his eyes open, but it was getting harder by the second. A few seconds before passing out, Ark realized that now he had definitely lost. After the Cyclops stopped emitting a beam of energy, he looked at the defeated enemy. Suddenly, he turned around and headed towards the exit of the cave. Some time passed before the protagonist woke up again. He got up on all fours with great difficulty, thinking about what had happened and why he was still alive. The system alerted that the enemy had left the cave, mistaking Ark for a dead man. After hearing the news, the boy thought that the monster was definitely mistaken. Although the boy himself was close to death, the armor alerted the host that he was badly injured and needed to use potions to recover. Ark thought he'd completely forgotten about those flasks he'd picked up here in the goblin dungeon. Pulling a vial out of his pouch, the guy immediately emptied it. The elixir took effect almost instantly, and a few seconds later the protagonist was on his feet. Wiping his lips, he mentally thanked the goblins for their potions. Looking towards the exit, the guy realized that this monster definitely needed to catch up. Otherwise, if this cyclops reached the village, he could safely single-handedly slaughter all the inhabitants there. Suddenly, a human voice behind him called out to the corpse collector. Ark, who was slowly beginning to wean himself off that nickname, stopped. In addition, the voice of the caller was very familiar. The protagonist turned around to see where the sound was coming from. Directly across from him, leaning against the wall, lay Jarg. He was bleeding profusely, and there was a huge hole in the center of his stomach. Suddenly, the adventurer spoke sharply as he noticed the potions Ark was drinking and demanded that he be given one vial. The white-haired guy shouted that for a weakling like a corpse collector, a regenerating elixir was too valuable an item. Jarg looked towards Ark with mad eyes and muttered that as soon as he drank the elixir, he would immediately escape. After all, that monster must have gone to the village, and as long as it was distracted, he would be able to survive. Then he demanded the elixir in a commanding tone. Ark continued to remain silent, and Jarg tried in agony to get the brat to get some restorative potions from the brat. Suddenly, he spit up blood, and his breathing hitched. The boy was silent again. He seemed to have less and less strength left for persuasion. After a few seconds, Jarg lowered his head again and began begging Ark for mercy. The pain was unbearable, he said. The protagonist gave a meaningful silence, and then asked the Abyss Armor if these potions could heal such wounds. Armor replied that there was no point, as the wounded man had lost a lot of blood. Besides, the creature had managed to inflict too much lethal damage on Jarg, and even using potions would result in a zero chance of survival. The armor predicted the guy would die within minutes from massive blood loss. Ark was silent again, and then again, and asked the armor the question that had plagued him for a long time. The protagonist asked if the level absorption skill worked on humans, to which he received an affirmative answer from the armor. Now, if he didn't find the strength to rise to his feet, he would definitely be finished. After that, the protagonist told his opponent that there was nothing he could do to help him. The blonde man grinned and said that he had realized it a long time ago. Jarg shuddered and said he just wanted this pain to finally end. Ark looked at the boy pityingly and said that he had one way to put him out of his misery. At the same moment, the boy interrupted the corpse collector again and said that he wasn't stupid and already understood everything. Then he looked at Ark and said that he would have to kill him. The protagonist replied to Jarg that in truth, he had hated the man all his life. And yet, looking back on the past, the guy will somewhat miss those times. Then, Ark swung his blade, and the system alerted to the absorption of Jarg's level. The armor wielder had reached level 200. Meanwhile, the Cyclops walked through the forest without any obstacles. After a while, the roofs of the houses appeared behind the trees. The monster approached the outskirts of the village. However, he suddenly cried out loudly, and his face turned into a grimace of pain. The monster heard a human voice rejoicing that he had made it in time. Ark, who was running at high speed, managed to catch up to the Cyclops and struck the monster in a leap. The guy blocked the path of his opponent, who clutched his bleeding hand in horror. The protagonist decided not to hesitate to take advantage of the advantage he had and lunged at the Cyclops again. As he approached the monster, Ark looked at his opponent in rage and said that he would have to die by his hand. The guy then delivered a powerful slashing blow with his sword, but the monster managed to block the blow. The boy again stepped back some distance and, drawing his blade towards the Cyclops, advised the latter that he should finish off his enemies. Ark added that because of the monster's gaff, they now have the same level. He then suggested that this fight should end, and finally reveal the winner. Unexpectedly, the protagonist said that he forgot to add that he had recently killed his old acquaintance with the same hand, so now he was out of rage. 
A moment later, the Cyclops came to attack first and pounced on Ark. It seemed that with his huge carcass, he would simply run over the young adventurer. But as soon as the monster blinked, he saw that the young man was already on his shoulder. Ark was clearly outmatched in speed, which he took advantage of by getting into an advantageous position and counterattacking. Coming in from the back, he attacked the Cyclops, attempting to cut the monster's back. However, the creature's powerful wings were much stronger than the protagonist thought. This only suggested that some other tactic should have been used. At the same moment, the monster once again began to focus its vision to attempt a powerful shot. Ark noticed this and immediately lashed out at his opponent, shouting that he would not allow something like this to happen again. But suddenly the monster stopped storing energy near its forehead and looked fiercely at the protagonist. The boy realized too late that it was a trick. At the same instant, the Cyclops straightened his legs sharply, hitting the guy and throwing him back a few meters. The protagonist managed to block this counterattack, but now he had to defend himself. The monster immediately ripped the nearest tree from its roots and swung it around to try to kill Ark. The protagonist had no time to react to this unexpected move and parroted the blow. After flying a great distance, Ark fell, hitting his back on the ground. The guy was still conscious and didn't understand why. Despite the equality of levels, he couldn't overpower the monster. Taking out a vial of regenerating liquid from his pocket and drinking it, he was surprised at the same time that this monster had also used a ruse. Still, having regained his health, Ark rose to his feet and thought that this time he would not let the Cyclops win. The boy once again pounced on the monster. The armor again alerted to the huge energy buildup and recommended immediate retreat. The protagonist decided to trust his own instincts, at the same time surprised that this monster still does not calm down. However, this time the Cyclops wasn't bluffing. A few seconds later, he fired a powerful shot, but this time Ark was ready for anything. It was not without difficulty that he dodged the powerful beam of energy. The boy maintained his speed and, once in a favorable position, swung his sword in hopes of delivering the final blow. After making sure the attack didn't work, the Cyclops decided to cover himself with his wings. It didn't help, however, as Ark put all his strength into his punch. The monster screamed in horror as he realized his wings had been cut. The protagonist saw the result of the attack, realizing that he had finally succeeded in injuring the creature. However, the boy then looked warily at the monster. He was very much surprised by the way the Cyclops behaved in this situation. After the monster realized the danger, it began to stare intently towards the village. Then Ark realized to his horror that the Cyclops was going to switch to buildings and inhabitants. In that same second, the monster tensed its legs hard, breaking the ground beneath it. He then made a swift leap with incredible speed. Falling to the ground time after time, he kept moving towards the buildings. Then the protagonist realized that the Cyclops wanted to kill all the villagers to regain his strength. The guy started stalking, realizing he didn't have much time. Now because of his procrastination, the village was in mortal danger. A short while later, residents walking peacefully through the streets discovered a strange creature in the sky. A moment later, it crashed to the ground with a clatter, scaring away the people gathered around it. After the dust cleared, the monster looked around for a few seconds. Then the Cyclops raised his head up and let out a terrible howl, terrifying the villagers. Ark was on the spot a few seconds later. He saw the monster moving down one of the streets. The guy realized he was late after all. At the same instant, Cyclops hit one of the nearby buildings with all his might. Residents panicked and ran in different directions, begging for mercy. At the same time, the creature began to accumulate energy near its forehead to use the energy beam again. Ark didn't understand how a Cyclops could use this ability so many times in a row. But before the guy knew it, the strongest discharge had pierced several buildings. Only then did the hero finally manage to catch up with the enemy, ending up on one of the rooftops. The guy lunged at the monster in a rage, yelling that it was time for him to stop. Cyclops turned around and tried to block the attack, but Ark managed to get back up, flying under his opponent's arm. The protagonist found himself backstabbing into the creature, confident that this time he definitely hit it. The monster turned around hoping to see the boy behind him, but he was no longer there. Ark soared into the air in an attempt to attack the monster from above. Given the previous fights, it could be decided that the only vulnerable spot of this monster was still its eye. The protagonist spiked toward the Cyclops at great speed, but the Cyclops managed to parry the blow with his arm. It seemed as if the blade of the blade was about to pierce through the monster's voice. Annoyed, Ark leaned on his opponent's arm and bounced upwards to try and strike again. He swung his sword again, shouting that he would definitely save his village, even if he had to die to do so. However, the Cyclops this time was fully prepared for the attack. Moreover, he had once again accumulated energy near his eye. The next moment, the monster suddenly fired, barely hitting the protagonist. 
The guy was surprised that the creature was able to prepare a new attack so quickly. Ark made a successful comeback, but now he was back in a vulnerable position. Looking to the side, the protagonist saw that the monster immediately pounced on him again, as the boy had no time to react. The Cyclops threw the village defender to the ground with a powerful blow. Convinced that he had bought enough time, the monster headed towards the center of the settlement, bouncing off the roofs of buildings. Ark lay in the center of a large crater. He couldn't seem to move at all. Apparating with the last of his strength, he whispered that he wasn't done yet. Overcoming the pain, the guy got to his feet and mouthed that only he could overpower such a strong demon. So no matter what it took, he couldn't give up. In the middle of the central square, an old merchant looked up into the sky with astonishment. Right in front of him stood the very same Cyclops, who was several times the height of the resident. The next moment, the monster glared fiercely at the merchant and roared loudly. The old man thought dejectedly that there was nowhere to run away in this small village. No matter how far you go, they will catch up with you. So now the only thing left for him to do is to buy time for the others. But then the merchant heard the stomping of footsteps behind him and realized that this was the end of his work. In the next second, the protagonist appeared between the dweller and the cyclops. Drawing his sword, Ark looked confidently into the monster's single eye. Then the guy turned toward his grandfather and said that a ragamuffin like him couldn't be a hero. The merchant looked at the boy with a smile and said that his grandson had come to the rescue just because he was a real hero. Ark looked at the Cyclops again and muttered that nevertheless, he did not know how to defeat this creature. Suddenly, the old man muttered that the equality of their levels didn't matter. The boy looked toward the merchant again. He was rummaging through one of the overturned crates, saying that his grandson didn't need to think about it so much. The next second, the old man threw something at the protagonist. Looking at the object thrown by his relative, the guy couldn't believe his eyes. In his hand was a very ordinary loaf of bread. It was the kind the boy had eaten when he was the most common corpse collector. The merchant looked at Ark enigmatically, asking if the past days were different from what was happening now. While the boy was cracking open the loaf, the old man said that both then and now it was horrible and scary. After saying those words, the protagonist confidently looked into the monster's eye. Ark looked confidently in front of him and thanked his grandfather for helping him gather his thoughts. The boy then readied his sword for battle once more and changed before the Cyclops for making him wait so long. At that moment, it became clear to both opponents that the coming bout would be decisive. Deciding to start the fight first, the protagonist attacked the demon. The monster waited for the first strike while Ark tried to make false maneuvers. After a while, the guy attacked, however, the Cyclops blocked the attempt with the same ease. Still, this strike was part of the plan. This way, Ark managed to get to the side of the monster. Suddenly, however, the creature reacted instantly, turning around and grabbing the guy's blade. The boy was once again amazed at how easily this demon fended off his lightning-fast attacks. Cyclops swung around, holding Ark by the sword. The monster then hurled his opponent with such force that he flew to the other end of the village. After doing a few somersaults on the ground, the guy managed to keep his balance and get back into a fighting stance. He realized once again that he didn't understand how he could defeat this monster. Suddenly, a child's crying from behind made Ark turn around. Behind the protagonist's back stood a boy who was shaking in terror at the sight of the demon. The boy was angry at the thought that someone had forgotten a child in such a dangerous place. Ark shouted excitedly to the boy to get out of here faster. The child mouthed in a trembling voice that he was scared and couldn't bring himself to move. Meanwhile, the Cyclops noticed that his opponent was paying attention to the boy standing aside. Then his gaze shifted to the defenseless child. In the same second, the monster leaped towards the boy with great speed, causing him to lose his balance and fall to the ground. Then the creature swung its fist, intending to flatten the child with one blow. The young resident covered himself with his hands in terror, screaming at the top of his voice. However, an instant before the blow struck, Ark was in front of the Cyclops' fist, shouting that there was no way he was going to let that happen. It seemed that the monster had put all of its strength into this blow. However, the protagonist was still standing. After the creature removed its hand, the boy sat down on his knee. He could see that his strength was almost at an end. The next second, Ark told the kid that he needed to get out of here now. The boy tried to say something against it, but the protagonist interrupted him by muttering that he was almost unable to move. The Cyclops was already preparing to give him the final blow. Seeing this, the protagonist turned to the child again, telling him that he was a brave boy and should make himself leave this place. The boy shifted a little, saying through his tears that he would not be afraid anymore. The child then turned around and ran with all his might away from the battlefield, leaving the exhausted Ark alone with the Cyclops. The protagonist immediately smiled and praised the boy for his courage. Then he raised his head and looked at his opponent again. 
The monster towered victoriously over the nearly defeated lad and prepared for the final blow to end the confrontation. The Abyss Armor once again alerted the wearer to the large energy buildup and offered to retreat immediately. Ark apologized, however, saying that it had already been resolved. He looked tiredly in front of him, stating that he was not getting out this time. At the same second, Cyclops shot the protagonist. The only thing Ark could do at that moment was to try to cover himself with his sword. The impact of the energy beam pierced several houses from the walls in the village. The chaos and destruction left no chance for any of the objects that came across the path. The guy's body flew a few blocks and crashed into the wall of a house. Ark looked through the huge hole he had made and thought there was nothing he could do to counteract this incredible power. He was surprised to think that despite being of the same level, the difference in strength somehow was still too great. The armor recommended the hero to heal urgently. The boy thought of healing potions and looked in his pocket. However, it suddenly appeared that the bag was completely empty. Looking in front of him, Ark realized he had confused all the flasks on impact. He reached a trembling hand forward, hoping to find the strength to get up and crawl over to the potion. However, suddenly his eyes rolled back. At that moment, Ark's strength finally left him. The arm fell to the ground helplessly, and the protagonist lost consciousness. After a while, the guy felt an unprecedented lightness. When he opened his eyes, he wondered where he'd gotten to. The boy looked down at his hand and thought that the village must have been destroyed by now. Ark blamed himself for not finding the strength to recover. If he had, he would have been able to save all the villagers. Pulled his hand toward the light and begged for someone to help him in time. Suddenly, Ark woke up. There was a flask of potion on his left cheek, and it was slowly flowing into his mouth. The guy looked tiredly in front of him and saw a girl squatting in front of him and looking into the hero's face. Seeing that the protagonist had woken up, the beauty clapped her hands. Ark pulled himself up and asked his savior who she was and what her name was. The resident looked into the hero's eyes and said her name was Lyra. She explained that she was born and raised in this village. She added that she also wants to save the place and its inhabitants. At the same second, the monster from a few blocks away roared furiously again. Looking at Ark rising to his feet, Lyra said he urgently needed to get back into the fight. That's when the girl confessed that she had already seen the guy fighting to protect this village. Unexpectedly, the beauty said that many people want to save the place, and despite everything, the residents are very grateful to the hero. Lyra then held out her hand to the boy and motioned for him to run away from here. The boy was greatly surprised by this offer, and he refused, saying that he was the only one in this village who could defeat this monster. Lyra folded her hands in front of her then, saying that was the whole reason. Such an answer surprised Ark greatly, and he looked at the girl for a while longer, unable to say anything. The pretty girl asked the guy what would happen if he lost to this monster. Without waiting for an answer, she said that at this rate, nothing could save this village. Indeed, already many buildings in the settlement were already on fire or destroyed. Just a little more, and the monster could completely destroy the place. Lyra said that Ark should avoid seeing the Cyclops until his wounds heal. The boy, still not believing what he was hearing, tried to pull himself up again. However, his whole body ached and kind of wouldn't let him do it. It looked like he would really have to rest before fighting at full strength. Suddenly, the monster was right in front of Ark's face in one leap. Lyra held out her hand to the boy that second, telling him that they needed to hurry. The protagonist looked at the Cyclops for a while longer, deciding what he should do next. Clamming up, he shouted that he had already figured it out. Then the guy made up his mind after all and held out his hand to the girl. After that, Lyra pulled Ark behind her, yelling to keep up with her. Reaching one of the narrow passages between the houses, the girl turned left. After they successfully sneak away from the Cyclops, the protagonist asks Lyra how she knows his name. The pretty girl, turning into one of the alleys again, said that the guy was very popular in this village. Annoyed, Ark asked, Did everyone still think of him as a corpse collector? Suddenly the girl stopped and said without so far. However, Lyra then looked into the boy's eyes and said that she thought he was a hero. The young resident said she was also there at the time of the werewolf attack. The protagonist remembered that day in horror. It was then that Ark realized that perhaps without noticing it, he had saved that girl's life. Just then, Lyra smiled and said she was sure of him. The beauty then glared and mouthed that she thought Ark San could save this village. These words had a strong effect on the protagonist. Putting his fist forward, the guy said that he would definitely kill this into a monster. With a confident look in the beauty's eyes, Ark added that he would save their village. Suddenly, a shrill, human-like scream was heard not far from the companions. The girl and the boy turned to the direction where the sound was coming from and were surprised. The monster shouldn't have gotten here yet. 
After running through a few turns, the guy saw an unknown man in a cloak dragging a girl by the hair while hurrying his accomplices. Inside the wide, looped courtyard were two wagons. There were several people in identical clothing around, and no one prevented the kidnapping. The unknown cloaked man shoved the girl to his subordinates, telling them that they needed to get out quickly as the monster was already getting closer. The type then arched a satisfied voice, shouting that even if they openly kidnapped people, no one would stop them. Laughing at the top of his voice, he mouthed that the perfect couple had come to make a little extra money. The protagonist hid behind the wall, nervously noting that the worst moment simply couldn't have been worse. Another bandit, carrying someone's jewelry, said they were now allowed to take whatever they could carry. Peeking out from behind the stone wall, Lyra grudgingly noted that this was simply inhumane. But suddenly the girl's gaze changed abruptly, and she looked excitedly at the hero. Meanwhile, the guy was still examining the wagons. After a few seconds, he turned to Lyra and asked her to wait while he dealt with those bandits. Immediately, however, the protagonist sensed something amiss and turned around sharply. Right next to him stood the bulky man who had taken the young lady hostage. He put his huge hand around the captive's neck and held something sharp to her head. Ark looked at Lyra's frightened face in panic. The big guy immediately said that if the guy didn't want this wench to get hurt, he needed to drop his weapon now. Seeing that the boy was serious, the bandit said not to do anything stupid. Realizing there was no other option, Ark lowered his weapon, saying he understood perfectly. The big man then used his other hand to shove the protagonist aside the circular plaza. The squad leader turned around and asked a subordinate, Who are these two? Then the type in the trench coat said that he had warned his goons that they didn't want men. But immediately he saw that in addition to some brat, the big guy had brought a girl. Noting the captive's lovely facial features, the bandit said it was a very nice specimen. Moving closer, the ringleader examined Lyra's body, saying that this was a pretty good girl. Squatting down, he looked into the captive's face, saying that they could sell her for a pretty good price. But suddenly the squad leader was interrupted by the protagonist who had been standing silent until then. Ark asked the bandits how they had the nerve to do such things while the village was in danger. However, the type in the cloak said that he and his boys cared deeply about what would become of this settlement by its inhabitants. All because they originally came to this place to completely loot the village. Approaching the boy closely, the ringleader said they were lucky they hadn't interrupted them before. The protagonist amplified his aura and called the bandits bastards in a rage. The cape type said he wasn't scared at all. The ringleader looked at Ark and asked if the latter was an adventurer. Receiving no answer, but understanding everything perfectly, the bandit said that the boy looked pathetic. After all, even with such tremendous power, the guy can't do anything about the situation. After mocking the loser, the leader said it was time for them to move out. Turning to the bulky man, he told him to be more careful with this girl. All because none of them wanted an outsider to interfere with their shady dealings. Ark was furious, thinking that if he had the chance, he'd massacre those bastards in a second. That's when the guy decided that as soon as the perfect moment appeared, he would definitely save Lyra. But suddenly a knife blade flashed in a nearby passage. Someone took small steps and ran toward the bandits who had turned away. The ringleader, who heard a strange stomping behind him, turned around to see what was going on. Seeing danger approaching, he ordered his big man to be more careful. Toward the huge bandit, screaming furiously, ran a girl who had dashed out of the alley. The bald bandit turned around and looked at the girl with incomprehension. The protagonist was horrified to discover that it was Mill. The big man easily dodged the blow, tripping the girl who was running at him. Emil couldn't help herself and plopped to the ground with all her might. The thug looked at the desperate resident in surprise and said she couldn't beat him. But Mill looked up and gave the bandit a satisfied look, saying that she hadn't intended to kill anyone. That's when the bandit finally stopped understanding what this girl wanted. But in the same second, Mill shrieked that she was just bait. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Ark approaching him from behind at breakneck speed. However, even turning around, the bandit had no time to do anything about the new danger. There was incredible rage built up inside the protagonist, and he unleashed all of his emotions in one powerful attack. With one mighty blow, Ark knocked down the bulky man who immediately lost consciousness. Stopping, the guy saw Lyra fly upwards. After that, he calmly caught the captive in his arms. Looking into the eyes of the still-stunned girl, the protagonist said that she should hide now. Seeing this incredible audacity, the squad leader drew his saber, ordering the bandits to kill the brat while keeping a lookout. The thugs immediately surrounded Ark on all sides, while keeping a relatively safe distance and hesitating to attack. The guy who didn't have a gun on him suddenly asked if they really wanted it, because he wasn't going to restrain himself. The cloaked ringleader laughed and shouted that they were not afraid of a goon who pretended to be a hero. Ark calmly replied that he was giving everyone one last chance to lay down their weapons and leave. However, none of the thugs listened to him. 
At the same second, all the thugs attacked the protagonist at the same time. The boy looked up into the sky and said he understood perfectly. He then examined the thug who lay unconscious on the ground and said that his words were correct. Ark looked at his enemies and said that there was no way they could defeat him because they had too much difference in level. After saying that, only a few seconds passed. The protagonist tore apart all the thugs with his bare hands. After each victory, the armor notified a new level absorption. At the end, out of all the enemies, only the gang leader was left. He held out a trembling hand toward the unknown guy and said that adventurers were never that fast. Ark, you picked up his sword in the heat of battle and said that unfortunately for the bandits, he was no mere adventurer. With eyes full of rage, he examined the rogue and said that he possessed a level 200. After saying that, the gang leader realized that he had no chance left. Shouting insults at his opponent, he lunged at the bastard in desperation. The protagonist then killed the remaining target with one swift strike. The system notified him of his upgrade to level 250, adding that the wielder had reached the maximum level for a human. Ark was very much surprised by those words. He was not aware that this was the maximum limit. What also surprised him about this wording was that the level limit for humans existed at all. On the other hand, he had also never heard of those adventurers who had reached such a high level before. Suddenly, a woman's voice called out to Ark, and he turned around. Before he knew it, Lyra was pouncing on him with a hug. The girl looked at the protagonist with happy eyes and thanked him for saving her. Ark put his hand on Lyra's shoulder and said that he would never leave her. He added that he will never forget the way the girl gave him the potion at a critical moment. The boy reminded her that if it wasn't for her help, he would have been killed by the monster long ago. Suddenly, the pretty girl took the boy by the cheeks and looked him in the eyes. She said that Arxan is now the greatest hero to her. These words touched the boy very much. After looking over the bodies of the men he had killed, he was surprised that someone would call him a hero after what he had done. Pulling away from Lyra's hands, Ark said, hardly worthy of that praise. Looking at the corpses of the bandits again, he said that still, if he had left them alive, those bastards could have ravaged other villages. With a frustrated clench of his fist, the boy added that these thoughts were constantly running through his head. He realized that if he didn't stop them, things could only get worse. Suddenly, Lyra muttered that it wasn't his fault. The protagonist looked at the girl in bewilderment. She once again repeated what she had said, but this time much more seriously. Lyra pointed out to the guy that he had taken the lives of these people to save the people of his village. She looked calmly into the boy's eyes and said there was no need to blame himself, for he had done the right thing. At the end, the girl added that this is why she considers Ark her hero. The boy once again thanked Lyra for her words and said he felt better. The pretty girl smiled and said she was happy to help. Unexpectedly, Mill interrupted the conversation, saying that all the people caught by the bandits had already returned to their homes. Ark patted the girl on the head, telling her she was doing a good job. Mill whirled around herself, saying she was glad to have been of help. She then added that while Arkson was fighting, she had no way to help. Suddenly, Mill blurted out, telling the protagonist that she was ready to fight alongside him next time. The boy, meanwhile, looked seriously in the direction from where the explosions were heard and said he was already fine. At the same second, at the other end of the village, a cyclops was advancing towards the protagonist, destroying a building. Ark turned to his companions and said they had somewhere to hide already. Armor immediately turned to the protagonist, saying that since he had reached level 250, he would be able to handle that creature. The boy looked confidently in the direction from which the monster was approaching and thought that now, at last, the perfect conditions were at hand. A moment later, the cyclops once again soared into the sky. From a great height, he found Ark among the buildings and the girls standing beside him. Surprised that this boy is still alive, the monster decided to finally finish him off by landing not far from the protagonist. Lyra and Mill shielded themselves with their arms from the rocks and shingles flying at them. Ark, meanwhile, readied his weapon and looked seriously at his opponent. The monster loomed menacingly over the buildings. The boy headed toward the enemy, intending to end it at last. Finally, he turned around and once again told the girls that they had better hide more securely. Both companions listened to this warning without moving and regarded the monster with horror. Then they turned around and quickly ran in the opposite direction. Ark immediately turned to the Cyclops, apologizing for what he had to avoid in their previous encounter. But the same guy added that he had no intention of escaping this time. Glaring furiously at the monster, the protagonist said that they would end it here and now. After these words, the creature roared loudly. The walls of the neighboring houses cracked from that powerful sound, but the guy didn't budge. Gathering his thoughts, he slowly began to move towards his opponent. Ignoring the crumbling debris, Ark said that he couldn't even wield a sword before. 
Immediately, bitter memories of his past when he was a social outcast and a weakling, no one wanted surfaced in his mind. The hero then drew his weapon, saying that he then swung his sword for the first time to save his life. He then added that after his rebirth, he had to fight to protect his home. The boy then pointed his blade at the Cyclops and said that he ended up in this very moment. All the memories he had experienced over the past two hard days popped into Ark's mind. After that, the guy glared fiercely at the enemy. His eyes seemed to be burning with hatred. Swinging his sword, Ark added that he was now using his skills to fulfill the hopes of his friends. After saying that, the aura of the protagonist increased several times. He looked confidently at his opponent and said that he had better get ready. The young adventurer muttered that now the Cyclops would have to feel the blow of someone who had surpassed all human limits. At the same time, the monster was also determined to fight. The monster once again screamed with incredible strength. The Cyclops then decided to attack first. Breaking through the house, he burst into the courtyard area and swung his arm to hit the protagonist. However, the guy drew his sword and repelled this monster's attack with one swing, throwing the enemy back. Then Ark muttered that the Cyclops' blows were completely useless against him. Saying this, the boy pounced on his opponent and launched a swift attack into the hulking, bulky man's body. The demon did not expect such a strong blow and was unable to block it. While the monster's body was flying helplessly in the air, the main character seemed to be calmly moving around it. Finding himself on top of the enemy, Ark spun on the flying Cyclops and with a kick to the stomach sent the enemy's body into the ground. All the monster can do is just scream in panic, trying to do something. After the demon's body hit the ground, a large cloud of dust rose into the air. The protagonist stood across the street waiting for the dust to clear. Suddenly, the Cyclops jumped up and instantly concentrated a huge amount of energy near his forehead to shoot at the guy. However, to the monster's surprise, it was as if the boy had no intention of running away. The armor alerted the arch to a large buildup of energy nearby. However, the host said there was nothing to worry about. Pulling out his sword, the guy said that he wouldn't have any problems with it because in this world, everything is decided by level. To the hero's great surprise, the monster still hadn't killed a single person by that point, remaining at the same 200th level. A few moments later, the Cyclops fired a shot at Ark. As the energy beam approached, the boy still didn't move. He then swung his sword, saying that he didn't care what the creature did. Ark sliced through the air in front of him, scattering an energy beam in the process. Judging from the expression on Cyclops' face, at that moment he was greatly surprised that someone had not just dodged his attack, but parried it. The guy once again pointed his blade at the monster, saying that he couldn't win because of the huge difference in level. It was slowly starting to get dark outside. The two opponents were still facing each other. Arch's face was still as calm as ever. At the same time, the Cyclops seemed to be getting nervous. He once again let out a violent scream, glaring fiercely at his opponent. The boy suddenly asked the monster, was it really scared? After that, the Cyclops suddenly stopped screaming and stared at the protagonist. Ark said that the monster used to feel powerful, scaring the civilians. But now it was his turn to be trampled. The adventurer then looked into his victim's face and said that he should not be surprised. In the next second, the guy rushed towards the creature with incredible speed. Noticing this, Cyclops realized that he should do something about it. The monster let out a mighty roar and rushed to counterattack Ark. My hero calmly maneuvered away from the Cyclops' strike and delivered a counter-strike to the back of his head. The monster, unable to match the power of this attack, fell to the ground. Raising his head, the demon saw Ark standing across from him. In desperation, he tried his favorite attack again. The protagonist looked at these futile attempts to fight back with indifference and asked his opponent, did he still not realize that he had no chance? After that, the guy strengthened his aura again and said that he would now show the monster true despair. The boy didn't bother to dodge the enemy's attack, but suddenly, the energy beam embedded in the boy's body turned around and hit the ground next to the monster. The creature opened its mouth in surprise and looked at its opponent. Ark stood still, watching as the force of the blow knocked the monster off its feet. The Cyclops' eye was boiling. He seemed to put all his strength into this last attack. However, his enemy was still intact. He stood with his arm outstretched toward the monster. The protagonist then asked his opponent if he realized the hopelessness of the situation. Cyclops devoured the boy's gaze that said the difference between them was insurmountable. Suddenly, the creature bowed its head and seemed to accept this outcome. But suddenly the demon looked up again and screamed with all his might. Ark was no longer impressed by this demarch. It seemed to him that the monster didn't want to accept his defeat at all. Clenching his fist, the bulky man once again pounced on the protagonist with another attack. However, as expected, his punch landed in the ground as the guy dodged with ease. After that, the creature, instantly accumulating energy near its forehead, once again released an energy beam at Ark. But the boy jumped upward, 
once again leaving the monster with nothing. Then the Cyclops raised his head upward, continuing to guide the beam behind the dodging protagonist. However, the guy easily evaded that shot and ended up near his opponent's head. The demon put his arm out in front of him again, hoping that it could block the main character's blow. However, the guy swung his sword so hard that any attempts to block this attack were futile. At the same instant, a piece of the Cyclops' arm flew aside, splattering blood. The creature thrust its stump upward and screamed in pain. Ark once again jumped back to a safe distance after this successful attack. Then he swung his sword and said he was bored with this, and it was time to call it a day. Looking fiercely into the monster's single eye, Ark ordered it to its knees. A second later, it seemed to the guy that his opponent understood the request. And, judging by the look on his face, he didn't like it very much. The Cyclops swung its head at the same instant, and throwing an energy beam in different directions, tried to hit the protagonist. Seeing these desperate attempts to stop the irreversible, the boy said it was too late to do anything. After that, he easily made his way through the continuous attacks to his opponent and delivered a slashing blow. After this attack, Ark once again moved to a safe distance and the monster fell to its knees. The Cyclops then looked up and saw the protagonist leaping to deliver the final blow. With his one eye, he saw death approaching. The boy shouted that he had hurt a lot of people, and now it was time to pay the bill. The demon had no strength or power left to parry the attack. The next instant, Ark's sharp blade sank into the monster's eye. Thus, the monster, despite its unwillingness to accept defeat, died kneeling in front of the humanoid. The armor immediately announced the inability to absorb the level and unlocked the transformation skill. This ability allows one to go beyond the human's limits. Just after morning came, residents assessed the damage the village had sustained during this difficult battle. People immediately began rebuilding the buildings damaged in yesterday's attack. A guy in a blue t-shirt was sitting on the roof and tapping the shingles with a mallet. At the same time, he saw several people dragging a log the wrong way. He said the wood should be brought to the other house. The next second, one of the guys carrying the bar tripped over a rock lying on the ground. With surprise, the boy let go of the wood and nearly spat on the ground. Immediately, however, strong hands from behind caught him. The resident turned around to look at whoever had managed to pick him up. He saw the former corpse collector in front of him. Ark looked at the boy with a smile and told him to be more careful. Afterwards, the protagonist went to a standing hill and tree to reflect on what he had learned from the last battle. Leaning back against the trunk, Ark wondered what this ability called level transformation was. Armor of the Abyss immediately replied that due to this feature, the wearer could convert absorbed levels into new unique skills. In this world, unique skills have different effects. For example, Increased speed and fire resistance are nice bonuses for adventurers. Normal adventurers can get them with low probability by gaining experience points and increasing their level. Previously, Ark could not gain experience points and therefore could not have unique skills. But now, in exchange for gaining levels beyond the maximum, he could gain special unique skills. The boy wondered what kind of unique armor he had gotten after all. Suddenly, a panel of information popped up in front of the protagonist. In it, the armor recommended to first get a skill called Limit Breakthrough. It was a special skill that allowed you to gain unlimited levels. What particularly caught Ark's attention was that this skill had a price of 240 levels. Apparently, this was the number of points he should get. Then the protagonist thought that he now had 250 levels, in which case he would lose almost everything by acquiring this ability. But remembering the recent situation and the incident with the destroyed village, the guy decided that he critically needed this skill. Gathering his thoughts, he looked at the panel and decided to buy the ability. Armor said that to buy a skill, you have to say a code phrase and the name of the ability. The boy then clenched his fist and said that he was requesting to purchase a limit breakthrough. Armor announced the acceptance of the deal and began transforming levels. After that, a multitude of light rays began to flow out of the protagonist's body and swiftly drifted upwards. This incredible glow could be seen in the village itself. Many residents noticed a strange phenomenon occurring on a hill nearby. The crystal at the center of the abyss armor caused the wearer some pain. Ark held back from screaming, but at some point, everything stopped, and the armor announced that the transformation was complete and the limit breakthrough skill had been obtained. The protagonist lowered his head and looked at the panel that appeared. The notification duplicated the information about getting the new skillet. Suddenly, the guy's body started behaving strangely. Ark looked at his hands in bewilderment and thought that after that strange sensation, he felt as if his consciousness had expanded. Suddenly, the armor announced that the character could exceed the allowable level limit, meaning that he was now a creature superior to humans. The boy grinned afterward, surprised at such an unusual wording. 
Then he looked up at the sky and took a deep breath. Ark thought that not so long ago he had been an ordinary corpse collector. Having traveled such a long way, he was now practically a deity. At the same time, an unknown man came to the village. From the expression on his face, it was clear that he was extremely dissatisfied. He looked around the village in fury and muttered that he had come all this way for nothing. Then the stranger threw his huge sword off his shoulder and thrust it into the ground. As he looked around, he irritatedly realized that from the looks of the civilians, the monster had already been destroyed. His aura was overflowing with rage. The stranger thought he had only wasted his time. But immediately the stranger looked around, thinking it would be a good idea to find the adventurer who had defeated this demon. Suddenly, the protagonist on the hill was credited with an additional 200 levels. The armor announced that it was absorbing additional points that could not previously be granted to the wearer. The boy remembered where he had gotten those levels from. After defeating Cyclops, armor also announced that the takeover was impossible due to the limit. The protagonist was happy that although he had spent almost everything to increase his limit, but now he could still fight monsters safely. After examining the armor, Ark thought he should get his hands on as many unique skills as possible soon. With the help of these super valuable abilities, his fight against monsters will become even easier. And then he could surely become the greatest adventurer in the history of mankind. The boy wondered what he should do next. At the same moment, the boy did not notice someone creeping up behind him. Hearing a familiar voice, the protagonist turned around. The girl who came close to him called the guy by name. In the same second, Lyra happily pounced on Ark, nearly knocking the boy off his feet. The girl puffed up her cheeks and said that she had been looking for a boyfriend the whole time after the battle. She added that after yesterday's battle, the whole village was in chaos and there was no way she could find Ark. The guy apologized to the girl, saying he was helping residents with firefighting yesterday. Suddenly, another voice from outside said that Lyra was very worried about the main character. It was Mill. She mouthed with a smile on her face that she was also worried about her savior. Ark added in a satisfied voice that he was glad the girls were okay. Lyra smiled and looked at the village protector, saying it was all thanks to him. The girl then added that she was very grateful to the main character for what he had done for her and for all the residents. She stepped closer, stood on her toes and kissed the boy while noting that it was just a thank you. In the next second, Lyra stepped aside in embarrassment and looked at Ark. The adventurer, amazed at what had happened, stood and kept his eyes on the girl. Unexpectedly, Lyra turned to the protagonist, saying that she had been wanting to confess for a long time. Closing her eyes and bashfully bowing her head, she shouted to Ark that she loved him. A few seconds later, embarrassed by her own words, Lyra turned and ran towards the village. The main character opened his mouth in surprise and asked Mill, What was that just now? The girl regarded her savior with equal embarrassment, chuckling softly. Suddenly, behind the kid's back was his grandfather, who noted that it looked like spring had come to Ark this time too. The protagonist looked angrily at the satisfied faces of his friends, displeased that they made him feel embarrassed. With a wave of his hand, he told his companions to run away from this place. After the old man and Mill ran away, the main character held his hand over his face and exhaled heavily. Despite his outward resentment, inside, the boy shone brighter than the sun. He realized that he had never dreamed that someone would fall in love with him before, but now something had to be done about it. The armor mouthed that his recommendation was that the wearer should act like a man. The boy didn't expect even the armor to troll him and ordered the breastplate to shut up. A few days later, footsteps were heard on the road leading to the village. The squad leader, shielding his hand from the sun, surveyed the settlement spread out ahead of them. The green-haired adventurer noted that this place looked more like a wasteland. The gray-haired guy walking beside him said that this settlement was probably attacked by another monster. He then looked at the leader and said that if it was a fire dragon, there would be nothing left of the village in question. The squad leader agreed with his partner and said they should ask the locals about it anyway. The green-haired guy turned to the companions and said that they had to prevent this dragon from attacking at all costs. Waving his hand to the right, he ordered the squad to move out. After this command, the group, numbering several dozen adventurers, continued on their way. Meanwhile, the goblin cave was starting to have something going on. The vaults of the long corridors still held silence. However, sometime later, there was a grand awakening inside the cave. The dragon, which seemed to have been lying down and decomposing for a long time, suddenly woke up. At the same time, life in the village itself was going on as usual. There was no sign of trouble. Sitting in the tree crowns, the hunter hurled several daggers at the passing creatures. With a few accurate throws, he hit all the animals. After that, the creatures' muzzles began to turn blue, and they gradually weakened. The monsters would then synchronously fall to the ground, shivering in death convulsions. Ark took a closer look at his opponents and made sure he was hit. 
At that point, he was just a one-level adventurer. Jumping down from the branches, the guy rushed with great speed further into the forest. He had recently acquired many unique skills. One of these skills was the poisoned dagger skill, which cost as much as 200 levels. This skill allows you to apply deadly poison to your weapon and use it to deal with small monsters. The second ability was called Knife Thrower. With these major purchases, the protagonist lost all levels. But now he could deal with some monsters while avoiding direct skirmishes and melee combat. The only disadvantage of the poison was that one had to wait for a while before the monster would die. However, with these two useful abilities, Ark could quietly regain all of his former strength. While the protagonist was in the forest, bright beams of light would periodically come to him, announcing that another monster had died. After a few such runs, the young adventurer saw his level rise to 41. The lad thought that, given the rate at which he was accumulating these points, it would be worthwhile to use them to improve the skills he already had. With a wave of his hand, the protagonist used the request to purchase the poison enhancement. After that, an information panel appeared in front of Ark's face, indicating that his ability had been strengthened and his level was once again at 1. The satisfied boy thought that now the monsters would die even faster. Scratching his neck, he looked around and thought he'd had enough pumping for today. Ark figured that right now about 20 monsters in the forest should be poisoned by his knives, so in a couple hours he would be at level 200 again. Crunching his fingers, the boy thought that this day had also gone great, and it was finally time to head back to the village. However, after the boy reached the road, he saw a group of adventurers heading towards the village not far away. He caught up with the troop and asked why they were here and what had happened. The question of the unexpectedly curious stranger was heard by the squad leader. Turning around, he asked Ark, was the latter also an adventurer? It was Ein, the representative of the Adventurer Guild. He was currently at the 120th level. Without waiting for an answer, the squad leader ran up to the protagonist and opened the information panel to find out the guy's level. Immediately, however, his face expressed a peculiar disappointment. He looked at Ark and said that the level of the one so far was not high enough for their mission. Many of the squad members looked at the guy in surprise. Some of them thought he was just another newcomer. The boy had experienced this kind of reaction before, so it was no surprise to him. Ein tried to defuse the situation by saying that perhaps the boy wanted to be an adventurer. But Ark suddenly replied that he had been an adventurer for a long time. The guild representative was greatly surprised by this answer. Suddenly, the main character was approached by the deputy squad leader and asked why the guy was level one in that case. Ark looked calmly at the gray-haired guy. After that look, the adventurer suddenly turned pale and seemed to recognize the protagonist. He looked disdainfully at the boy and stepped aside, saying he knew him. Folding his hands on his shoulders, the deputy leader said that he had heard rumors of the weakest adventurer in history. Pointing his finger at Ark, he shouted that the famous corpse collector was in front of them. Suddenly, the boy replied that the bulky man was right in his speculation and asked if the man had any problems. The adventurer was taken aback by such insolence and was unable to say anything in response. Ark then turned to the leader of the group and repeated his question. Ain initially didn't answer anything. Despite such an oddity as the first level, he felt that there was a catch somewhere. After that, the green-haired man decided that there was no point in escalating the conflict and said that they had gotten an assignment in the guild to hunt. Ein reported that many special demons had recently been sighted in these lands. This was the first time the protagonist had heard of something like this and asked, what kind of demons are these? Ein replied that a black dragon, which was a powerful demon of the 150th level, had been discovered near the village in question. The band leader also added that no one can defeat such a monster alone. Waving his hands, he said that he had gathered a group of adventurers with special skills to kill this powerful creature. Ein smiled and said that they would defeat this monster with no problem and no one needed to worry about it. It was then that he realized he had forgotten to introduce himself. When he extended his hand, the guild representative called himself Ein. The protagonist accepted the handshake, saying his name was Ark. The boy thought to himself that he could handle a level 150 monster himself without difficulty. But what stressed him the most was the way the leader of the adventurer group described the creature. A memory of that huge dragon that lay in the goblin cave surfaced in the protagonist's mind. The next moment, a guy in armor ran into the crowd of adventurers, shouting loudly the name of the squad leader. Ein excitedly rushed to his subordinate, asking what had happened to him. The boy's face was twisted with horror. He tried to catch his breath before he said anything. Then the boy looked fearfully at the leader and said that the scouts had discovered the dragon. After the general shock passed, the guy described the whole situation. He and the scouts had come across a cave. Inside it, they found the very black dragon that had apparently only recently awakened. 
Ein listened to his subordinates' report and said that they were now heading there. The team leader then announced to those present that the scouts had located the target of the mission. Ein added that a difficult battle awaited them and ordered everyone to get ready. The adventurers standing around him shouted excitedly, raising their hands in the air. Only the protagonist understood the danger of the situation. The level of the entire group was at about 120 points. From the experience of previous battles, Ark realized that even though many members of the group had unique skills, they would have a tough time fighting a dragon with 150 levels. Guy looked around at the enthusiastic adventurers again and realized that he couldn't just leave them. Without much hope, the boy turned to Ayn and asked him to take him along. Ark thought to himself that the monsters he had poisoned should die soon, and then he would get level 200. In that case, there shouldn't be any problems with the dragon. However, Ayn expectedly rejected the protagonist's suggestions. The leader of the group looked menacingly at the guy and said that he didn't realize the gravity of the situation and it would be very dangerous for him. After such a harsh rejection, Ark tried to object. But immediately, he felt the invisible pressure of the entire squad bearing down on him. The boy clearly heard various chuckles and mocking questions. All the adventurers thought that a guy with a first level was definitely not going to help them. Suddenly, a bulky man with white hair approached Ark. He looked disdainfully at the corpse collector and noted that their leader had treated him somewhat gently. The adventurer then shouted out that in the opinion of most, the boy was a weakling. With that, the group turned around and walked off in the direction of the cave, leaving Ark to himself. Only the protagonist realized that at this rate, they would all die there. But immediately, the guy thought that with his current level, there really wasn't much he could do to help there. Ark realized he didn't have an election. Taking one last look at the departing adventurers, he decided that he should just wait for the levels to arrive and then catch up with them. A short while later, the group reached the cave. Ein, who had opened the information panel, was trembling and couldn't come to his senses. This was definitely not something they had been warned about. The guild representative looked at the monster in horror and couldn't believe that it was a 150th level dragon. The boy was horrified, thinking that the clerk's office had just played a joke on them. This was definitely not the black dragon they had expected to see. In front of them was a calamity rank monster that possessed an incredible 300th level. Previously, Ayn had only heard of these infernal monsters from ancient books. It was the Black Dragon Emperor, nicknamed the Destroyer of Worlds. The group leader stared in horror at the creature before them. It had already easily killed all the scouts who had come earlier. Ayn shouted the order to retreat in panic. There was no way they could handle this monster under any circumstances. Trying to gather his thoughts, the boy shouted for someone to request help from the guild. However, Ayn then looked up and saw something approaching him. The leader of the group didn't have time to block the blow, and the dragon knocked the green-haired man to the ground with a sweep of its tail. Meanwhile, the protagonist gradually ran up to the cave. From afar, he heard the sounds of battle and realized that he was a little late. In the distance, in an open field, Ark saw the very dragon from the goblin cave. Horrified, the boy thought, was it really just pretend when he pulled the creature out of his body and into his armor? Then, Ark thought it was just unnecessary thoughts and he needed to speed up. Suddenly, the dragon raised its jaws and began preparing a huge energy shot. The hero asked how long before he could get all his levels. Armor replied that the accrual would happen within 30 seconds. Running closer to the battlefield, Ark could already see the consequences that this dragon had arranged. Most of the adventurers had already been killed, and only the strongest remained alive to meet their deaths in helplessness. The boy clenched his teeth and tried to run as fast as he could. At the same time, he heard some strange sounds from behind him. When he looked behind him, he saw several beams flying towards him. It was those long-awaited levels from the monsters he had killed. Armor announced the confirmation of the monster's deaths from poison and level absorption. The hero's new level was now 201. The guy shouted furiously to the armor that he was sending a purchase request. Staring into the dragon's wide-open maw, Ark decided to acquire the fire resistance ability. The next instant, the monster and let down a huge pillar of purple flame. The protagonist ran right into this energy stream and stopped it with his hand. In passing, he surveyed the battlefield for survivors. Ark looked around and saw Ayn lying on the ground, staring in horror at what had happened. The boy thought that the guild representative was the only survivor. The green-haired boy looked at the first-level weakling in horror and didn't understand how he had stopped the World Destroyer's attack. Suddenly, the deputy leader barely got to his feet and asked why some corpse collector wasn't even injured, and they were barely standing on their feet. The protagonist hesitated to answer, not knowing what to say to avoid being discovered. Suddenly, Ark shouted that it was all because he was stronger than all of them. 
But then the guy frustratedly clenched his fist and muttered that even with such incredible strength, he was unable to save everyone. After that, the gray-haired man looked into the eyes of the weakling with distrust. Then, without uttering a word, he let out his last breath and dropped dead. The sight of a man killed by his stupidity finally undermined the protagonist's self-control. Ark's eyes flashed with rage, and he glared in the dragon's direction. The guy moved towards the Destroyer of Worlds. Pulling his sword from behind his back, the protagonist muttered that no matter how he became, there was no way he could save people. Amplifying his aura to an incredible scale, the boy shouted to the Destroyer of Worlds that he would defeat him right here and now. In response, the monster looked at the guy and roared furiously. The next moment, the monster released an energy ball towards the protagonist. Ain shouted in horror to Ark to get out of there immediately. However, the boy turned around and calmly told the adventurer leader not to worry about him. The impulse was approaching the guy with great speed, but he did not move from his seat. Ark then straightened his arm and smashed the violet energy ball with a single blow. Just then, the lad confidently muttered that such a weak flame could not hurt him under any circumstances. Ain stared at the corpse collector in incomprehension. He didn't understand how a first-level adventurer could calmly fend off the blows of such a powerful monster. It seemed that the Destroyer of Worlds was also puzzled by such audacity from his opponent. The demon screamed furiously, emitting several powerful pulses from itself at the same time. However, each of these strikes were calmly parried and knocked aside by Ark. The guy realized that thanks to his new ability, the creature's fire attacks no longer worked. He had to spend most of his levels to gain fire resistance. Now Ark could fight back safely, but he was only level 21. But parrying blows alone was not enough to win. The boy had to think of a way to defeat this dragon, but in order to do that, you had to raise yourself up somehow. Suddenly, the Destroyer of Worlds approached Ark and swung his claws. The boy dodged the first blow with great difficulty, and the creature's paw flew within a few centimeters of him. The boy looked at the demon in horror. Apparently, the demon guessed that his fire did not harm the enemy, and then he decided to use physical attacks. Ark realized that he would not be able to withstand the attacks of a destroyer of worlds that was on a whole other level. But suddenly, the boy felt a strange aura enhancement not far from the battlefield. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw something incredibly fast fly past him in the creature's direction. This unknown person was on a completely different level. At the same second, the protagonist heard the unknown person tell the dragon that the dragon had disappointed him. At the same second, something lightning fast swept past the monster, slicing through the demon's neck. The dragon's head immediately soared upwards, spraying blood all over the battlefield. After that, the remains of the majestic monster collapsed not far from Ark, who didn't understand how this even happened. Suddenly, an unknown person who was surely one of the adventurers landed on the monster's backbone. The protagonist stared at the stranger in surprise, marveling that he had killed the Destroyer of Worlds with a single blow. Surprised by such a performance, the boy asked the adventurer who he was. The man grinned and repeated Ark's question with a smile on his face. He spread his arms out to the sides and mouthed his name as Baldar. The man then muttered that he was the only Calamity Rank adventurer in the entire continent. Ark was dumbfounded by what he heard. He had never known of such a rank among humans before. Ian, who had risen to his feet, held up his hand and muttered that he had never personally seen the man, but had heard much about him. According to the guy, this possessor of incredible strength is the one that legends are made of. This type is the one who stands head and shoulders above all the adventurers in the world. No one will ever reach the same level. That's what the legends say the cancer rank disaster means. Baldar slung his sword behind his back and noted that Ayn was quite well aware of him. The protagonist, meanwhile, opened the information panel with interest to learn more about the man across the room. And indeed, judging from the stats, Baldar was conventionally higher than any human. After all, he had an incredible 300th level and the unique skill of limit breakthrough. The armor confirmed that this man had this kind of ability from birth. Ark realized that this was the exact opposite of his zero experience skill. Then the hero asked Baldar if he had really come to help them. The adventurer grinned in response and repeated the boy's question ironically. He settled on the dragon's neck and mouthed what sounded like utter nonsense. Baldar then turned to the adventurer in black armor and said that because of the boy, all his plans were ruined. Ark asked in bewilderment what such plans his interlocutor was talking about. The big man replied with a smile that the boy must surely have heard about the rumors that were going around the village about him. Many residents refer to the guy as the hero in black armor, who single-handedly defeated the demon. Baldar said he wondered if the rumors were true. However, the guy completely disappointed him. At this moment, the dragon's eyes suddenly opened. 
The creature tried with its last strength to move its severed head, but Baldar drew his sword again and plunged it into the monster's skull, shouting for it to shut up. The creature's muscles stopped contracting and its head sank to the ground. The adventurer then touched the dragon's horns again and said that he had one interesting fact about the creature. The destroyer of worlds will regenerate until it destroys its magical core. Afterward, Baldar said that he had killed this monster once before in a cave with goblins. Ark was completely shocked by this information. Afterward, the adventurer said that he purposely didn't break the core and left the monster to die in this cave. The main character couldn't believe that this psycho had done something like this. In the next second, however, the realization came into his head as to why Baldar had done such a thing. At that moment, Baldar seemed to read Ark's mind and said that he had seen the Cyclops eating the flesh of a dragon that had not yet died. He explained that the monster that had eaten the creature's flesh had evolved very quickly and had become more ferocious. The strange type then explained that in its true form, the destroyer of worlds was too powerful and would not leave a trace of the village. So he needed a weaker monster to carry out his plan, and the Cyclops was perfect for the task. Baldar noted at the same time that his actions must be very questionable. That's when the psycho laughed and said he was going to tell me everything. First, he wanted to attack the monster in the village and then kill it, making himself look like a hero. Second, reawakening the Destroyer of Worlds would allow him to be killed again and become stronger in the process. As a result, Baldar would gain boundless power and become world famous in the process. Ein stared in horror at the distraught adventurer and tried to ask the man what he meant. However, the psycho didn't let the guy speak and looked towards Ark. Pointing his finger at the protagonist, he shouted that some bastard in black armor had ruined all his plans. But at the same time, Ark sighed heavily and said he was surprised at this turn of events. He asked his interlocutor if he was really so petty that he had decided to sell the lives of dozens of residents for some petty thing like fame. Baldar replied to Ark that he was an idiot and explained that a great hero like him needs everything, from money and fame to women. He looked at the guy with crazy eyes and said that everything one needed in this life could be achieved with such immense power. A moment later, however, the protagonist called his interlocutor a fool without a shadow of a doubt. Baldar looked back at the boy with a puzzled look. Everything was boiling inside Ark. At that moment, he wanted to tear that psychopath to pieces. He called Baldar a real idiot, saying that he was completely indifferent to the fate of random people for the sake of his stupid desires. The boy said that because of some upstart's whim, the lives of the villagers had been jeopardized and many good adventurers had been killed. Ark asked his interlocutor if he had thought about these factors even for a second. Receiving no response, the boy drew his sword and asked the armor of the abyss to lend all of his power. Glaring furiously at his opponent, the guy shouted that it was time to bring one arrogant prick down to earth. After watching this strange attempt at self-expression, Baldar grinned, asking if some brat wanted to teach him a lesson. He then looked at the protagonist with hatred in his eyes and said that a low life like him shouldn't overestimate himself. In the same second, the madman's aura intensified several times and unleashed a bright stream of energy. From the power of the vortex created, both adventurers could barely stay on their feet. Ark thought to himself that he hadn't expected less strength from a level 300 man. The boy realized that if they started fighting now, he wouldn't stand a chance. Nevertheless, he did not budge, having only level 21. But at the same second, the main character's attention was drawn to an object behind his opponent's back. The dragon's huge carcass was still lying there without moving. However, the crystal in the center of its neck was not broken. The fire of life still blazed within him, and that meant that the dragon was not completely slain. Ark realized that he could use this situation to his advantage. The core is still very much vulnerable. If, in the heat of battle, he managed to reach and break the crystal, the armor would be able to absorb all 300 levels of the World Destroyer. Trying to think through the next course of action, the protagonist asked the armor if there was a skill for ranged attacks that he could acquire now. A low voice answered that there were a few seconds left to complete the search. At the same moment, Ark raised his head when he heard Baldar call out to him. The madman attacked the guy almost without delay, swinging his sword in a leap. You even Baldar shouted frantically that it was too late to beg for mercy. The boy realized he was an idiot for letting his opponent get so close at the start of the fight. In the next instant, the heaviest blow of the sword struck the ground in front of Ark and Ein. A torrent of fire rained down on both adventurers, knocking them to the ground. Unable to stay on his feet, the protagonist flew off to the side, somersaulting and trying not to collapse. A short while later, the guy fell to the ground. The entire field around him was scorched in a huge radius after that attack, 
bloodstains appeared on Ark's forehead. It was then that he marveled at this incredible power. The lad thought that such phenomena were indeed worthy of the rank of calamity. Baldar looked contentedly at his defeated opponent and wondered if he had just lost his mind. He then looked fiercely into the eyes of the protagonist and said that this was the end. The madman headed towards Ark, who was struggling to get to his feet. When he saw it, he thought that if he continued like this, he would definitely be finished. At this point, the armor said that the quest was complete and recommended acquiring the small grenade skill. This ability gives the weapon a small explosive power and costs 20 levels. The protagonist looked at this suggestion in bewilderment and didn't understand how it could help him. He said he couldn't destroy the core if he tried to detonate his sword. However, the armor replied that it would not be necessary. Ark looked around again and saw that the enemy was quite close. He asked the armor again what was required of him. In response, a low voice recommended the use of poisoned knives to raise the level. The protagonist rose to his feet with great difficulty, asking if this was really all that could help him. Baldar looked over his opponent who was still fighting for his life and asked why he was trying to get up. Receiving no reply, he shouted that the boy could do nothing, for even to stand on his feet he could manage with great difficulty. In response, Ark only quietly sent a request to acquire the small grenade's ability. A second later, the crystal in the center of his chest glowed brightly. The bully looked at what was happening in bewilderment. He had never seen anything like this before, so he asked the boy what he was doing. Immediately, the protagonist extended his arm to the side. Three sharp daggers glowed between his fingers. Then he looked at his opponent with hatred. There was no despair or panic in his eyes. Suddenly, Ark swung his arm and threw all three knives at Baldar, shouting that everything was about to change. It was not the first time the adventurer had encountered this ability. He realized at once that they were the most common poison daggers. At the same second, Baldar swung his sword. There was a clang of metal signaling that he had repulsed the attack. The psycho looked at his desperate opponent in bewilderment and asked why he was playing with him, some childish game. He asked the brat angrily, what was the point if those knives didn't reach their target? Suddenly, Ark replied that he realized that none of the daggers had harmed Baldar. But then he replied with a faint smile that he hadn't originally been aiming for the adventurer. After that, the protagonist saw something shining brightly in the dragon's core. This meant that his attack had reached its target after all. Realizing the horror of what had happened, Baldar turned around and saw a blade sticking out of the brightly glowing crystal. Ark shouted afterward, ordering the weapon to explode. A bright flash followed by a shockwave blew the dragon's core into small pieces. The boy looked contentedly at the startled creature, pleased that his plan had worked. Now the Destroyer of Worlds has finally come to an end. After that, dozens of bright streams of energy rushed out from the body of the defeated dragon directly towards the protagonist. Balmer stared at this apparition stunned for the first time encountering something like this. After that, a low voice coming from the direction of the arch said that the owner's level had been raised. Hearing this, the big guy looked at his opponent in bewilderment. Judging from the brat's appearance, his aura had transformed to a great extent. At the same second, he suddenly lunged at the adventurer. The guy's speed instantly increased to the point where his movements were hard to track. Baldar had barely had time to regain his senses before Ark was upon him with his first attack, which the psycho barely had time to block. The adventurer tried to figure out what had happened to the bastard and why he had become so strong. The big man asked his opponent how he could do such things with only level 21. Ark replied that he had indeed been weak until a while ago, but that things had changed now. In that very second, his aura increased in strength, dispelling all of Baldar's energy with its power. The boy looked triumphantly into the eyes of the maddened adventurer and said that he was level 301. Judging by the thug's face, he was starting to panic a bit. Gradually, the initiative began to pass to the opponent. Just then, he looked at Ark in exasperation and said that he seemed to have figured it out. Waving off the annoying brat, Baldar added that he wondered how the guy was going to defeat this monster. And it all happened because of some damn ability. Such brazen theft of his loot by some bastard had driven the thug into a state of complete insanity. He forcefully pounced on Ark again, who, despite his increased level, still couldn't get used to his opponent's speed. After another powerful blow, the main character's body flew back again. Baldar looked at Ark madly and said he shouldn't joke with him like that. The boy rose from the ground, but this time the movements were much easier for him. The madman then added that he didn't see any problem with it, as the guy was only one level higher. While the protagonist was trying to regain consciousness, the big guy asked, did he really think he could handle a madness rank adventurer with vast combat experience? 
Then he shouted that he still thought the outcome of the fight was a foregone conclusion and pounced again on Ark, who barely had time to get to his feet. However, this powerful attack suddenly hit the wrong target. The protagonist managed to dodge it by jumping aside. Baldar looked confusedly in the direction the boy had dodged, not realizing how he hadn't had time, hadn't been able to keep up with the brat. But by that point, Ark's look was completely different. He deftly maneuvered in the air and counterattacked, attacking his opponent from behind. Baldar, sensing danger, barely had time to block the approaching blow. With each new active phase of the fight, the ground around them shook more and more violently. The protagonist kept stepping more and more on his opponent. He shouted that he didn't care about any of Baldar's experience. Ark launched attack after attack, not intending to give his opponent any respite. By this point, the big guy wasn't fighting at all and was just trying to dodge more and more blows. It was the first time in his career as an adventurer of the rank of madness that Baldar had faced such an opponent. It was then that the boy shouted that there was no way he would lose to such a bastard. But no sooner had Ark launched another attack than the big guy instantly changed his aura, throwing a huge amount of energy into the air. For now, the fighting stopped for a while. The madman said the boy's armor was pretty good, but then the bulky man added that he was sick of the guy talking nonsense here. The upstart then looked at the protagonist's face with hatred in his eyes and said that this one better shut up. Then, Baldar activated the Blood God Manifestation skill. The entire sky around him was immediately blinded by an incredible flash. In the next instant, a huge beam of energy pierced into the big guy's body from the clouds. The madman's armor and body began to emit a completely different aura. It was also amazing that a mere human body could contain such a huge surge of energy. Ark covered himself with his hand against the rush of air. He'd never heard of anything like this before, and it was confusing him. Before the protagonist could even realize it, his opponent immediately delivered a sharp, slashing blow to his side. Baldar kept shouting and repeating the word, Force. The big guy wouldn't stop, saying that now the brat would see his true power. The frightened Ark dodged the big man's relentless attacks time after time with great difficulty. At the same time, the mad adventurer was getting closer and closer to the protagonist shouting that he had nowhere to run. Looking at these massive attacks, the boy realized that if he couldn't dodge, he would definitely be finished. He had to keep maneuvering between these blows, contemplating how to deal with the problem that had appeared. In that second, Ark realized that this was most likely the same skill he had encountered in the purchase panel. It was a unique ability that could only be used once, and it greatly increased the level of the wielder. With that thought, the boy scurried off to the side, realizing that he would need some time to implement the plan that had appeared to him. At that time, he also tried to give the armor a command to acquire the skill. However, Baldar, who heard this, instantly attacked the protagonist, adding that there was nothing the guy could do anymore. Ark had to retreat even more. If the big man continued to attack him, the plan might not work. But the moment the madman tried to attack once again, a familiar figure swept past the protagonist. Ark saw Baldar's hardest blow deflected by Ein's shield. The difference in levels, however, was too high, and in the next instant, the green-haired adventurer's body was thrown back. The boy fell to the ground far to the side, writhing in pain. Then he rolled over from his back, and resting his hand on the wet ground, turned to Ark. In a trembling voice, Ain said that if that bastard had dealt with the dragon originally, all of his friends would be alive right now. Immediately, the boy raised his tearful eyes and asked the protagonist to avenge the adventurers killed in battle. Disappointed by this scene, Ark looked at Baldar with hatred and replied to his partner that he would definitely do it. The boy then waved his hand to the side and sent a request to acquire the Black Armor Curse ability. The madman who heard this once again tried to attack the protagonist with a powerful slashing blow. Armor warned Ark that this skill could only be used once. Seconds before the powerful energy stream reached the protagonist's body, a low voice asked if the host would confirm the acquisition request. The boy immediately shouted that he agreed with everything, and the armor approved the request. The voice also added that the cost of a skill varies from one to infinity. Thus, it is possible to pay extra with any number of levels. Holding back the oncoming energy storm, the protagonist shouted out that he wanted to add points. He said he wanted to add 299 levels so that the total acquisition cost would be 300. The armor responded by successfully accepting the request and acquired the skill. At the same moment, 300 energy beams merged into one large glowing pillar pointing towards the heavens. In response, a huge beam of sparkling light shot out from the clouds of the Ark. Ein watched in horror, trying to figure out what had happened to his comrade. The moment the flow of energy gradually began to dissipate, 
A boy appeared in front of the green-haired adventurer's face. It seemed his body could barely contain the incoming force. Now Ark possessed the first level again. He bet everything he had on this risky move. A surprised Baldar turned to the bastard and asked what he had just done. Not waiting for a response, the bulky man decided to check the boy's status to see if anything had changed. Suddenly, the madman saw something that made him laugh. He suddenly realized that the brat was somehow once again a first-level weakling. Confident of his unqualified victory, Baldar shouted that now the guy was definitely finished. He then called his opponent a complete idiot and pounced on him, shouting that it was time for him to die. Ark looked indifferently at the crazed adventurer and turned to him. The protagonist told the big man that he would never beat him. After that, the guy activated the purchased ability. The aura around him instantly turned a dark purple color. Baldar immediately stopped and looked at his opponent in confusion. The boy looked completely different from the person who had recently gotten a measly first level. Ark stretched out his hand and lightly squeezed his fingers, making it look like he was grabbing something. At the same instant, streams of dark matter rushed toward the stunned Baldar. The madman stood stiffly, unable to move. At the same instant, an unknown ability gripped him tightly by the throat. After the initial shock, the madman felt himself begin to lose his strength. He felt matter begin to flow through his veins and squeeze him like an apple. Seeing Baldar floundering helplessly, Ark said it was the curse of the black armor. The essence of this ability is to absorb the opponent's level in proportion to the points spent. The weakening thug glanced fearfully at the guy, trying to comprehend what he had just said. The protagonist added that he had spent 299 levels. Accordingly, Baldar would lose the same amount. Ark then ironically asked his helpless opponent what level he thought he would end up with. The crazy adventurer asked the guy confusedly, was the guy really kidding him like that? Then, when there was no response, the bully had a panic attack. He became hysterical and screamed for the brat to let him go immediately. The protagonist smiled and said that his plan was originally quite simple. Now, once the ability is complete, they will both only be level one. Then Baldar threw back his head and shouted. Now, all his years of labor had been spoiled by one fight. Soon, the dark matter gradually began to recede then calmly landed on the ground. He gritted his teeth, still unable to believe what was happening. The psycho said it was simply impossible. The adventurer then glared furiously at his opponent and shouted that this was utter nonsense. Out of a last hope, he opened the information panel to see if there had been any changes. In the next second, Baldar's horror was unbounded. As of now, he really only had a paltry first level. The big guy saw the protagonist smile. He said he wasn't going to let any bastard sneer at him and especially not the one who stole all the levels from him. Baldar looked menacingly at Ark and said that he was still a Calamity rank adventurer. The article Madman confidently said that even having a level one, he could easily crush the boy. But as soon as the thug uttered this, the protagonist ran up and delivered a slashing blow to his opponent. Before Baldar even had a chance to realize it, blood immediately spurted from his mouth. Ark told his defeated opponent that recently there was a man in the village of Rakuru who was called the Corpse Collector. The guy then began to deliver blow after blow while telling a story. He said that because of his skill, the corpse collector could not gain experience and could not level up. The madman dodged several blows and drew his sword and looked tiredly at the boy. The bulky man then ordered the brat to shut up in a rage and swung his sword. In the next second, he struck the ground, intending to once again create an energy wave to knock his opponent down. However, due to the weakening, Baldar no longer had this opportunity. Watching this death agony, Ark continued the story by saying that this gathering of corpses had only level one. The protagonist then stood up to his full height and swung his sword once more. In the next instant, he attacked the mad adventurer, cutting off his arm. Ark said that the corpse collector was now invincible. After looking over his defeated opponent, the boy said that after all he had been through, he knew best how to survive on the first level. Baldar's eyes gradually began to darken. He frantically examined his hand which was lying on the ground in the pouring rain. Blood began to gush from his body. The bully gradually began to lose the last of his strength. With rage and consternation, he turned around and glared at the brat, calling him a fucking bastard. Baldar then tried to raise his huge sword in his only remaining hand. Leaning on his weapon, the madman said it wasn't over yet. Ark glanced behind him disdainfully, saying that it was already clear to everyone who had won. But suddenly, the wounded adventurer bounced off the ground and pounced on his opponent. He was bleeding, screaming unintelligibly, and staring hatefully at the strange type. Hearing this, the protagonist said that it seems that Baldar has stopped being sober about the situation. With incredible speed, the guy turned around and lightning fast repelled the thug's desperate attack. The madman's sword flew aside with a clang, and Ark said it was already over. 
In the next instant, he swiftly threw a multitude of punches at his opponent's body. Baldar, choking on his own blood, could do nothing about it. Yet his eyes still glowed with hatred before he died. A second later, the madman's body fell to the ground, and he stopped moving. Only then did Baldar's weapon, which had flown aside with a clang, slammed into the ground. This wounded Ayn was finally able to get closer to his savior. The green-haired adventurer grabbed Ark's hand and thanked the boy for being able to avenge all his comrades. The protagonist replied that he shouldn't be thanked, because even without Ayn's request, he wouldn't have been able to forgive the bastard and would have defeated him anyway. Suddenly, a sound from behind made the boy look around. He heard a slight stirring coming from the side of Baldar's body. The big man didn't seem to want to accept defeat. Suddenly, the madman shouted out, calling out to the Black Knight. Baldar said the bastard cut off his right arm and cornered himself with it. Psycho said that he would hate to do it, but it would soon be known to other adventurers with the rank of insanity. Bleeding, Baldar said that if he stopped showing any activity, everyone would find it suspicious, and they would immediately look for him. Lifting the ground, he said, these annoyances are always very curious. Grasping the spot where the severed arm used to be, Baldar said that his friends would be curious as to who had defeated him, and they would begin hunting the boy. With a furious look at his assassin, the bulky man said that the Black Knight would definitely come to an end. After hearing all of this, Ark said he didn't care if anyone else could challenge him. Guy added that he would definitely fight in such a case. Baldar said that in that case, the boy should pray that he would not waste all his strength for nothing. At that moment, the bracelet on the adventurer's arm glowed. It was then that he thought he had already lost too much blood. After a while, the light from the amulet began to intensify. The exhausted Baldar told the Black Knight that they would see each other again. Ayn immediately realized what was up and shouted to Ark that the bastard wanted to teleport. The protagonist grabbed his weapon, shouting that at this rate he would just run away and needed to be stopped sooner rather than later. Lastly, Baldar muttered that he would make the Black Knight regret not finishing him off at once and asked him to memorize those words. After that, a bright pillar of scarlet flame enveloped the adventurer's defenseless body. Then Baldar disappeared and the energy flowed into the sky. He thought, annoyed, that next time he would kill him for sure. Turning back to Ain, the protagonist said he was a little short on time. The terrified adventurer said it was just awful, for Baldar would surely come back for them with reinforcements. After Ayn's question about what they should do next, Ark replied that they would be fine, but right now it was advisable for them to get out of here as soon as possible. Then the boy suddenly smiled and said that even if Baldar got in his way once more, he would definitely defeat this madman. Ain, who had calmed down after those words, told Ark that he relied on him a lot. Also, the main character said that what's more important now is that they lost so many people in this battle. The leader of the once large unit looked fearfully at the field and gulped, saying he needed to report casualties. Suddenly, Ark turned to Ayn in a mysterious voice. After asking the adventurer what happened, the protagonist said that he had one request and asked his interlocutor to listen to him. On the way to the village, Ark told his partner everything he thought. The green-haired man asked him if he was sure. The boy said without hesitation that he had made up his mind long ago. After that, Ayn looked at his companion with a satisfied look and smiled. After a while, both boys reached the settlement safely. Ark looked around the familiar neighborhoods with a smile and was glad they were finally back. At this point, Ayn distracted his interlocutor by saying that when the boy had asked him for a favor, he had not expected such a request from such a strong adventurer. The green-haired man said it was a surprise to him when Ark asked him to bring him to another city. The protagonist agreed, saying that he still wants to remain the protector of his home village and help the people here. And now he had attracted the attention of adventurers of the rank of madness. If Ark stays here, Baldar's adventurers will find him sooner or later anyway. In this case, the villagers will be in great danger, and the boy wants to protect them from such a threat with all his might. Ayn said that he understood his interlocutor perfectly well, so he listened to his request to the end. The adventurer then took out a glowing amulet from his pocket and said that he had already notified the Guild of the Losses, an arc using the magical communicator. Guy explained to the organization the situation going on, and several adventurers had been sent to the village for protection, so it would be safe for a while. The protagonist thanked Ayn sincerely, and the latter smiled back. What both boys didn't know at the time was that all this time Mill had been following them through the streets, eavesdropping on the conversation. At one of the alleys, the girl hastily turned around and ran in the opposite direction. Upon reaching the market rows, Ark was surprised to see that the shop where his grandfather worked was closed today. The protagonist thought it was probably because it was a day off. Ayn wondered with interest if the person he was talking to wanted to see someone. 
the guy said that he could quietly make arrangements and change the day of departure. Ark, however, shook his head. The boy said they had better go, for if he saw his loved ones, their parting would be painful. The protagonist thought to himself that it wasn't just Grandpa. He also didn't want to say goodbye to Mill and Lyra. Leaving the village, the lad reasoned that he would not forgive himself if people dear to him were hurt just because they got involved with someone like him. With this thought, the travelers reached the stone archway dividing the village boundary. Ein turned to his companion, saying that if he left this place, he would not be able to return here soon. Then he asked Ark if he would regret that decision. The boy made a serious face and answered in the negative without a second thought. Then he adjusted the sack on his shoulder with his hand and advanced. But no sooner had the protagonist set off for a new life than a familiar voice called out to him from behind. It was his grandfather, holding a package in his hands. The boy turned around and the old man asked his grandson why he had a sad expression on his face. Hearing no reply, the merchant held out his hand with the packet to Ark, saying that he happened to know that the lad was going on a trip. For such an occasion, Grandpa specially decided to bake bread for the road. The protagonist took the package, apologizing to the old man for deciding to leave the village so abruptly. Seeing that the boy was tense and upset, the old man said that he should just smile. He also added that if Ark did decide to leave their village, then there must be a good reason. The merchant said the boy is called an adventurer for a reason. Grandfather muttered that he had been watching Ark's formation for a long time. And now he wanted to see the boy with a smile on his face as a farewell. These words made the protagonist very sad and only brought on a new sadness. However, Ark still gathered his thoughts and gave one last smile. He waved goodbye to his grandfather, telling him it was time for him to move out. Afterward, the companion set out on the road in high spirits. I noted with a smile that this old man seemed to be a very nice person. On the road, Ark opened the bag and looked at the loaf with some nostalgia. Then he pushed away the sad memories and took a bite of bread. Ein looked at his companion and asked what the farewell bread tasted like. The protagonist replied with a smile on his face that it was incredibly delicious. The green-haired adventurer replied that was fine. He also added that they would first look into the city where the guild he worked for was located. Their path lay to the sand-covered southern headquarters of the Adventurer's Guild, the city of Durham. The moment the companions had already moved far away from the village, Mill found Lyra after all. Only then did she manage to convey this unexpected news. Lyra was shocked and upset that the man she liked had left the village without even saying goodbye to her. Some time later, when the travelers crossed one of the next hills, they saw a strange sight. A group of goblins attacked a wagon standing on the road. The levels of these monsters ranged from first to fifth, Ian shouted that this was what a caravan of traveling traders usually looked like. At the same time, Ark asked his partner to support his stuff for literally one minute. The guy immediately unsheathed his sword, saying that it would be a good idea for him to level up before arriving in the city. In the next second, he decapitated half of the goblins on the road with a few deft moves. The leader of the group of monsters, who possessed level 5, pounced on Ark from behind. However, the boy had no problem parrying this attack. He then swung his sword again and killed several more monsters with a single blow. Already accustomed to such a spectacle, Ein watched the beating with interest. Mentally, he thought about how he couldn't wait for the moment when Ark would finally show all of his true power. Meanwhile, the protagonist continued to take down opponents without difficulty. After the last level absorption, the boy looked around and, seeing no more monsters, realized that this battle had been a success. Now they needed to get to Durham if possible without any unnecessary stops. A while later, the hero and reached the city. Passing through the main gate, the adventurers immediately found themselves in one of the busy streets. Ian said they had finally arrived. Ark looked at the exotic buildings with interest. The companion turned around and told his partner that this was the very southern town of Durham. This fortress was located northeast of the village of Rakura. Durham is one of the largest cities in the southern part of the continent. Upon entering, Ark immediately noted that it was very crowded and the atmosphere was drastically different from the village. Ein grinned and said it was not surprising, for Durham was one of the most traveled cities. He also pointed to the spire of a tall tower, saying that this was the location of the headquarters. Ein added that the full name of the organization was the southern branch of the Adventurers Guild Central Council. The green-haired man enlightened his companion, saying that there were many headquarters on the continent. There are many talented adventurers in all of them. Ein explained that specifically in this ward, there are also a lot of unusual guys similar to Ark. Unexpectedly, the companion said that the protagonist would not have to stand out much against their background, unless, of course, he upgraded his level again. The boy smiled at Ein. At the moment, he had 110th level, 
Ark then turned to his companion and thanked him for his advice. The fact is that on the way to Durham, the traveler stopped several more times for the protagonist to increase his level. At one point, Ayn said that it was not worth it to level up unnecessarily. These words surprised Ark, and he asked why that was so. The companion said that if the guy's level was very different from others, it would attract undue attention. Ayn asked Ark to imagine a situation where he would walk under Dorema, having a level 300, for example. The people around him would immediately start saying that he was an adventurer of the madness rank. When word spreads through the city, Baldar's bloodhounds will surely know of the unknown hero's appearance. Besides, if the other adventurers found out that Ark was the type who had defeated their comrade, they would surely want to match strength with him, leading to more destruction. Furthermore, Ayn explained that it was rumored that there were a bunch of weirdos among people like Baldar, so it was best not to attract the attention of strange individuals. Suddenly, the green-haired man turned around and looked sideways behind him. Between the rocks, he saw a rabbit shaking with fear. Ayn tried to summon the frightened animal, telling his partner that the adventurers should stick together rather than measure their strength. The rabbit looked incredulously in the man's direction and did not react at first. However, he then took a few timid steps toward Ayn. The very next second, the animal jumped into the green-haired man's arms. The boy said that adventurers should keep the peace of peaceful citizens and protect them. Remembering this situation, Ark looked at his companion and thought that he was very talented. Most adventurers who have achieved serious success are only interested in money and fame, and so was Baldar. Ark smiled and thought he wished he could be as kind and fair as Ayn. However, something the boy disagreed with. Just because he has a high level doesn't mean anything. An adventurer must match his power and use it wisely. Afterward, the protagonist asked his guide where they were going now. Ayn immediately remembered this and apologized for the fact that they had been chatting and he hadn't told them about the plans at all. First, they need to report the Destroyer of Worlds, so first they need to go to the guild headquarters. After saying that, Ayn became very sad and seriously thought about something. The protagonist noticed this sudden change of mood. Most likely, his companion remembered his dead friends for the first time in a long time. The rest of the way was passed in complete silence. Soon, the companions reached a high tower. Inside, Ayn and Ark had to wait in line at the reception area. Soon, it was their turn. A pleasant-looking girl said hello to the adventurers and asked what order they wanted to report. Ayn said he relayed everything in the communicator report. The girl said that in that case, she would now give out the reward. She then asked with a smile to say the name of the mission accomplished. I sullenly muttered that they had resolved the incident in Rakura Village. The monster's name was World Destroyer. After these words, the reception room fell silent. The girl behind the counter looked at the visitors with surprise and some consternation. Ark was stunned at the sudden silence and thought that surely this was unusual for them. After that, the girl abruptly turned around and started frantically digging somewhere, saying that she would now present the award. Then she turned around and put the Pepper Heroes' four purses up to the top stuffed with gold coins. Ayn stared at the award silently, not uttering a word. Suddenly, the girl said that the report she received said that the rest of the squad had died during the mission. Therefore, the entire reward for slaying the dragon goes to the sole survivor. That is Mr. Ayn. After that, the girl looked away confusedly, not knowing what else to say. In that same second, the realization came to Ark as to why his partner had been slumped the entire way. Ayn feels great guilt for being the sole survivor of the massacre. Now these nightmares will torment him. After that, the adventurer took the money in his hands. The girl asked to accept her condolences, and Ayn thanked her. The partners turned around and headed towards the exit. The protagonist asked his companion what the girl was talking about. Ayn sadly said that all the members of his squad were dead. The guy himself, in turn, was the leader of this group. He was supposed to be responsible for their lives. But in the end, this situation happened. The adventurer looked into the boy's eyes and asked him what he thought an opinion would be formed about such a leader. At the same moment, Ark guessed what Ayn meant. The two partners walked out of the guild building depressed. Suddenly, they saw a crowd in front of them. The green-haired adventurer said that the rumors had spread much faster than he had expected them to. Looking at the people in front of him, he said he didn't want Ark to be hurt by it. At the same second, the relatives of the victims hurled threats and insults at Ayn. At this point, his partner told Ark that he now had to talk to the friends and families of his fallen comrades himself. Now it is up to him as a leader to take on the full wrath of these people. He was appointed squad leader. All his subordinates were killed by his mistake. So now, as sad as it is, it doesn't change the fact that he is guilty. The desperate people did not stop shouting insults at Ayn. They blamed him for the deaths of their acquaintances and friends. Suddenly, the guy opened his mouth and the whole crowd went silent. 
he said he takes full responsibility for what happened. Ain continued, saying that he had not been able to keep any member of the group from being killed. As a result, all the adventurers died solely because of his mistakes. The crowd was silent for a while. For a second, it seemed that they accepted Ain's contrition. Suddenly, one man shouted out that he didn't care who or how much regret he had for what he had done. Then he trembled and cried. Through his sobs, the boy said that all these guys were the best adventurers. Just then, he shouted out that he didn't believe that the squad could lose to a level 150 flame dragon. Ark was surprised when he heard this. He realized that all these people were wrong, and they didn't know what was real. The squad encountered a level 300 level world destroyer. None of the adventurers were prepared to face such a terrifying force. Ark tried to cut into the conversation and say that it wasn't as the relatives had been told. But Ain stopped his partner abruptly. The protagonist was surprised to ask his companion why he was doing this. The adventurer said that he really appreciated that the boy was concerned about him. But regardless of the degree of danger, it is Ayn who is to blame for the squad's demise. The guy said that if he had ordered the evacuation of the villagers then, he could have avoided what happened. Suddenly, someone shouted loudly from the crowd, saying that they had no intention of listening to these pathetic excuses. A tall, bald man was making his way toward the companions, shoving people. He suddenly shouted out that Ayn had condemned his comrades to death for a greater reward. The impudent, unknown man instantly enraged Ark. He reminded him a lot of one of Ayn's deputies on that trip. The protagonist ran up to the bald Vernier and said that Ayn would never do such a thing in his life. The adventurer tried to quiet his friend, but Ark was unstoppable. The thug suddenly ordered the brat to shut his mouth, saying that he didn't want to hear excuses from some strangers. The protagonist instantly became enraged, saying that he wasn't an outsider, and he and Ayn fought a level 300 level world destroyer together. At that very second, the entire crowd whispered sharply. People didn't believe that anyone could come back alive after such a battle. One of the relatives of the dead said that someone should go to the guild and find out the details. The bald big guy opened the information panel and waved his hand, saying that the brat shouldn't be talking such nonsense. Ark recognized the bulky man's name as Will. The big man was surprised that the guy had the same level as him. Still, the main question remained how he survived against a level 300 level monster. The guy, realizing where this was going, replied that he had his reasons. Will cocked his head up and laughed out loud. He said, almost crying, that he'd never heard such nonsense. Suddenly, the big man looked menacingly at Ark and ordered the milkman to get the hell out of here. The protagonist didn't budge and, after calling his opponent a fatty, said he should make him. In the next second, both adventurers drew their swords and crossed them, glaring at each other hatefully. From the power of the fighters, shockwaves began to split the air around them. Shielding himself from the flying sand, Ayn ordered Ark to stop doing things like that. However, the fight suddenly turned into an active phase. Ayn tried to reason with his partner, saying that he was the one who was a bad leader, and it was because of his mistake that his comrades died. But neither Ark nor Will heard the calls to stop. After several repeated attacks, both fighters landed on the ground and the bout was broken for a while. Suddenly, Ark shouted that what Ayn was saying was not true. The green-haired adventurer looked at his partner in bewilderment and asked what he meant. The protagonist rose to his feet. He said that there was no denying the fact that all the comrades had died. In the next second, Ark and Will crossed swords again. This time it seemed that the protagonist had some advantage. In the heat of battle, the boy shouted that there was no way anyone could have predicted such an outcome. Ark addressed the gathered men, saying that as squad leader, Ayn had been with his comrades to the very end, even in the face of death. The guy then gave a strong blow to Will's sword, while saying that Ayn didn't abandon his comrades and run away from the battlefield. The bulky man's weapon flew back a few meters and embedded itself into the ground with a clang. Will stepped back to a safe distance and mumbled something to himself, his whole body shaking. Ark then turned to his partner and said that there was another factor that proved Ayn's innocence. While the guy was in floods of tears, the protagonist said that someone who faked death for a reward would never mourn his friends. After a brief silence, the boy said that if Ayn wanted to take responsibility for the deaths of his comrades, he would have no objection. But the same arc added that it is wrong to take responsibility for everything that has happened, because many things happen regardless of the person. Holding back tears, the protagonist told Ayn that he was a leader who, despite the situation, did not abandon his comrades and avenged their deaths. The green-haired adventurer looked up with tearful eyes and asked the guy why he was helping him. Suddenly, Ark held out his hand to his partner and said that he was the ideal adventurer that the protagonist aspires to be. 
After that, the guy helped Ewan up off the ground. Suddenly angry, Will muttered that this wasn't over. He reached behind his back and grabbed the small knife attached to his belt. Shouting that he hated living strangers, the bulky man swooped down on Ark from behind his back. Ain noticed the approaching danger and warned his partner to be more careful. Ark turned around. However, he realized he didn't have much time to react. But suddenly the path of the running Will was blocked by an unknown man who seemed to appear out of nowhere. The blade of his sword was at the level of the bulky man's neck. The old man in white and gold robes looked menacingly at Ayn and said that he had been waiting for him to return. Ark unsheathed his sword and looked at the strange man across from him. In turn, the green-haired adventurer nodded his head and said he understood that. The protagonist sensed that this was no ordinary old man. There was a terrifying aura emanating from him. In addition, the guy couldn't guess who it was at all. Suddenly, Ayn calmly asked his companion to lower his sword, causing Ark to look at him incomprehensibly. The guy explained that the person opposite is his colleague. He was the supreme adventurer of the Sword of Salvation Guild. His name was Mr. Guirai. This venerable man possessed an incredible 200th level. The old man turned to the protagonist, asking if he was an adventurer named Ark. After receiving an affirmative nod, the old man thanked the boy for saving Ayn during the battle against the Destroyer of Worlds. He also admired the fact that both guys had taken part in defeating that monster. The relatives of the dead also heard the conversation. They couldn't believe that two brats could defeat such a powerful creature. But if such things were confirmed by the supreme adventurer of the guild himself, then those words were surely true. Unexpectedly, Gray added that he was also aware of their meeting with that bastard named Baldar. Ark was surprised that some old man already knew about such confidential things. Ayn assured him, however, that everything that had happened in the village had to be told. The adventurer said that he immediately informed the central office and the guildmaster about Baldar. Ayn decided to make the point clear to his colleague. The destroyer of worlds had not been killed in his time. It was only thanks to Ark that he had been defeated. All this would not have happened if Baldar had destroyed the core, which he was well aware of. So now that the central office had learned of what one of the best adventurers was up to, there was a bounty on him. Gureus said that now he understood everything. The old man explained that he had been on an expedition and could not come to the aid of Ein's group. Besides, he had only recently arrived in Durham, just after he had been informed of what had happened. Suddenly, Mr. Guire looked at the relatives of the dead. He said through gritted teeth that as soon as he returned, a bunch of idiots started blaming the squad leader for the deaths of his comrades. Looking at Will menacingly, the old man added that none of them even wanted to get into the situation. Jerry then turned to the families of the victims. He said he understood their pain and no words or money would bring their loved ones back to life. But suddenly, the old man shouted that that's what adventurers are for. It is their job to keep the peace and quiet of the country's citizens. And each time, they risk their lives for the good of others. Geary said angrily that all of the dead knew what they were getting into when they became adventurers, and that was their fate. The old man looked around at those present in fury, saying that they were in the business of passing the buck to those who had fought their loved ones to the very end. After these strong words, the crowd fell silent. At the end, the old man said that was the end of any talk they would have about this hike. Ark was also greatly impressed by Gire's speech. He asked his partner if this man was a good man. He replied that the protagonist may not doubt him, but this type is very harsh. After the relatives of the dead had dispersed, the old man turned around and looked menacingly at Ayn. Gare then told the green-haired adventurer in no uncertain terms that he was expelling the one from the guild. Ark looked at the old man in bewilderment and asked what he meant. However, from the look on Ayn's face, he had expected a similar outcome. Girei said that he had resolved the misunderstanding anyway, but the guy's incompetence could not be explained in any way. In the next second, he called Ayn the leader who had doomed the entire team to death. Mr. Guairi explained that he could not leave a man with such a past in one of Durham's strongest guilds. Ark was very much surprised to learn that this sort of salvation organization was so top-notch. The old man ended his explanation by saying that he was sorry and asked Ayn if he had any objections to the decision. The guy replied that he understood, but he had one last favor to ask. Gure folded his arms across his chest and asked, exhaling heavily to see what it was all about. Ayn clapped his partner on the back and asked if the Ark Guild would accept Ark as a member. The protagonist huffed at his partner upon hearing such an unexpected request. However, Ayn didn't seem to be listening to the boy. He said that if the boy could find allies in the guild, Ark would be able to achieve a lot in the future, bringing benefit to the city. 
The green-haired man smiled, saying that even though he had been expelled from the guild, his friend now had every prospect of becoming a first-class adventurer. Mr. Girai was silent for a few seconds, and then tried to say that he understood everything. However, he was immediately interrupted by the protagonist, shouting that he didn't agree to it. Ein looked at his partner in bewilderment, who wasn't about to accept such a great offer. The boy muttered that he understood the reason for expelling Ein. He also realized that he had no way to influence it. But suddenly, Ark shouted sharply, saying that he would not join an organization that threw things at his comrades for the sake of his own reputation. The protagonist was furious, and Ein tried to calm him down. The adventurer said that if his partner joined the guild, he could get the support of various influential people. Furthermore, Ein added that Ark had told him himself that he wanted to join the guild very badly to help people. Therefore, a chance like this where he could be vouched for should not be missed. Suddenly, the boy ironically asked his companion, Do you really have to join somewhere to save people? Without receiving a reply, he looked at the headquarters building and said that in that case, he would just form his own guild. After this unexpectedly daring to march, the paths of Jureus and the boys parted. The boys went to one of the city streets. Walking down an alleyway, Ayn led his partner to an old abandoned tower. The protagonist stared in bewilderment at the dilapidated building that seemed about to collapse. Ark turned to the adventurer, asking if this was really the right place for them. Ayn replied without a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't so bad here. He looked around the building again and told the protagonist that this was where the history of his guild would begin. Now this place was to be their main base. The boy then lit up with happiness and thanked the guy for inviting him into his guild. Ark smiled and replied that he couldn't have done otherwise. Immediately after Ayn's expulsion, Ark announced the formation of his own guild, in which his new partner would be the first member. Against Mr. Gyrie's background, proclaiming one's own organization seemed childish. After the building was inspected from the outside, Ark added that he still had a lot to learn from Ayn to become as top-notch an adventurer. He added that he was willing to receive any advice on the matter. The partner replied to his new leader that he would try to help him with useful things. After that, the guys gave each other fist bumps and headed inside the base. Walking through the door, the protagonist thought that there would be few pluses from this place so far. Inside, everything looked very shabby. The first thing to do was to rebuild the place from scratch. Inspecting the broken walls, Ayn reminded them that they weren't officially a guild yet and they didn't have much money. The guy said that a huge amount of what was available had to be given just to buy this building. Although they received an incredible reward for killing the Destroyer of Worlds, most of that money was given to the families of those who died on this expedition. In the corner of the room, Ark unexpectedly found an old closet. He opened the doors to see what was inside. The boy thought to himself that he'd originally expected their money to be enough for everything, but he'd miscalculated. Suddenly, a cloud of dust erupted from an old closet, enveloping the protagonist from head to toe. Ark began to frantically shake off the dirt while Ayn laughed at what had happened. They had spent the last of their money on this building to open their guild headquarters. But as expected, the conditions here were completely inhumane. So the first thing to do was to get the building looking tidy and do a general cleaning. In the process, expectedly, there were many embarrassments. Now that the boys were within the confines of a safe city, they could take their time getting nowhere. They both had no responsibilities left to anyone. Ark thought with a smile that when he got that armor, his whole life had turned into a battlefield. He missed those peaceful days so much. While the heroes were cleaning the inside of the building, they didn't see anyone approaching them from outside. Suddenly, the door swung open sharply and a woman's voice apologized for the intrusion. The boys looked toward the passageway in bewilderment to see who had broken in. Suddenly, Ark saw Mill and Lyra standing in the doorway. The boy immediately had a lot of questions about how they had gotten here alone. Suddenly, Mill shouted furiously that he wouldn't get rid of them that easily. In turn, Lyra said in a sad voice that she was upset that the main character had left the village without even saying goodbye to them. Both girls immediately pounced on Ark who didn't understand why he deserved such attention. At the same moment, it was still the middle of the day in the city. A man in armor ran outside Durham, shouting an urgent errand. Toward the gates of the city, he announced that all urgent adventurers needed to head to the west entrance immediately. The man rushed past the guards, leaving the warriors puzzled. One of the adventurers, shield in hand, said he would go forward. His partner said he should not be so reckless. The guard was about to run forward, but he immediately stopped and looked at the scene in front of him with a frightened look. The thing held a knight in armor with its huge teeth. Numerous hordes of skeletons crowded next to the creature. This monster was colossal in size, 
It looked like some unknown beetle. The monster furiously devoured everyone present with its gaze. The adventurers who came running at the call of help were hesitant to go on the attack against the unknown creature. Suddenly, the soldier, who was being held tightly in his teeth by a beetle, began to give signs of life. After a while, he cried out violently, asking his companions to save him. Hearing this, that monster tightened its grip, crushing the hapless adventurer. The fortress guards who saw this were shocked at the strength of this gigantic creature. After the monster swallowed the body of the adventurer it had killed, its gaze once again fell on the fortress guards. In the next instant, the giant let out a scream that could be heard throughout the city. Meanwhile, back at the base, Mill and Lyra were trying to get a response from Ark. They asked why a guy would just pick up and leave the village like that. The girls said they wouldn't leave here without an explanation. The protagonist made an awkward smile and tried to answer something. Immediately, however, he was attracted to a noise in the street that was not like the usual hum of city neighborhoods. Suddenly, an unknown voice from outside shouted that a huge crowd of monsters had appeared at the west gate. A man's voice shouted exasperatedly for all free adventurers to head west. Hearing the information, Ark turned around and told Ein that they were moving out immediately. The boy nodded his head and turned to the guests, telling them that they would have to leave by the west gate. Ark looked at the girls with a serious look and turned to them. The boy explained that he would now have to leave for a while, and he would later tell the reason why he had decided to leave the village. Looking at the distraught Mill and Lyra, the protagonist added that they could wait for them here. The boy then turned toward the exit and beckoned Ein to follow him. Now they had to prove themselves worthy on their first mission as Durham's new guild. Meanwhile, the guards looked at the creature in horror and didn't know what to do with it. The most baffling thing was how such a huge monster could appear right outside the gates of the city unnoticed. Those who took advantage of the information panel saw a frightening sight. This monster called Desolate Cursed had an incredible 210th level. Will was also fighting the skeletons in the front rows. The level 20 nomads were not a serious problem for him. Having roughly determined the nature of the actions of these monsters, the adventurer began to cut them down one by one with ease. However, even a serious level advantage wasn't that big of an argument, considering that there were a whole horde of skeletons. Will looked at the approaching monsters and ironically thought that some weaklings were trying to take him on in numbers. With that thought, the bulky man rushed into a new attack, and indeed all the skeletons shattered into small bones with the first blow. Will looked around the battlefield and asked one of the guards where Guiri was. The knight replied that he had already sent a messenger for him. The big guy cursed and said that if things continued like this, they would have to attack alone. No sooner had Will finished speaking than he realized that the monster was right up close to him. Turning around, the adventurer laughed nervously at the sight of approaching danger. However, then it was as if the space around the monster began to change. He felt that something unusual was approaching. A second later, the monster released several dozen blue orbs towards the defenders of the fortress. These strange objects turned into strips that began to wrap around the adventurers one by one. The defenders began to fall to the ground, screaming as their bodies felt numb. All those unlucky enough to be hit by the spell said they couldn't even move. The exhausted Will also fell to his knee. He realized that this attack had done absolutely no physical harm. Suddenly, he remembered the name of a similar spell. A desert curse could immobilize a person. This ability slowly kills the victim's body, starting with a simple numbness. This ability slowly kills the victim's body, starting with a simple numbness. However, in the case of the guards, it was not the spell itself that was most dangerous. With no ability to move in any way, even the most innocuous skeleton could prove fatal to them. One such monster was already swinging his sword to finish Will off. The big man couldn't move a muscle, and any resistance was impossible. But suddenly the bulky man was saved from death by Ark, who had suddenly appeared on the battlefield. The guy killed the skeleton with ease and flew past the captured guards and found himself right in front of the monster's face. After looking around at the monsters in front of him, the protagonist called out to Ayn. The green-haired adventurer, meanwhile, was tearing through the hordes of skeletons with ease. He asked his partner, What happened? The boy said it seemed like it was time to raise his own level. Ein confirmed Ark's speculation, saying that this time, given the circumstances, the guy might not hold back. After that, the protagonist pounced on the numerous skeleton squads with lightning speed. The monsters, before they even had time to realize what had happened, one by one shattered into tiny shards, literally reached level 250 within a few minutes. After that, Ein said that he was taking the remaining creatures over. He looked back through the flying bones at his partner and said he had his back to him. That was when Ark concentrated his aura and said he was starting the main course. Seeing that some human had slaughtered almost his entire horde, 
the monster screamed exhaustedly. After once again surveying the battlefield, the guy guessed that this monster had the ability to cast curses on adventurers. Examining the guards who appeared to be shackled by the cursed one's spells, the boy smiled and thought that it wouldn't happen to him. He then soared into the air, and once he was right above the monster's head, he said that this time, the monster would have to endure all the curses he had prepared for it. Confident of his victory, the boy grinned and ironically asked his opponent if he could handle his sword. Meanwhile, while the main battle was taking place near the western gate, Mr. Guirai headed towards the eastern gate. Many expected him to help deal with the desert curse that was making its way from the other side. However, the old man had other plans. Looking straight ahead, he remembered the messenger's report that the western gate was being attacked by hordes of monsters. However, Guirai trusted his intuition and decided to check the east gate as well this time since it was quite noisy. However, he never imagined he would encounter an identical problem in this part of town. Another monster army, similar in description to the one that attacked from the west, now came from the east as well. Seeing the man in front of him, the desolate cursed roared exhaustedly. This time, the levels of the opponents were about the same, so the chances of winning were relatively equal. Upon seeing Garay, the skeletons immediately pounced on him from all sides. In turn, Desolate Cursed began preparing the same attack to immobilize the man. Gire looked at the advancing monsters with a serious look. The old man had said that even if they fought against him alone, they could not expect to win easily. Nevertheless, he recognized that his opponent was definitely worthy of admiration. After that, Guiri spoke directly to the Cursed One and said that no matter what army he gathered, it wouldn't be enough to win. With a swing of his sword, the Supreme Adventurer used the legendary skill, Demonic Adventuring. Seeing that the opponent was about to launch an attack, Desolate Cursed directed several spherical spells towards the man. At the same moment, Guire pointed his blade at the monster and said that its life would be cut short in exactly five seconds. At the same time, Ark attacked the monster near the west gate. With a shout, he tried to split the monster's skull, but the monster managed to block the blow with one of his hands. After the first failed attempt, the guy moved some distance away. The protagonist then pounced on his foe once more, slicing off limb after limb. During one of the maneuvers, a group of skeletons tried to attack the boy in the back. Ark noticed this, however, and repelled the attack almost effortlessly. For a while, he had to switch back to killing skeletons. In the heat of battle, one of the smaller monsters once again attempted to plunge its blade into the back of the protagonist. However, their speed was now so incomparable that the boy simply grabbed the blade of the sword that the skeleton had used to try to cut his neck. He turned around and looked fiercely at the weak creature. Ark said that if this was all they could do, they didn't stand a chance. He then sliced the monster's neck without a second thought. The protagonist's level has increased a few more points due to new kills. Now he already possessed an incredible 290 levels. After that, the skeletons did not dare to attack him again. But Desolation Cursed was still reeling from the loss of his limbs. He came at Ark from behind again. The span of his paws was much larger than the boy had calculated. Now he had to dodge the enemy's attacks time after time. After buying some time, the desolate cursed prepared his spell for action. He shot several spheres towards Ark. The boy had seen how this spell had bound those knights, but he didn't know exactly how this ability worked. Seeing this situation, Ein shouted to his partner that there was no way you could show your face before these spheres. Meanwhile, the protagonist thrust his sword into the ground and said that there was no need to worry about him. At the same instant, a tremendous explosion shook the battlefield. Ark said with a smile that there was no way he was going to let those balls hit him. Meanwhile, Will came to his senses and saw someone fighting the monster. Suddenly he saw in this hero the very same scoundrel with whom he had fought in the square. However, this guy has now defeated such a complex creature with incredible ease. After many slashing wounds, the cursed one slumped to the ground. Making sure the monster didn't move, Ark moved closer to its head. The boy angrily asked the monster if he was satisfied with cursing many innocent people. After a short pause, he added that it wasn't that important, and regardless of his answer, the outcome would be the same. Swinging his sword, the guy calmly said that the Cursed One would die now, but suddenly the monster hissed sharply. Ark appeared shocked at this reincarnation, convinced that the thing would not rise again. After that, blue spheres began to emerge from the monster's body one after another. The boy looked at this strange sight in bewilderment and tried to understand if the Cursed One was still not dead. As if answering that question, the creature let out a few odd chuckles. After those strange sounds, all the spheres suddenly rushed towards Durham. The hero turned around and saw that a terrible thing was happening. Then he pulled out his blade and realized that once again he had let his guard down. With one swift blow, Ark blew the monster's head off. However, 
Even after the opponent was surely dead, the spheres were not lost. The spells were already outside the walls and rushing towards the people in the street. Meanwhile, those of the residents who had not yet left the street watched the approaching objects with interest. None of them had any idea what was going on. Seeing that there was a catastrophe, Ark realized that he could not prevent the consequences. At that same moment, the realization came to him that the original target of this monster was not the city walls or the guards, but the people. In the same second, dozens of glowing beams rushed towards the protagonist. A huge amount of energy streams instantly surged into the guy's body, raising his level to 500th. Afterward, Ayn ran up to the boy. He told his partner that things had taken a bad turn. The adventurer explained that the monster itself was actually not dangerous at all. A much bigger threat is the curse he casts. You can't get rid of that spell that easily. The victim of this ability reaches a slow and agonizing death. Because of the desolate curse's latest attack, most of the town's residents must have suffered from the curse. Ark asked his partner if there were those in the settlement who could break the spell. Ayn said that only high-level mages did it. The only people who can help with this curse are in the Sword of Salvation Guild. However, there are only three mages who can actually dispel this spell. This information shocked Ark. He didn't understand why there were only three people in such a large city who could fight this disease. Ayn said he personally knows the three wizards who are willing to help. At the same second, several people ran from the direction of the city gates. Two guys in light robes rushed to the guards lying on the ground, asking them how they were feeling. In the next instant, one of the mages threw a spell in the direction of an associate, asking him to bear with it a little longer. His comrade also ran up close to one of the defeated knights and tried to break the curse. The first mage turned around and called out to Mistress Mana. He said that the spell cast on the adventurers was quite serious, but they had a chance to save everyone. At the same time, the rapid footsteps of a third person were heard. A woman's voice demanded that the subordinates focus on supporting their fallen comrades. It was a young sorceress in a wide-brimmed hat. She shouted that she would not let anyone die today. The girl's name was Mina, and she was a high-level enchantress from the Sword of Salvation Guild. Ein tells the protagonist that these are the three wizards who will be able to deal with this curse. However, the victims of this contamination were becoming more and more numerous by the second. At this rate, there's no way to save everyone. Mena ran over to one of the guards lying on the ground and reached out to try to dispel the spell. A while later, however, she pulled back on her palm. Scratching her wrist, the girl realized she knew nothing about such a curse. Extending her arm forward once more, Mina realized that she would have a chance to dispel this spell sooner or later, but it would take too long. Moreover, she realized that it was not only her comrades who had suffered. Now, all the people of the town were in danger, and the young girl must save everyone. But in the same instant, Ark got into a more stable position and concentrated the energy around his chest. After that, a powerful beam of light struck Will, who was lying on the ground. From surprise, Mina jerked back, looking at the unknown apparition with astonishment. The protagonist evaluated the result of the work and realized that everything had worked out. If he stood out too much, he would not be able to avoid the madness rank adventurers. However, now Ark has a reason why he can't leave these people in the form, even if it turns out to be a great threat to himself. The guy paid 150 levels to obtain a new skill called Heavenly Favor. This spell allowed him to release a beam that removed curses of any complexity. After the guy asked his partner if he did the right thing, Ayn replied that the protagonist shouldn't even give it a second thought. After that, Ark regained a stable posture and, pointing his hand towards the knights, released a few rays. Streams of light passed through the bodies of the remaining guards, removing the aura that restrained their movements. A stunned Mina looked around and saw that the curse had been lifted from the remaining knights. She couldn't believe what had happened. The girl turned around and looked at the unknown adventurer and asked who he was. Ark turned away from the sorceress and said they could talk about it later. First of all, the curse that flooded Durham had to be addressed. The main character told Maine that they needed to save people now. He then asked the girl if she was coming with them. The enchantress jumped up from her seat and ran to the unknown adventurer, saying that they wouldn't leave without her. The girl shouted that she was one of the strongest wizards in the guild, and it was her duty to help the injured. After a while, the companions entered the city. They saw a horrifying sight. Numerous bodies of civilians lay motionless in the streets. The curse seemed to have consumed all the people within the walls. With a wave of his hand, Ark shouted that they didn't have much time left. Because of his mistake, many civilians suffered for nothing. Now it was the main character's responsibility to save each of them. Opening the panel, the boy sent a request to use the Heavenly Goods special skill. The Abyss Armor immediately activated the ability and said that the skill was ready to be used. 
At the same time, a bright flash of light erupted outside the city. Supreme Adventurer Giray finished killing the second monster, cutting the cursed one in half. Then the old man looked up and frowned at the shroud that covered the city. By then, the curse had already taken over all of Durham. The adventurer realized that the monster had no time to waste. That very second, Ark was already running swiftly through the city. At high speed, he scoped out the residents affected by the spell and shot beams of light at them. Moving swiftly through the wide streets, he cured one person after another. From the number of flashes, Durham's neighborhoods were covered in bright lights. Mina could barely keep up with the protagonist. She ran up to one of the freed residents and asked if he was okay. Through the pain, the boy mumbled something inaudible, but you could tell by the look on his face that he was clearly feeling better. The enchantress realized that this strange adventurer had completely erased all traces of the curse from the resident. Mina instantly marveled at the strength of the protagonist. Ain, who was nearby, shouted to the girl that even so, the number of victims who had fallen from the curse was still too high. Ark has picked up a good pace and will probably be able to save a lot of people. However, under no circumstances will he be able to rid every citizen of Durham of the curse. There will still be casualties. Meanwhile, Ark was speeding through the streets at breakneck speed, healing more and more injured residents. However, already at that moment, the realization came into his head that it was still too slow. For the current second, he had only managed to deal with a small part of the infestation. Without thinking long, the protagonist asked the Abyss Armor if there was a way to increase the range of the Heavenly Boon. The low voice mouthed that it would now try to perform a search for answer options. A while later, he said that the territory expansion skill could be used as an option to solve the problem. The boy asked what it meant. Armor replied that this ability can be acquired per level of the wielder. Territory expansion itself is not that useful, but it can enhance the effects of special skills. Then an information panel with the description of Seraphim's wings opened in front of the protagonist's eyes. This skill allows you to cast holy magic on the wielder's weapon, which is able to clear the area from the curse. Armor explained that after purchasing this ability on the bearer of the weapon will be applied in a special effect. The boy realized that it was about summoning the holy sword. Without a moment's thought, Ark reached out and sent another purchase request. After that, a blue sword appeared in his hand, using the holy magic seraphim wings. After getting his hands on the new weapon, the protagonist raised his blade to the sky and prepared to create a spell. Moments later, he sent a request to use the skill to clear the entire city of the curse. In the same second, a huge pillar of energy erupted from his body, rushing into the sky. Having reached a great height, the beam like a fountain scattered into many separate streams. After that, the energy rushed towards the city dwellers lying on the ground. The whole of Durham was filled with a bright shining light, marking the success of this idea. A short while later, Ain and Mana ran up to Ark. Stunned by what she saw, the girl grabbed her face with her hands and asked the guy what kind of magic was this. Surprised to see what was happening, she asked the protagonist, Is he really not a simple adventurer, but some kind of saint? The boy smiled and refuted her speculation. Then Ark turned around and said that he would do everything possible to save the ordinary citizens. But as it is, he is just an ordinary adventurer. The girl stood as if dumbfounded and did not reduce the surprised look from the main character. The boy then turned to Ayn and said he needed to consult with him. Suddenly, Ark said, he was probably quite a bit over the top. The boy was so filled with the idea of saving all the inhabitants from death that he completely forgot about the need to hide his power. If everyone knew that Ark had saved the city, adventurers of the madness rank would come here. After that, the protagonist clung to his partner's shoulders and said that he had to be rescued immediately. Ayn looked away and said it was something to think about. Suddenly, his attention shifted to Mina standing behind him. The girl asked, wondering if they wanted something from her. Ayn said that if they wanted to keep their conspiracy, they could pin all the exploits on her. A short while later, the streets of the city were filled with excited residents. In search of their savior, a huge crowd came to the headquarters of the Adventurer's Guild. Suddenly, the double doors swung open and Mina appeared on the threshold of the main entrance. The townspeople were momentarily silent and looked at the girl as if she were a deity. Suddenly, some man turned to the beauty and called her the lady who had saved Durham from a terrible curse. The crowd then shouted, calling Mina a divine heroine to whom the entire city owed its life. The girl was greatly embarrassed by what she saw and didn't know what to answer. Then she clammed up and, cocking her head upward, shouted that she'd had enough of these accolades. A short while later, when the general cheering had subsided, the sorceress returned to the hall of the guild headquarters. She walked up to Ark and said that she had laid out the version offered to the residents. 
Now the town thinks that unknown heroes defended the walls from monsters, and Mina saved people from the curse with the help of holy magic. Hearing this, the protagonist thanked the interlocutor. In the end, it turned out that Ark was not the hero who single-handedly saved the citizens of Durham from the curse. The idea of shifting some of the glory to Mina was pretty convincing. After all, she is one of the strongest mages in the guild, and it doesn't look too suspicious. The girl also said that she has yet to write a detailed report on what happened. Ark said that they would definitely help her with that. Afterwards, the guy apologized to Mina with some awkwardness in his voice for them taking on so much work. The girl smiled and said it was disproportionate to the fact that Ark had saved an entire city from destruction. She added that the protagonist can consider it as if she repaid him with this for saving the residents. Also, from now on, the boy can count on any help from Mina. That last sentence really puzzled Ark. Now he had another ally in the city. Ain looked at the former co-guild mate with a smile and noted that it seemed their organization was now more crowded because of the tales of the heroine who had saved the city. The girl frowned and asked the guy to stop calling her names like that. But Iowen was only amused by this, and with a thumbs up, he said that in the case of the title, everything was legitimate. After asking Mina what he meant, the guy explained that she was one of the best spellcasters of the Sword of Salvation Guild. So the title of Divine Heroine that saved the city from the desolate curse was now quite fitting for her. Now all she had to do was keep her head down and continue to believe the lie. From that moment on, the Divine Heroine gives the residents confidence that no matter what attack awaits them in the future, they will always be protected by someone like Ming. In turn, Ark is completely unsuited for such a role. So now it is Main who will be destined to play such a crucial role. The girl once again frowned and said it sounded too pathetic. Ark asked Ayn once again if he was sure that everything would work out. The green-haired man said, without a shadow of a doubt, that everything would go smoothly. He laughed and said that thanks to Ark's efforts, they would be able to make Mina a true living legend. The girl immediately tried to object, but Ian would not listen to her and grabbed her arm and pulled her along. After reaching some corner, the green-haired adventurer said that he wanted Ark to give the girl his powers. After asking us enchantresses why this was necessary, the protagonist explained that if they wanted to maintain her status as a divine heroine, it was necessary to pass on that very divinity to her. After some pause, the enchantress realized what was being talked about and agreed with the guys. She panicked a second later, however, and said it wasn't good at all. Mina didn't understand how Ark was going to give her that power. The protagonist cackled and said that he would have to shoot the girl. He immediately clarified that he was unlikely to do any damage to her body, so everything would be fine. Afterward, the guy said that if she didn't like that arrangement, they could drop such an idea. However, Mina pressed her lips together and said that she agreed, reminding her that she had said herself that she could be relied upon. After that, the girl shouted out that since Ark had saved people's lives before her eyes, she had full confidence in his decision. The boy moved closer to the face of his interlocutor and asked again if she was sure. After an affirmative nod from the sorceress, the protagonist moved some distance away and thanked Mana for her assistance. Then he swung around with all his might and said that he would have to unrestrain himself. Before she knew it, a beam of bright light scorched her face. Pulling out the holy sword, Ark used the Wings of Seraphim ability. A short while later, Mina once again appeared in front of the public, flying through the air. The people willingly believed that it was the same divine heroine. Looking at this absurdity, Ayn laughed and told his partner that he could have avoided twirling the girl in the air so much. For his part, the protagonist said that he himself would not want to do so, but he still has a hard time controlling that sword. After that, Ark looked seriously at the green-haired adventurer and said that a thought had crossed his mind. The guy said that he thought Ayn was the only person enjoying the whole absurd situation. The partner replied that it was entirely possible. Looking through the doorway at the joyous citizens of Durham, Ark thought that he had still stood out too much today and should be more careful next time. Suddenly, Mr. Girai appeared out of nowhere, right in front of the partner's faces. He looked at them sternly and asked if he was interrupting them. The boys looked at the old man confusedly, not knowing what to say to him. In the next second, the Supreme Adventurer of the Sword of Salvation Guild invited Ark to step aside and discuss something. The protagonist smiled and wryly asked what exactly the old man wanted to discuss with him. After that, Mr. Girai once again looked at the guy menacingly and said that he shouldn't make an idiot of himself. Turning around and heading for the exit, the Supreme Adventurer said that he knew who the hero who saved Durham really was. Ark immediately rose from his seat and realized that the old man was already aware of everything. Mr. Girai looked seriously toward the street. Looking at the subordinate dangling in the air, he said he wasn't going to judge the guy's methods. 
In any event, the role of the ideal hero always needs someone who is familiar to most residents. However, the Supreme Adventurer noticed that there was some miscalculation in this plan. The main problem was that the other adventurers who were fighting near the Western Gate had seen Ark and Eain. Moreover, it wasn't only the fighters from the Sword of Salvation Guild who participated in that battle. Ain was surprised that the old man cared about such things and said that he wouldn't have thought that Mr. Girai would want to talk to them personally over such a trifle. The Supreme Adventurer said that he didn't want to discuss the topic at first. He didn't care how many people saw Ark in action, and he wasn't going to reprimand anyone for it. A flustered Ayn asked, What subject then did the old man want to talk to them about? Mr. Guirai asked in a mysterious voice, if the boys were aware of what was going on at the same time near the East Gate? The two partners did not say a word, but only looked questioningly at their interlocutor. The old man lowered his head and muttered that it was no surprise that they were out of the loop. He explained that the incident with the Eastern Gate was quickly hushed up as there were only adventurers of the Sword Salvation Guild there. Yane excitedly asked what had happened there after all. The old man reminded him that a whole horde of cursed monsters had gathered at the Western Gate. At the same time, however, a similar army was waiting east of the city. Mr. Geary explained that judging from the nature of the attack, this attack was carefully planned. A surprised Ark immediately asked if anyone was hurt near the East Gate. The old man noted that he had single-handedly destroyed the entire horde, and none of the monsters had managed to harm anyone. The protagonist once again made sure that the supreme adventurer of one of the largest guilds was not so simple. While everyone was dealing with the problems in the West, he found time to check the other entrance. Suddenly, Mr. Girai tore the boy away from his musings and said that they had a bigger problem now. He once again noted that the attack was organized simultaneously from two sides. According to a well-known fact, monsters are not capable of thinking enough to organize such an attack. Therefore, there is a high probability that this attack was organized by a human. Even the thought that something like this could have been pulled off by someone other than a monster made Ark cringe. Ain confirmed his former master's speculation, saying that a great deal about this attack did not add up to the obvious facts. The guy noted that he had been living in Durham for years, but in all that time he had not immediately encountered monsters like this. Besides, after the battle, he asked some of the adventurers if they had ever seen such creatures. But none of them had ever encountered anything like it. Ark asked his partner if it was really that unusual. Ayn replied that at least such monsters did not live here. It's hard not to encounter such a huge creature, given its abilities and hostility. So it's strange that the monster would appear so suddenly near the city. After saying that, Girai-san summed up his thoughts by saying that according to his assumption, someone had summoned these monsters. Ark stared at the old man in surprise. Then he asked, How is that possible? The supreme adventurer said that if one had a special skill or magic, he could very well summon an army of such monsters. Hearing this, Ark realized that someone really wanted to destroy Durham. Mr. Girai immediately clenched his fist and said that as long as such a threat was present, they needed to strengthen the city's defenses. Then the old man said that was exactly what he wanted to talk to the boys about. Suddenly, the supreme adventurer muttered that he wanted Ark to establish his guild as soon as possible. Then they would be able to fight equally, side by side, alongside the Sword of Salvation. Ian immediately explained frustratedly that they couldn't officially register as a guild yet, as there was still a lot of paperwork to be filled out and a lot of bureaucratic work to be done, and there was no way to speed up this process. Suddenly, Mr. Girai said he could help with this by making arrangements with the central office. In return, the old man wanted Ark to promise him two things. For starters, the leader of the Sword of Salvation wanted the protagonist to maintain a cooperative relationship between their guilds. Secondly, Mr. Girai wanted to personally evaluate the boy's skills in practice combat to see if he was competent. Showing Ark two fingers, he asked if the guy could handle the demands. The protagonist replied without hesitation that it was the easiest thing for him to do. After the old man replied that it was a great attitude, the fighters moved to the training ground in the central council building of the Adventurer Guild. Looking at Ark, the supreme adventurer said that he was willing to let his opponent use any weapon in violation of the rules. He then pulled out his sword and said it was all to see the guy's true strength and show his own at the same time. It should be a fight with real weapons, with the use of one's abilities and a determination to win. After saying that, Mr. Girai strengthened his aura, and sparks flew from his body in different directions. Then he looked fiercely at his opponent, and said that he was obliged to show all that he could do. After saying those words, Ark also strengthened his aura, and seriously looked into the old man's eyes. The guy got ready to fight, and said he understood everything perfectly. Standing between the two opponents, Ayn raised his hands and said that the fight would begin after his signal. 
The green-haired man waited for a pause for a while, and there was silence in the room. Then the boy waved his hands and said it was okay to start. A moment after these words, Mr. Girai was instantly flanked by Ark. The protagonist was almost caught off guard by such speed. He dodged the stabbing blow at the last moment, and the old man shouted that he hoped the boy would survive the battle against his weapon. At the beginning of the battle, the supreme adventurer of the Sword of Salvation took the initiative. By that point, Ark had wasted almost all of his special skill points and had only level 100. In turn, Gurai had twice the score. Therefore, he had a great advantage at the stage of getting used to his opponent. Standing in a defensive posture, Ark thought that this idea of sparring was doomed to failure from the beginning. He could not defeat the old man with such a difference in level. Furthermore, judging by the look in his eyes, Girai-san also understood this. In this case, the main task of the protagonist was not to defeat the enemy, but to show all that he is capable of. To this thought, the guy strengthened his aura once again. If the old man wanted to see his true abilities, he should definitely demonstrate them. After that, the boy rushed at great speed to counterattack his opponent. Mr. Girai parried the first blow with indescribable ease. This block was so strong that Ark's sword flew out of his hands in the same second and flew behind his back. The guy jumped back, but still didn't get out of the fight. He reacted quickly and summoned Seraphim's sword, which struck Yuresan very hard. After that, Ark decided not to stop there and tried to attack his opponent again. Meanwhile, it was as if the old man had no intention of advancing and was only stepping aside, watching the swift blows to nowhere. At one point, he cleverly caught the protagonist in a mistake and once again with a powerful blow, knocked the second sword out of his hands. However, this did not stop Ark, and on the contrary, it only fueled him. Suddenly, he pulled out a sharp object out of nowhere and swooped down on Mr. Garai once again in a swift attack. The surprised old man saw that it was the most ordinary dagger. Ark swung it around at breakneck speed, but still couldn't hit his opponent. The blade allowed him to strike more swiftly. But time after time, Garai dodged those attacks with incredible speed. Seeing that there was no use in his attempts to get a hit, the boy threw the dagger at the old man. Girei didn't understand what the strange gesture was about and easily knocked back the object flying at him. However, he then looked in front of him and did not see the protagonist. In the meantime, the boy had managed to use this one moment to his advantage. Girei sensed danger approaching and looked up. In the same second, Ark spiraled downward with incredible speed and thrust his sword into the ground. With one punch, the guy turned the gym floor into rubble. Ain, taking cover from the debris flying at him, thought these two were incredible, and yet his partner amazed him more and more. Despite the obvious difference in levels, Ark's combat skills as an adventurer have certainly improved. Meanwhile, the boy raised his head and looked straight in front of him, trying to catch his breath. There was only a large cloud of dust and smoke in front of him. The boy thought that this was the maximum he could show now. Suddenly, a human silhouette appeared in the smoke. It was Mr. Girai. With a slight stagger, he got to his feet and exhaled heavily. Then, the old man suddenly laughed at the top of his voice. He looked at Ark with a crazed look and shouted that if it wasn't for their difference in levels, he would definitely die from such a direct hit right now. Such an abrupt return of the old man to the ranks surprised the lad greatly. Goraeus muttered that he had no doubts about Ark's fighting ability. Guy thanked his opponent and tried to say something as well. However, the old man drew his sword again at the same moment and stood in a fighting stance and said that they would now proceed to the next part of the battle. Glaring, he asked the boy how he was going to defend himself against the next attack. The protagonist found himself confused. It seemed to him that Mr. Garai was not joking at all. The boy looked at the old man questioningly and didn't understand why he was so murderous. Meanwhile, Ayn, who had known Mr. Gire for not the first year, realized what his former master wanted to use. In the same instant, the ground beneath the supreme adventurer's feet shook and his aura took on an incredibly powerful form. The old man decided to use the legendary skill Demonic Adventuring. Suddenly, he shouted to his opponent that this was a fight to the death. He then notified Ark that if he didn't stop him, his life would be cut short in exactly 15 seconds. The protagonist also got into a fighting stance. He understood what skill Girai-san was going to use, but he didn't know how powerful it was. Suddenly, Ein shouted to his partner that he should be very careful. The adventurer explained that this current 15-second skill doubled the wielder's level. After this information, Ark looked at Girei-san fearfully. The old man now had an incredible 400th level within a short period of time. The supreme adventurer smiled and gritted his teeth in a voice that made his blood rush. In the next instant, he pounced on the protagonist with great speed, saying that it had been a long time since he had fought people equal to his strength. 
The old man shouted that this fight was originally meant to test the boy's abilities. But now he offered Ark a good laugh for the next 15 seconds. Gire looked into his opponent's startled eyes and said that the guy met all his expectations and more. The supreme adventurer shouted that a demon had been sleeping inside him all this time, waiting for a worthy opponent. And now there was no stopping him. With these words, Girai struck a blow. After the first attack, the protagonist realized that it was going to be a very long 15 seconds. Throwing his opponent aside, the old man pounced on the guy again. With the next blow, he punched through the wall of the building and threw Ark's gutless body out into the street. Meanwhile, many gawkers were watching in horror, including Mina. Gyre looked at the boy's body flying aside. He said there were only 10 seconds left and asked if Ark could withstand all the attacks of his inner demon. After that, the old man rushed after the protagonist with incredible speed. Meanwhile, Ark's eyes began to double over. His body weakened and the boy wondered if he had lost. The maddened Gurai was approaching the guy with incredible speed. The protagonist began to lose consciousness. Seven seconds before the demonic advent ended, two familiar voices suddenly called out to Ark from below. The boy looked around out of the corner of his eye and saw Mill and Lyra standing nearby. Suddenly, he remembered that these two had suddenly shown up at his guild and pounced with a ton of questions. Then another female voice, clearly belonging to Maine, called out to the boy. The protagonist remembered saying goodbye to her after he met Mr. Gire. It was then that Ark slowly began to come to his senses. He remembered that he wanted to start a guild to protect the city and the people he cared about. Four seconds before the demonic advent ended, the boy opened his eyes and looked at his opponent. The old man was already on the approach, and any blow he threw could prove to be the final one. Geary's speed was clearly faster, and Ark needed to come up with a plan of action. Suddenly, the supreme adventurer swung his sword, saying that the demon within him was rejoicing. He was overjoyed, for he had only fought truly strong opponents, and that was a long time ago. The old man said that for many years, he had not shown his true appearance to another person. He then swung his sword and created a dark demonic flash, while simultaneously shouting that unfortunately, all good things would soon come to an end. Unexpectedly to Jiraeus, Ark threw back one of his blades as the matter approached. At the sight of this, the old man became wary. He didn't understand what this guy wanted to accomplish by such a move. After that, the boy crossed his arms on his chest and said that he acknowledged that he still had a long way to go before Gyurei-san's prowess and that he had lost this battle. But then Ark suddenly shouted out that he was sure to survive. Crossing his arms in front of his face, the protagonist ordered the holy weapon to explode. After these words, an explosion occurred right between the boy's body and the old man's blade. The guy had survived the dark demonic flash, however. His body rushed into the ground at a tremendous speed. In the next second, Ark, like a meteorite, smashed through the road masonry. Through force, he ordered his armor to recover the sword Seraphim Wings and find the necessary skill that would allow another weapon in his hand. A male voice announced to the hero that in this situation it was necessary to use level transformation, and the enemy's stats were too high, so it was recommended to retreat. However, the boy interrupted the armor, saying that he understood everything. But he can't just run away like a weakling, and in order to fight on, he needs new swords. After that, the armor offered the main character the skills Weapon Restoration and Weapon Repair, which together cost 90 levels. The guy immediately agreed. In the next second, two swords appeared in Ark's hands at once. He then looked menacingly toward Jureus and said that he was ready to cool the demon's ardor with his deadly blades. However, after these words, the boy's mind immediately went blank. In his mind, the protagonist tried to set himself up to believe that if he held on a little longer, he would win this fight. But suddenly, his body began to weaken a lot. At last, the boy said that he could still fight. After saying that, he fell to the ground without memory. At that moment, Master Girai had already approached the helpless boy. The old man saw that his completely exhausted opponent had lost consciousness. The supreme adventurer took a deep breath and said it was time for the boy to rest, especially since those same unfortunate 15 seconds had already come to an end. A short while later, Ark woke up abruptly. Staring fearfully straight in front of him, he jumped up on the bed and shouted again that he could still fight. After a few seconds, the realization came to the protagonist that he was already at the guild's base. The boy looked to the side and saw Lyra sitting next to him. She said that she and M.I.L. were shopping for groceries for dinner and saw Ark falling from the top tower. Then the girls were very scared for him. Lyra asked the protagonist how he was feeling. Immediately, the boy realized what the two were doing there at that moment. Suddenly, Mill ran up to the bed and said with a smile that they were worried about him. The girl was surprised that Ark had been beaten up pretty good this time. 
Mena, who was standing nearby, crossed her arms over her chest and said that the guild headquarters tower had been damaged because of the fight with Gyurei San. Looking at the gathered acquaintances, the protagonist apologized to everyone for making them worry. Then he pulled himself up and sat on the edge of the bed. The boy was still wondering if he had passed the test. Suddenly, Mr. Girai entered the room. He told the boy that he had successfully passed the test. The protagonist looked at his opponent in surprise. The old man said that 15 seconds had already passed before Ark lost consciousness. The supreme adventurer crossed his arms over his chest and added that he had put all his skill and determination into this short period of time. In addition, Ark was the first of his opponents to survive those 15 seconds with only minor injuries. The main character clenched his fists with happiness and shouted that it was great. Aang suddenly appeared behind the old man. He reminded Mr. Geary that he seemed to have something else to say to Ark. After saying this, the old man became nervous and lowering his eyes to the floor said that it was so. Mr. Girai bowed to his opponent. He admitted that he had acted very immaturely by using his legendary skill in sparring. Because emotions had taken over reason, an innocent adventurer had suffered because of him. Meanwhile, Ayn continued to press the former master. He recalled that the old man had said that he had wanted to defend the city with Ark, but instead had almost killed him. The boy explained that perhaps Gire needed more remorse for what he had done. The green-haired man told the supreme adventurer to apologize properly. After that, the old man apologized again. Then he straightened up and said that Ark had passed the first part of the test. Once the boy is rested, he can begin the second part of the task. The protagonist said that he remembered that he had to clear one of the dungeons next. The old man confirmed this by saying that there were ruins east of Durham in the desert. Those adventurers who had stumbled upon this place before had nicknamed this dungeon the Old Witch's Workshop. Gairi explained that a powerful sorceress used to dine in these ruins, but after her death, the place was flooded with monsters. After listening to a brief tour of the history of the dungeon, Ark asked what kind of monsters dwell there. The old man hesitated for a few seconds and then said that no one knew that. The protagonist was greatly surprised by this answer and asked what it meant. Suddenly, Mina answered the question, saying that in the past few years, unusual magical anomalies had been appearing from the workshop. Because of this, the monsters in the immediate vicinity had recently become much more aggressive. Many merchants who were on their way to Durham were attacked by them. Gurai then said that they still hadn't figured out the source of these anomalies. The only thing they realized was that the source of this phenomenon was a monster that was lodged in the ruins. Guild mages and researchers have concluded that the approximate level of this creature is 300 units. Ark clarified that it was slightly higher than the similarly rated Desolate Damned. The old man also explained that the ruins themselves were a great danger. None of the adventurers had yet reached their depths. However, Mr. Geary is confident that since Ark has handled the first part of his ordeal, he will handle the second part as well. At the end of the story, the old man formulated the final version of the assignment. The protagonist needs to explore the ruins of the old witch's workshop and destroy the monster that causes magical anomalies. The supreme adventurer then asked his interlocutor if he accepted the challenge. Ark replied that he was ready for anything. At the same time, a pendulum was slowly swinging in the depths of the cave. In the middle of the large library sat a tall creature in old robes. Most of his body was made up of various gears and mechanisms. The unknown man looked down with a calm gaze and occasionally made strange noises. Then the monster threw his head back sharply and muttered that once again some brats wanted to break into his chambers. His eyes immediately began to fill with an unnatural demonic light. Suddenly, the creature's face twisted into a grimace of rage, and he shouted repeatedly that he would kill all these lowlifes. Meanwhile, Ark had reached the desert east of Durham. Stopping near a seemingly unassuming cave, the guy said that here they were. Along with the protagonist, Ayn and Mana went on this trek. After walking a few meters, the traveler saw a stone corridor filled with bones. This was the entrance to the Old Witch's Workshop dungeon. Entering the first corridors, Ark began searching the corpses. He then turned to his partner and asked if she was sure she really wanted to enter this dungeon with them. To the huge surprise of the whole team, Mill was asked to hike with the boys in Durham. Answering the leader's question, the girl smiled and replied that she was 100% sure of her decision. Before coming here, Mill had obtained a novice adventurer's license from the central office. She was now a level 10 adventurer. Suddenly, the girl said that she already knew why Ark had decided to leave their village. While the main character was out, Ayn told them the whole story. Mill turned to her partner and said he was an incredibly kind man. She was surprised that Ark had decided to leave the village for a reason, 
but not to harm the villagers. The girl said she already wants to become as strong as the main character, so from now on, she wants to continue wandering with Ark. These words touched the soul of the young adventurer. The boy thought that without wanting to, he had become an example even for girls. Still, he was very worried about the girl. He explained that the old witch's workshop would be a very dangerous place to start traveling, especially since Mill was only level 10. The girl was very much startled by his confident tone, but then she shouted and said that Ark had level 10 too, after all. The protagonist tried to explain why he was doing this. However, Mill interrupted him and said that she had already found out from the central office that he had an epic skill. The girl explained that unlike the guy, she wouldn't gain a level if she didn't get into difficult battles, so she is willing to take such risks for the sake of power. After hearing this, the boy said that it was still somehow unreasonable. Also, Mill added that besides, she knows that Ark will always protect her in any case. After listening to these contradictory arguments, the protagonist thought that there was nothing to be done. Suddenly standing to the side, Ayn called out to the interlocutors and asked if they were ready to move out. Ark looked at his partner and, responding positively, said it was time for them to go. After these words, the team of adventurers advanced into the depths of the old witch's workshop. After a while, they were greeted by a section of the dungeon called the First Floor. There were also many remains here, both human and unknown. Mina, who possessed the 120th level, said that a huge amount of magical energy could be felt here, and it was definitely an unusual ruin. Having similar stats, Ayn added that before the source of this strange aura appears, it is necessary to pump Ark to the max. The protagonist, who was at level 10, agreed with his partners, saying that he wouldn't be able to defeat a level 300 monster so easily with his current performance. Annoyed Ayn then thought it would be a good idea to pump their leader before even coming here. However, after the battle with the desolate curses, the remaining monsters suddenly hid in their dens and caves. Suddenly, the rumble of the heaviest impact on the ground sounded right in front of the travelers. It was a creature called the Iron Warrior. It possessed two hammers and level 50. Upon seeing the first opponent, Ark was surprised at how interesting the monsters here were. In any case, this one was perfect for his training. It was then that Ian explained Maine's tactics. They would have to weaken this guy for the group leader to give him the final blow. Suddenly, the robot pounced on the uninvited guests. Taking a quick leap, he slammed into the ground in front of the heroes with both hands. Seeing that the creature remained vulnerable for a while, Ark called out to his partners. Ayn smiled and said that the protagonist shouldn't be nervous. The adventurer then cut off the monster's arm with a single blow, saying that they would not be ceremonious with such opponents. At the same moment, Mina jumped up and began to create a rune. After that, she shot the monster several times, shouting that they wouldn't let Ark get hurt. After another attack, the Iron Warrior lost his second limb. Due to so many attacks, the creature was completely disoriented. Seeing this, Ayn shouted to the protagonist that it was a good time to attack. Hearing the command, Ark pounced on the helpless opponent. The protagonist was rapidly approaching his target. There were only a few jumps left to cut off the head of this monster. Suddenly, the Iron Warrior lowered his head. For a second, it seemed as if he had accepted his defeat. But suddenly, his head transformed into a huge hammer. Ark panicked when he saw this, but it was too late to delay. The monster suddenly snapped out of his seat and started running towards the protagonist. The boy realized that at this rate, he would be crushed. A stunned Mill stood back, realizing that Ark was in trouble. Eager to help her friend, the girl snatched up the dagger. She then shouted that she would protect the protagonist with her epic skill. Her eyes sparkled, and Mill used the Thunder Flash skill. After that, the girl was instantly by Ark's side. Hoping to get ahead of her opponent, she took a leap and flew into the monster's hammer like lightning. The protagonist shouted his partner's name in a panic. He didn't want her to get into the fight under any circumstances. The girl concentrated all her energy in one point and tried to hit the monster. To his great surprise, the Iron Warrior stopped. However, he then slammed his head on the ground and Mill flew backwards. Ark ran up to his friend and caught her just in time. Despite not honoring the request, the boy thanked the girl for saving his life. A satisfied Mill looked into her partner's eyes and smiled. The protagonist then snatched the sword again and mouthed that the monster had decided to transform at the last moment. This was expected from a mechanical witch puppet. After that, the soulless monster flashed its eye again and swung around for another strike. In the next second, it attacked the boy, but the boy successfully dodged it. After that, Ark, coming in from the flank, kicked the monster in the leg. The Iron Warrior flew into the air, and the protagonist managed to inflict several slashing wounds on it. Then, he ironically asked the soulless machine if he really hoped to win with such a huge head. 
However, the guy noted that all of his sword strikes were completely useless. It was probably because of the big difference in levels. Then there was also the serious question of how the protagonist could defeat this creature. Suddenly, Mina called out to her partner and reminded him that it was only a mechanical puppet. She explained that such creatures must surely have a core lurking beneath the metallic hull. After that, the main character asked the logical question of how they could get to the monster's heart. At the same moment, Ayn grinned and said that the solution was simple, and they would destroy the hull by force. It was then that the green-haired man shouted to the Iron Warrior to attack him already. However, the monster, once again jumping up from the ground, once again targeted the protagonist. But no sooner had the bulky man slammed his head into the ground than a fireball flew into him. Mina shouted to Ayn that he could take it easy and she would cover for him. At the same moment, while the monster was out, the green-haired adventurer ran up and hooked his hands into its body. The boy strained hard, trying to break the unyielding hull. In the next instant, chunks of armor and steel flew apart, exposing wires and machinery. In the center of the Iron Warrior's chest, just as Mana had suspected, was a cannonball. It was then that Ayn shouted to Ark that it was a good time to attack while the monster was still disoriented. Hearing this, the boy snapped out of his seat and lunged at the defenseless monster. With one great leap, he reached his opponent and thrust his blade into his core. After that, the Iron Warrior instantly blacked out and fell to the ground. Then, several dozen streams of energy flowed from its remains towards the protagonist. When Ark got level 60, he happily thought that if he could defeat a few more of these puppets, he could regain his previous stats. Mina stepped closer and reminded her partner not to forget that these were only golems, and their weak point was the magical core. Ayn explained that thanks to this peculiar heart, these creatures do not obey their master and can function. Without this important element, they are just mindless puppets. The guy also said that not being able to think for themselves makes them easier opponents. After listening to his partners, Ark replied that he understood everything perfectly. Then Mill, who was standing behind her, pointed her finger to the side and warned that two more iron warriors were advancing from there. These monsters were also 50th levels by these monsters. This time, the protagonist looked at his opponents with more confidence. Now, with the increased level, he could handle them alone. With that thought, Ark pounced on the next opponents. At breakneck speed, the guy grabbed the neck of the monster closest to him. Swinging around, he hurled the huge metal body towards the second creature with all his might. The robots flew backwards helplessly, unable to stand on their feet. Plus, the nearest creature already had its shell hiding its core cracked. Seeing this, Ark pulled out and prepared his dagger to attack. He then jumped on the first doll at incredible speed and swung his arm. A second later, the first enemy was defeated, and the protagonist's level increased by 50 points. However, the second robot had already risen and swung for his attack. Ark didn't budge, and summoned the additional sword Seraphim Wings to block. Staring contentedly at the soulless monster, the guy muttered through his teeth that this trick wouldn't work on him a second time. The protagonist then swung away from the monster, who immediately almost lost his balance. Immediately, he saw that his opponent had exposed his weak areas, and with one blow, he cut the monster in half. Thus, in a fairly short period of time, Ark had reached the 160th level. The boy looked seriously at his partners and tried to tell them that he had finally upgraded. But suddenly, a frightening aura made the protagonist shudder. After that, several shots were heard at once. When he turned around, Ark saw several fireballs coming toward them. Suddenly, Mina jumped up to the guy and covered him from this attack. The hero thanked the girl but the girl said it was too early to relax and turned his attention in that direction. At the other end of the cave, several robots of a different class came out at once to intercept the uninvited guests. The hands of these creatures had been replaced with energy cannons. Suddenly, an inhuman voice thundered the detection of the threat and ordered the intruders to be eliminated immediately. According to the system, these creatures were called Iron Arrows and were of a similar level 50. In response to the hail of gunfire, Mina managed to create a magical shield that protected all of her partners. The girl immediately complained that although their level is quite low, due to the magic anomaly in this place, these creatures are stronger than they should be. Meanwhile, the monsters continued shooting without stopping. Another non-human voice sent a message requesting reinforcements. The response ordered the threat to be dealt with immediately. The ironclads were then ordered not to let the intruders get away alive. Under the incessant gunfire, Ayn pointed to one of the corridors and suggested running that way. The group of adventurers immediately scrambled out of their seats and rushed to safety. Running became much easier once the travelers were out of the line of fire. The hardest was Mill, who was not at all used to the pace at which adventurers fight. The girl gradually began to run out of steam, and the protagonist immediately noticed it. 
Meanwhile, the Iron Arrows rushed after the fugitives into the same corridor. Ark instantly covered Mill with himself and ordered his partner to run faster after the others. Looking around periodically, the girl left the boy and ran after the rest of the group. After that, the protagonist once again summoned the Seraphim Wings Blade and prepared to take the fight. The robot ahead of the others opened hurricane fire on the boy. The guy was successfully fending off these shots. And then the Iron Gunman started firing in different directions without laying down any logic in his actions. Fighting back became more difficult. But even so, his bullets didn't catch up with Ark. After the boy approached his opponent at breakneck speed, he landed several precise blows and destroyed the soulless machine. After raising his level, the protagonist looked at the remaining opponents and said that if they thought they could crush him in numbers, they were very wrong about that. A thunderous silence hung in the hallway for a while. Suddenly, the car head of the main group shuddered with its whole body. In the next second, the plate that covered his stomach moved out, and a huge cannon appeared in its place. Even though Ark had encountered surprises from robots before, at the moment he was once again caught off guard. Cannon began to concentrate the magic into one point. Already a few seconds later, the light from that robot filled the entire hallway. A few more moments passed, after which the robot fired a powerful shot. A huge jet of fire swept past Ark, who managed to maneuver away just in time. Jumping into an opening nearby, the guy found himself covered from the shrapnel flying at him. But then another powerful explosion was heard in the corridor, after which the wall behind which the protagonist was hiding cracked. The guy ran out from behind cover and right in front of him, he saw a huge barrage of fire flash. It was then that he realized it would be plain suicide to stay here. He turned around and ran with all his might toward the exit. Meanwhile, the rest of the group stood quietly near the double doors leading into some sort of hall. Suddenly, there was a confused cry from behind, and Ion turned around. A panting arc said that now was not the time to stand, and they should run as fast as possible. He explained that the gunmen were on their way and needed to hurry so they wouldn't be caught up. Ain, without turning to his partner, replied that they would love to escape from here. But there was a problem. There was no second exit in the room that this random corridor led into. Annoyed, Ark looked around the circular room in panic and shouted in rage that this simply couldn't be happening. The next instant, a clicking sound was heard, emitted by the Iron Gunner's cannon. Mena, hearing this, immediately turned around abruptly. It was the same second that shots fell on the heroes from behind. The girl had time to warn her partners and create a shield. By now, a huge horde of monsters had already piled up near the entrance. The heroes slowly began to retreat into the depths of the room, letting the iron shooters in. There was complete confusion in the team about what to do next. Despite the ever-increasing number of monsters arriving, Mina was still successfully holding back the shield. However, the pressure was getting stronger and stronger, and the girl gradually began to lose her balance. At the same moment, some of the gunners began to load the stronger gun. A second later, the first of them fired a shot at the magic shield. Startled, the girl screamed and recoiled backward. She shouted to her partner that if nothing was changed, she would no longer be able to contain the shield. Out of desperation, Ark shouted out that maybe he could get something done. However, Ain immediately stopped him, saying that even though he had a large level, there were too many of them. In addition, they are seriously strengthened because of the magical anomaly, and it will definitely not be possible to defeat them alone. But suddenly the protagonist stepped on one of the bricks, which immediately broke through and lit up with purple fire. In the same second, the entire group of adventurers was completely enveloped by a purple glow. Ark looked up at the ceiling and saw several dozen pentagrams. Even Mana, who was familiar with magic, didn't understand what was going on. Then each of the pentagrams suddenly shot to the floor, and the girl realized it was teleportation. The very next instant, however, the floor beneath the adventurer's feet broke through. Screaming frantically, Ark and his partners began to fall into the dark abyss. Flying down the endless corridor, the protagonist couldn't understand why the floor collapsed on its own. He was sure almost certainly that this was all a setup by someone, and if so, they would walk right into a trap. But suddenly, right behind his back, the inhuman voice was heard again, ordering him to pursue the intruders. Turning around, Ark suddenly found that several robots had also fallen into this breach. Because the monsters jumped almost immediately, they almost caught up to the protagonist. The closest of the iron shooters tried to attack the guy in close combat, but the guy managed to block the blow. Ark then swung his sword and knocked the creature back into the wall. However, almost immediately, the second monster opened fire with a cannon. The protagonist took a closer look and saw that almost all of the iron arrows had stopped trying to attack in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was almost impossible to dodge the lasers of the three remaining monsters in such a place. Suddenly, Ayn called out to his partner and shouted for him to hold out his hand. 
Ark looked at the guy, not understanding what he wanted to pull. At the same moment, Ian asked Mina to push him upwards with wind magic. The girl first looked at her partner with an incomprehensible look. However, she then simply prepared a spell and said that he had asked for it. A second later, Mina created a huge ball of air and shot it at her partner. A moment later, the spell hit Ain's body at a tremendous speed. The guy was immediately thrown upwards in the direction of the protagonist. In flight, Ayn managed to grab Ark's arm tightly. Then he swung around and tossed his partner upward with all his might. Rushing towards the iron shooters, the guy realized that this might be their only chance. With his first blow, he sliced the nearest robot in half. But at the same time, the other two had already flown down. Ark rushed after them. The iron arrows returned fire. However, no laser ever hit, and the protagonist realized that this round was left to him. One of the monsters attempted to charge a more powerful gun to try and turn the tide of battle. But within a second, they were both cut off by two synchronized blows. After that, a tremendous explosion was heard behind Ark's back. The boy followed the flash with a look, unable to believe he was still alive. At the same moment, several dozen rays rushed into the center of his chest. The Abyss Armor announced that it was absorbing experience and increasing its level to 360. Then the protagonist thought that if he continued to level up like this, he would definitely be able to defeat the one who had brought the Cursed Ones to Durham. Nevertheless, to bring the general cheering down to nothing, M.I.L. swept up to see that they were still falling. Mana looked at her partner and told her that she needn't worry, and she would get them out of here now. At the bottom of the well into which the adventurers fell was a room that looked like a small library. With air magic, Mina helped the remaining companions descend without injury. She noted that magic could often save an adventurer's life. After these words, there was once again a violent explosion behind their backs. Turning around, the traveler saw a figure in a cloud of dust. Ark explained that his level had increased a great deal. He said that for the first time, he would have to get used to controlling his power to its fullest extent. Exhaling, Ayn said that at least now they wouldn't have to worry about pumping the main character. Looking around, Mill suddenly wondered what this place was. It was dark and dusty. Suddenly, the candles around the perimeter of the room lit up after those words. Suddenly, the adventurers felt a powerful aura opposite them. Scattered all around the room were parts from those robots that had attacked them earlier. The eyes of the adventurers, however, were directed toward the creature that ceaselessly called them intruders. It was a tall monster sitting on a metal chair. The unknown was considering how she would finish off the uninvited guests. Suddenly, the monster stood up to his full height and spoke heavily he would let the intruders get away alive. Judging from the expression on her face, it was an elderly woman who looked like a witch. However, upon getting closer, Ark saw the six not spinning on its chest. After that, the guy asked his partners, Is it really a mechanical doll too? Ain decided to watch the dashboard to find out more accurately. What he saw, however, threw him into utter horror. The guy shouted to his partners to be on guard as this was not an easy puppet. Suddenly, the monster looked fiercely at the adventurers and activated the self-destruct protocol. After that, it activated the distress mode. The creature's face was instantly filled with unbelievable terror. It looked at the intruders frantically and squealed loudly. The monster then jerked violently, tearing off shreds of clothing and releasing his extra arms. Looking at the enemy's new appearance, Ayn realized that she was no doubt the reason for the magical anomalies around her. The monster called Broken Wisdom finally freed itself from its clothes and glared angrily at the adventurers. It was then that I noted that her 400th level didn't match their assumptions. Suddenly, the creature's face twisted into a grimace of pain and anger, and it shouted that it would kill everyone here. After that, Broken Wisdom pounced on the heroes. At that moment, a memory suddenly surfaced in the creature's mind. Thirty years ago, an old woman found a basket on the riverbank. In it, she found a small crying baby. Then the old woman asked herself if she could raise that child, being a reclusive old witch. After a brief thought, she smiled and realized that she was incapable of such an act. It was because the woman had devoted her 80 years of life to the search for truth. She has become a powerful witch who knows everything possible about magic. But even being so powerful, this woman could not learn to live like an ordinary person. Having denied everything worldly, she had followed only one path and now she reproached herself very much for it. The witch looked at the crying child and wondered why his parents had left him here alone. Now, if she too left this child behind, it might die of hungry wild beasts. After pondering the future, the old woman turned around and muttered that if this was the fate, there was no need to change it. But suddenly the child through his crying shouted the word please. The old woman was surprised and did not leave. 
doubts crept back into her mind. So she sat for a while on the shore, thinking about the right thing to do. Suddenly she exhaled and muttered that this was a very polite child. Then the old woman looked at the child. A strong doubt came over her at that moment. What kind of child would grow up to be raised by an old hermit witch? Then the old woman leaned over to the basket and said she realized how great a will to live this child had. The witch smiled and held out her hands to the baby and said her name was Belgadia. The woman whispered that she would look after the baby from now on. Taking the orphan in her arms, she thought about what they would call him. Without much thought, the witch named the adopted child Marim. The name was consonant with one of the spells that makes a person absolutely happy. Then the witch hoped that her new child would have the same life. A short while later, the creature woke up. Now it was attacking the strangers who had come to her house. Ark dodged the first blow with great difficulty. He had absolutely no idea how to proceed against this monster. Suddenly, the puppet's two hands were dyed with the colors of different elements. Meanwhile, the protagonist, hoping that he could outplay this creature due to surprise, attempted to attack. Suddenly, the monster created a huge wall of fire in front of Ark, which confused the guy a lot. For a moment, the protagonist thought broken wisdom had managed to sneak away from him. But just a second later, he instinctively ducked, and at the same moment, an icy blade flew right above his head. It turned out that the robot had moved behind the wall of fire he had created and attacked from behind it. Suddenly, broken wisdom pulled out a sword from behind her back. Then the creature shouted again that it wanted everyone around it to die. By now, all of the monster's hands were painted in the colors of different elements. Suddenly, the puppet made a giant leap and fired several dozen throwing knives at the adventurers. It was then that Mina once again activated her shield. The knives failed to penetrate this armor, but the creature did not stop there. With a wave of her other hand, Broken Wisdom summoned a huge worm. At the same second, the monster swarmed towards the adventurers at tremendous speeds, opening its jaws. The monster effortlessly chewed through Mina's shield, leaving the girl bewildered. It was the first time the Enchantress had ever seen someone break her shield in one blow. After that, the entire squad was left completely defenseless, and Broken Wisdom pounced on the adventurers. Ains shouted to Ark that they needed to somehow tear off the creature's arms, and then it wouldn't be able to conjure. But as soon as the guy said that, the monster unleashed the full power of his sword on the heroes. It was only by some miracle that the boys were able to contain such a strong attack. But suddenly, strange things began to happen to Broken Wisdom. At first, the monster said he wanted everyone to die again, but then he asked himself, why would that be necessary? The girl sitting off to the side listened in horror as this creature struggled with multiple personalities at once. I was then told that not only did this doll have a high level, but it could also use different types of magic, which is very rare among wizards. Then Ayn muttered through the pain that he had a hunch about that. Ark replied to his partner that he was listening intently. The green-haired man muttered that ten years ago, there was a powerful witch who lived in this workshop and was skilled in various types of magic. According to rumors, the woman had been dead for a long time. But what was the chance that she was capable of living in these ruins forever? Hearing that thought, Ark muttered through his teeth that, in that case, they weren't fighting a puppet. Right now, they're fighting the witch's soul imprisoned in a new body. With synchronized swings of their swords, the heroes threw the monster back. The creature did a somersault in the air and landed far away from the adventurers. Ark was uneasy in his heart. He asked his partner if this witch had always been so inhospitable. A frightened Ayn replied that the old men of Durham were just saying the opposite. According to them, although this woman was a hermit, she never harmed anyone. But now the adventurers were faced with a completely different picture. The puppet was wriggling its entire body, as if trying to wrestle with a second, more vicious individual. Looking at the way his opponent fell to his knees, Ayn assumed that the old witch's soul was trying to overpower her new guise. Suddenly, the monster jumped to its feet and thrust its sword into the ground. In the next second, several mirrored walls appeared in front of the adventurers at once. The creature then began firing spells at the obstacles created. The magic beam was reflected and took an unguessable trajectory. It was then that Ayn said that, for what it's worth, this puppet was still damn dangerous. At the same moment, the monster's mind went blank again. She saw a memory from 18 years ago. The child picked up by the old witch grew up right before her eyes. Over time, she became addicted to building her own robots. Looking at the girl's eagerness, the old woman smiled and said that the child was attracted to very strange things. Merim replied that she didn't have the same strength as the master, but she still wanted to reach her master's level very badly. The witch said that the child really couldn't compare to her yet. However, if the girl continued to study hard, she would one day learn the same power. Merim replied that she had no talent for magic at all, so she decided to become an inventor. 
As she attached the arm of the homemade device, the girl said that one day her dolls would definitely be able to overpower the master. Realizing she couldn't win this argument, the witch leaned back in her chair and said the child could do what she wanted. She told Maram that it was her life, and she was free to live it as she wished. At one point eight years later, in the after-described situation, the child called loudly to the wizard. The witch, lying in her bed, asked her adopted daughter not to shout in vain. Sadly looking at the ceiling, the old woman mumbled that her life would be coming to an end very soon, and there was no changing that. The girl smiled and told her mentor that she could not die so easily, for she had not yet created a creation that could match the master in power. Suddenly her naive confidence turned to realization. The girl sat down on her knees and cried. Through her tears, she whispered that she had only a little time left to finish her masterpiece. Merim couldn't believe that her only friend would soon leave this world. The witch looked at the child with difficulty and said that she should not cry, for she had devoted her life to the study of dolls, so she would surely finish what she had begun. Then her eyes closed. In her last words, the old woman said that even though she was dying, the girl's life was just beginning, and she hoped that Merim would have a wonderful future ahead of her. After this memory ended, the monster once again returned to reality. At that moment, it delivered a crushing blow, throwing the adventurers aside. Having temporarily neutralized the main fighters, the monster ran up to Mill, who was standing off to the side in the same second. The doll stared intently into the eyes of the girl, who didn't have time to react or even realize what had happened. Ark turned around and was horrified to find his acquaintance in danger. The protagonist immediately rushed to the girl and saved her moments before she was struck. The guy took the full force of this attack on his back, his face immediately twisted in pain. Both adventurers were thrown to the other end of the room by inertia. After Ark fell to the ground, the creature moved towards him. Mina wanted to rush to help her partner, and Ayn tried to stop her. The girl disobeyed and immediately rushed out of her seat. However, at that very second, a barrier appeared in front of her. The Enchantress had no time to realize what had happened, and in the next second the monster's hand rushed straight through the wall towards her. The monster hit the girl in the center of her chest with all his might and threw her backwards. Mana's body flew over Ayn's head without a word, who at the same time came to an indescribable horror. Now to give his partner's time, the guy needed to go it alone. However, Ayn failed to show any initiative. As the next instant, the monster switched its attacks to him. The doll began to strike blow after blow. The boy tried to maneuver and evade the attacks, but each time it became harder and harder to do so. The difference in levels had a huge impact. Ayn realized that their speeds weren't comparable at all, and the doll's hands didn't stop for a second. Looking at the monster, once again preparing to attack, the guy realized that he couldn't last much longer like this. In the same second, the creature took an incredible leap, swinging around for a kick with its left leg. An exhausted Ayn realized that he wouldn't be able to dodge. Immediately afterward, the doll gave him a stabbing blow to the head. The adventurer's body was thrown back into one of the bookcases. An explosion followed. At the same moment, Ark struggled to his feet. The monster was still standing in front of him without any visible damage. Bleeding, the protagonist stated that at this rate, they would all be killed here. Nevertheless, he drew his sword again and prepared for defense. Dahl, who heard one of the victims get back on her feet, turned her head and looked at the intruder with hatred. After a brief battle of glances, the two opponents pounced on each other again. After getting close, Ark swung his sword and struck first. Hearing the distinctive ringing sound, he thought he had finally managed to hit his opponent. However, in the same second, the doll swung its arm, releasing a huge pillar of flame upwards. After the protagonist barely hit the monster with his sword, it was still in a normal state. It seemed that this strike was useless. The creature squealed and made a horrible grimace and looked at the guy. The robot then slammed his hand sharply into the ground, causing a blast wave that threw the boy aside. A frightened Ark tried to analyze the monster's actions to see what it was trying to accomplish. The guy struggled to keep his balance and stopped a few meters away from the epicenter of the explosion. It was then that he looked at the doll's feet and saw that they were badly melted. What he saw led to a disappointing conclusion. It seemed that whatever was happening to the monster's body, it wouldn't be able to fight. At the same moment, the flame-engulfed monster glared fiercely at the enemy and roared loudly. For a moment, it seemed to Ark that this shell was completely unable to withstand the powerful aura that the witch held within her. But this fight could not be prolonged in any way. The protagonist thought that no matter what, it was still the most ordinary doll that had a core in the center of the body just like everyone else. The most important problem remained how to get to the core of the monster. Just then, the monster screamed furiously again and muttered something inaudible. After that, the puppet once again attacked Ark. The monster struck one blow after another, but up to a certain point, the guy had no trouble dodging it. The boy was confused, thinking that if his opponent continued to attack at this pace, he would never be able to get close to the core. Suddenly, a familiar inhuman voice distracted the boy, and he turned back around. To the great horror of the protagonist, more robots snuck inside the room from a hole in the ceiling. The four puppets looked intently at Ark and announced the discovery of the target. 
The boy immediately turned his attention to the new creatures. This was a great chance for him to level up quickly. A few lightning swings of the sword left no trace of the iron shooters. After that, the guy landed on the ground. Several glowing beams flew towards him from the direction of the explosions. In the next instant, the Abyss armor announced that the bearer's stats had been raised to level 560. However, it still wasn't enough to gain an advantage. Ark said that he needed a legendary skill that would limit the opponent's movement. After a brief search, the armor opened an information panel in front of the boy's face and recommended that he acquire an ability called Royal Order. This ability binds a target with a lower level than the bearer with countless black spears. The cost of this ability was 150 levels. Deciding that this was probably the best way out of the situation, the boy sent in a purchase request. At the same moment, the doll furiously pounced on the protagonist. But now the advantage was already on Ark's side. His level was still higher than his opponent's. The boy looked at the creature with hatred and ordered it to bow to him. Moments before approaching the monster, the protagonist used the royal order skill. In the next instant, dozens of pennies came out of the ground, piercing through the doll's body. From the pain and the despair that came, the creature screamed in full voice. Memories that shouldn't have belonged to him began to resurface in the monster's mind. It was then, ten years ago, that Merim had dragged the master's body into this room, saying that she had finally succeeded. The girl was very excited. She said through her fatigue that although she had tried to transplant the master's soul into the doll, she had been unable to do so. However, a man told her about a forbidden technique that would allow the girl to bring the old woman back to life. With that thought, Merim strengthened her aura, accumulating dark matter in her hand. Firing a shot at the doll opposite, she shouted that by putting a soul into the body she had created, she would be able to bring the master back to life after all. Frantically looking into the eyes of her created creation, the girl whispered that she couldn't be around all the time. However, it was only a small price to pay for being given the gift of life. With that thought, Merim finished her dark ritual. Then she turned around and, throwing on her cloak, mouthed that the doll would automatically turn on as soon as she left the room. And then, the master's soul would stay here forever. After that, the girl sighed heavily and said goodbye to Mrs. Belgadia. Before leaving the room, Merim added that she was now consumed by evil, but she hoped the master would live a happy life for the two of them. After the girl left, the doll turned on. After that, the creature returned to the present again. Internal contradictions were tearing the monster apart. Each such memory seemed to add new energies to the monster's body. The doll frantically tried to break free of the trap, regardless of her injuries. Her limbs, already melted, were now also being torn to shreds. Suddenly, the monster broke out of the trap and, with its mouth wide open, pounced on the protagonist. Ark looked at his opponent in horror. He couldn't believe that even such a method hadn't worked. After taking a few steps, the doll fell to the ground again. Judging from the expression on the monster's face, these actions were not very easy for him. But then the creature, as if following some unknown instinct, pounced on its opponent again. Ark was still convinced of the effectiveness of this ability and decided to use it again. After another royal order, sharp spears reappeared in front of the doll, forcing it to stop. Suddenly, the monster looked angrily into the protagonist's eyes and shouted that she should kill the intruders. But she didn't know why. These words once again threw the boy into a stupor. He didn't understand why the monster was resisting, and he still wondered about it. The doll hung limply from the spades. At the same moment, the creature began to mutter something. After a short deliberation, it asked if killing people was her goal. But the very next second, the creature cocked its head upward and shouted that it wasn't at all. After losing a few arms, it broke free of its shackles again and pounced on the protagonist. The doll's face read more than just madness this time. However, Ark had already realized that he would be running this game from now on. Screaming frantically across the room, the creature swiftly pounced on the boy again. However, the protagonist already had a plan of action worked out. He stretched his hand forward and called out the royal order once again. The spears that popped out of the ground pierced the body of the puppet only a few meters away from Ark. One of the spikes pierced the monster's chest. The monster threw its head up and opened its mouth to think. All he wanted to do was protect his child. Immediately after this thought, the protagonist came down with a crushing blow on his opponent. The attack was so well thought out that immediately after it, core shards flew in different directions from the guy. Almost immediately, the monster plopped down heavily on its knees in front of the boy. The monster's eyes rolled back and it tried to whisper something. However, upon uttering only a name unfamiliar to Ark, the monster collapsed in the next second. The guy looked at his defeated opponent in surprise and couldn't believe that he had managed to do it. At the same moment, a strange blue ball flew out of the monster's body. The protagonist didn't understand what it was at all. After all, experience for increasing levels usually has a different color, but this essence had absolutely nothing to do with pumping. On the contrary, a blob of energy rushed into one of the ajar doors. The boy took a closer look, 
and found that there had been nothing like an exit here before. Ark realized that this strange spirit had opened a secret door. Surely this place wasn't that simple. It was probably necessary to check this door to find the answers to everything that had happened here. But before the guy could think about it, dozens of experience units immediately flew out of the monster's body. It was a huge table of yellow energy rising all the way to the ceiling. Ark thought with some trepidation that this was the first time he had ever killed such a high-level creature. After a short wait, the entire experience rushed into the protagonist's body. Suddenly, after the armor announced that the bearer had obtained level 810, the boy's eyes blurred. His heart began to beat at a furious rate in the blink of an eye. It felt like it was about to burst. The boy fell to his knees, and his powers began to leave his body, filling the room. The protagonist couldn't understand where the sudden pain so intense came from. Perhaps it was because it was the first time the armor had absorbed so many levels at once. However, the pain was completely unbearable, and in the next instant, a violent scream resounded in the room. By then, Aina and Mina were lying on the ground unconscious. Suddenly, the armor alerted the wearer to absorb a huge amount of levels. Because of this, the wearer suffers tremendous physical and mental damage. The armor advised the wearer to purchase the vault skill in order to preserve the wearer's life. After that, he suggested the wearer to confirm the purchase. However, Ark was already completely unable to say anything. The armor sent several repeated requests, but the guy started to lose his mind. After no reaction, the bracelet on the chief's arm lit up anew. The armor replied that only this time, he was taking temporary powers and acquired the skill vault. However, Ark was still standing still and cocked his head upwards, shouting loudly. Once acquired, the armor activated the skill and placed the wearer's 400 levels in the vault. When the request was approved, the agony that had gripped the boy's body released him. In the same second, his body was lifted above the ground and a huge ball of 400 levels flew out of the boy's chest. Then, all this huge flow of energy moved into an invisible vault. The protagonist remained hanging in the air for a while longer. After the process was complete, his body fell to the ground, bringing the guy to his senses. Looking fearfully at the ground, Ark asked the armor of the abyss, had they just saved his life? In response, the low voice said that he was merely carrying out the owner's will to acquire the vault. The protagonist replied that he did not remember much because of the pain. So the guy asked the armor to remind him what the point of this vault was. The voice replied that the skill allowed one to add or remove its levels at the owner's own will. For example, Ark's level was 810. In order to preserve the wearer's sanity, the armor took temporary powers and used the skill. After saying that, the boy realized why his level didn't increase at all after defeating the monster. It was then that he realized how handy a skill it was. After all, now Ark could stow as many levels in the vault as he needed, and this would make his stealth much easier. Still, one had to be careful not to overdo it. If the level was too high, it could render the owner insane. After these thoughts, the guy snickered and said he would deal with the levels contained in the vault later. Then he heard a footstep approaching. He turned around and looked around. From the other end of the room, his hitherto unconscious partners were running toward him. Mill glanced fearfully at the protagonist and asked if he was okay. The girl heard that the boy was screaming loudly. In response, the boy muttered that he was fine now. Afterward, he smiled at all three partners and said he was very happy to see them. The adventurers laughed and gave each other fists. Then Ark suddenly muttered that after defeating the monster, something had alarmed him. He added that as soon as the monster hit the ground, a blob of light flew out of its body. Ein thought for a moment and said that it was quite certainly the soul of that old witch. Then the adventurer asked his partner where that light had flown. The protagonist pointed to the side and said that something had opened a secret door behind a rack of books. Suddenly, Mill asked the squad leader uncertainly, would they go there? The girl was answered by Mana, who said they could only go there on the hope that the witch's soul was already gone. Otherwise, there was a good chance that danger also awaited them behind that door. After thinking for a few more seconds, the adventurers moved leisurely toward the secret door. Ark reached for the doorknob with some trepidation. After hesitating a few moments, he said, opening it. Entering the unknown room first, the protagonist was stunned by what he saw. A clear shining field of flowers and a small house standing in the background came into his view. All the adventurers were greatly amazed at what they saw. Ark asked how this was possible if they were deep underground. Ayn looked around with a smile and said that this was most likely a space created by the old witch for herself. Pointing in different directions, Mana kept saying that she had never heard of anything like that. Then she thought that the old witch was indeed a powerful sorceress. Looking around, Mill tried to spot the same blob of light Ark had mentioned. The girl's attention was caught by a cabin standing not far from them. She took a closer look and signaled to her partners that something was amiss there. But suddenly the roof of the structure was torn through by something, and a creature flew out of it swiftly. The protagonist was in great terror because of the fact that they would have to fight the witch again, but already in a new guise. In the next second, a robot of a previously unseen layout landed in front of the travelers. Ark shushed his partners with him and told them not to get close. 
Suddenly, the doll looked at the protagonist with a serious look and said that he should put his gun away. The monster then showed one of its hands, which was almost entirely made up of a blade. The strange creature mouthed that the sword was not a toy. Suddenly, Ark pointed his finger at his interlocutor and said that he was walking around with his sword himself. The monster shouted back that he couldn't remove part of his hand. After a short meaningless dialogue, the robot said that he actually wanted to thank the adventurers. The boys asked what exactly they had helped with. The strange creature replied that her name was Belgadia. On behalf of the old witch that dwelt in these ruins, she thanked the adventurers for saving her from a wounded soul. The creature muttered that no one would have thought that some old woman would have to live such a long life. Ark was very much surprised at such a surprise. The witch explained that that horrible multi-armed mechanical doll the protagonist had defeated had contained her soul for many years. Belgadia explained that as soon as the main body was destroyed, she woke up in a new form. The old woman said it was wonderful to finally have your will not be suppressed. Ein lowered his head and said that he originally thought that the monster's consciousness was clouded with negative energy. Suddenly, Mill asked, why hadn't the witch's soul found peace yet? Belgadia replied that after the destruction of her past body, her soul found shelter in this old doll. By conventional notions of logic, she really should have found peace and finally left this world. But the very girl responsible for everything that happened used a forbidden magical technique on her dead body. Mina was very much surprised that someone was still teaching these things. Ark asked his partner what she knew about it, but the girl only remained ambiguously silent. Suddenly the witch replied that forbidden magical techniques were a set of spells that had been rejected by the sages and forbidden to be used by anyone. She explained that in the wizarding community, the use of such things was a real taboo because of their dangerous consequences. The protagonist asked in desperation what had been done to the soul of the old woman herself. The witch replied that a forbidden technique number 95 called soul seeking rest in another's body had been used on her body. Because of this curse, no matter how hard someone tries to destroy Belgadia's current body, her soul will still find another sucker to continue her existence. Suddenly, Mana intervened in the conversation. She said that they could try to crack the witch. However, the old woman sharply replied in the negative, saying that it was impossible. She explained that her soul could only be freed by the one who had cast this forbidden technique on her. The adventuress asked in a rage, could not even a witch as powerful as Belgadia free herself from this spell? The woman replied that, alas, she was unable to do so. She also explained that whoever put this curse on her knew in advance that she would try to break free and made sure that no one but himself could remove the technique. The adventurers were shocked after such straightforward information. Restless Mina asked her interlocutor who used such a technique against her. The woman replied that it was all the fault of her student named Merim. She also added that at one time, she was unable to come to terms with her death. Because of that, the girl used a forbidden technique. That's why these skill sets are called that. After all, no one dares to disturb the natural course of things, and the dead have not returned to life. Belgadia clutched her head again and muttered that she wished Merim lived her life in happiness. However, the witch said that she would deal with the girl on her own anyway. She would have no trouble teaching her a lesson in her new body. However, the robot then went on to say that there was one problem with this idea. Belgadia explained that Merim wasn't smart enough to learn complex magical techniques nor had she ever taught him such things. The old woman then said that the girl must have made a deal with one of the warlocks. This mage helped seal her soul into a doll, and in return took Merim into slavery, forcing her to create the strongest fighting dolls. The witch said his name was Volm Forton. Suddenly, after these words, the unknown man appeared right in front of the old woman's face. Ark had absolutely no time to react to the attack and only gave the strange man a glance. The unknown man put his hand to his heart and said that the wizard's lodge rejects many powerful mages who try to use forbidden magical techniques. But at the same time, he considers such foundations to be utter nonsense, all because of the fact that these techniques are incredible. They help so many people live happy lives. In addition, those who possess this technique are able to bring people and the world to their feet. Those who are proficient enough in forbidden spells can gain the power of the god himself. Balm Fortin then reintroduced himself and said that he teaches forbidden magical techniques to anyone who needs them. The witch was horrified when she saw the very man she had just spoken of. She called her interlocutor an overbearing, miserable human being and said he dared not enter her abode. Belgadia's eyes lit up sharply, and she shrieked that Fortin had taken everything from her and she would make him go through the same hell she was going through herself. Waving his hand to the side, the monster ordered all the mechanical puppets nearby to kill this intruder. However, when no robot responded, Volm laughed and asked who she was talking about. Then he pointed the old woman to the bound dolls lying behind her and said that she must have been talking about them. The speed at which this madman massacred so many monsters shocked all the adventurers. Seeing the helpless reaction from his opponents, Fortin laughed at the top of his voice. Then he waved his arms 
and all the robots that were in his nets by that point dissolved into space. Then the madman raised his eyes to his opponents and said in a cold voice that now the jokes were over. Vom looked at Belgadia's confused face and turned to her. Smiling, he asked the old woman for permission to kill her today. The witch grinned and said she had never heard anything more stupid in her life. She explained that because of the forbidden magic technique that had been placed on her, it was impossible to kill her. The strange type smiled again and said that he knew about it, but he was the one who had helped Marim cast that spell on Mrs. Belgadia. Sparks started flying away from the old witch. She said that only the caster could remove forbidden techniques from a victim. At that moment, Belgadia realized that the only one who could kill her was exactly Volm Fortin. The madman laughed again and said that this was a very correct conclusion. He looked fiercely into the eyes of his potential victim and said that only he could free the old woman from the body of this tinny woman. Then Fortin shouted at the top of his voice that he was the one destined to show everyone the beauty of the forbidden technique. After saying that, he attempted to attack the target with his spear. Volm said that once he destroyed the body of this mechanical puppet, Belgadia's soul would leave the world forever. The witch frowned and said that she didn't understand at all why Fortin would want to kill her. She also added that this type could have invaded her abode at any time, but for some reason he had come here now. Fortin responded that it was actually a very good question. He clarified that he did not actually want to kill anyone. But over the past 10 years, the situation has changed dramatically. And right now, Volm is on the verge of fulfilling his dream. However, he needs to make a great sacrifice to get the greatest result. But what a solitary man it is will only be a small part, for Fortin plans to sacrifice the whole of Durham. The adventurers and the witch were horrified at what they heard. The madman, meanwhile, continued. He told the old woman that people still remembered her, and only a powerful witch like her could thwart his plan. So to make things go smoothly, Volm decided to deal with Belgadia first so that people wouldn't come to her for help. Suddenly, Ark interrupted his opponent's monologue and asked if it was he who had brought the monsters upon the city. The strange man laughed and said that there was no one else to do such nonsense but him. After confirming his hunches, Ark didn't hesitate to pounce on the bastard, shouting that he had finally found the man he was looking for. However, Volm had time to react and turned around to block the blow with his staff. He was immediately very impressed with this boy's determination and chutzpah. The strength of both mutual attacks were so great that they created a small flare. Spreading some distance apart, Ark said he doesn't care about the reasons why Fortin wants to do this. The boy shouted that he would not allow anyone to destroy Durham for their own selfish desires. The protagonist then drew his sword and pointed it towards his opponent, and shouted that he would finish him off himself. At that moment, Volm Fortin had an incredible 500th level. At the same time, Ark's scores were 90 points lower. The madman's eyes suddenly sparkled with curiosity. He muttered quietly that this interesting boy was now occupying all his attention. Volm's pupils dilated. He muttered that he had thought only Lady Belgadia could stop him, but it had been a long time since he had seen adventurers of such high caliber in these parts. At that very second, Ark decided to attack first and pounced on his opponent. Standing on the spot, the madman said that massacring some brat was not in his plans. With one long backward leap, he increased the distance and looked at his opponent with a smile. With a sudden change of direction, Volm was right in front of the protagonist. He said that today had been a very successful day of hunting. In the blink of an eye, the madman came close to Ark and delivered a crushing blow to his stomach. The tip of the staff glowed strongly as it attacked. Fortin said he could now deal with two annoying elements at once. After such a powerful attack, Ark immediately flew backwards, screaming in pain. Holding his hand to his chest, he struggled to lift himself up and looked in front of him. Volm Fortin walked straight towards the protagonist with a slow step and a smile on his face. He shouted that he didn't want to get his hands dirty on such a simpleton, so he would give him a quick death. But suddenly the hitherto silent Ein called out to the madman. The strange type turned around and looked the real ones aside at the adventurers. Ein said that they shouldn't be forgotten about either. There was a long, tense silence. Fortin stood in the center and looked at the remaining opponents. Suddenly he snapped his fingers loudly and addressed the audience. The madman said that he recognized that he was not ready for a battle with so many opponents. After a click, a portal opened under his feet. Volm said goodbye, for he had business to attend to. The witch asked in a rage why this impudent man was running away at a time like this. Fortin turned to Belgadia and said that he was not running away at all. The madman explained that he merely had to remove himself for a while, or he simply wouldn't make it to the bloody celebration in time. The adventurers looked at the strange type in horror and asked what he meant. Volm laughed and shouted that if the weaklings really wanted to defend the city, they had better hurry up. Before he finally evaporated, he managed to utter that at this moment, his subordinates had already started killing the people of Durham. A new day in the city began the same way as almost every other day. The unremarkable shopping streets were once again filled with dozens of residents bustling back and forth. Looking down on it all, Volm Fortin smiled and muttered that life in the harem was boiling as usual.
The madman was sitting on the ledge of one of the floors of the Adventurer's Guild headquarters. Fortin looked at the blue-haired boy as he gazed at the silhouettes of the inhabitants. Fulm thought that this peaceful idyll would soon be over. Meanwhile, the type from the square turned the corner. Soon his eyes turned purple. Walking deep into the alley, he suddenly activated a rune that emitted a pillar of light into the sky. Sitting at a high altitude, Fulm noticed it immediately. At that moment, he was overjoyed. The madman threw back his head and started laughing loudly. Everything was unfolding according to his plan. After a while, more and more beams of light began to appear all over the city. Soon all of Durham was covered in purple flashes. Fortin's multiple agents showed themselves. Ordinary people were disoriented and did not immediately realize how dangerous this phenomenon was. Sitting atop the tower, Volm Fortin shouted that all the inhabitants would become food for the new god of this world. Meanwhile, the curse left in the witch's hideout was beginning to develop. At a certain point, the curse dispelled the magic technique placed on the old woman ten years ago. After that, Belgadia felt ill as quickly as possible and crouched down on her knee. Ark asked the witch if she was all right. The robot replied that. There was no need to worry about her. But she sensed that Volm had modified the magical forbidden technique before leaving. Ark asked fearfully, does that mean she only has one life now? The witch confirmed his speculation and added that if she died, her soul would finally be set free. Rising from the ground, Belgadia said that she no longer cared about it anymore. She had died once before and so death did not frighten her. When she was imprisoned in the body of a doll, she couldn't leave the confines of her workshop, and her mind was clouded. The old woman tapped her metal chest to herself and said that things were very different now. From now on, she is free to leave this place at last. The new body is not subject to the old restrictions. But more important now is what Volm said before he left. Milieu Horrified said that this psychopath is going to kill all the people of Durham to achieve his dream. Ein still couldn't believe what was happening and asked the witch if it was really true. The old woman yowled and said she thought Volm wasn't lying. The green-haired man looked at his partners and said they needed to get back right away. Suddenly, Mina asked how they would get there. If they walked, there was no chance of getting there in time. Ark agreed with his partner, saying that even if they tried, they would arrive by the time the city lay in ruins. Suddenly, Belgadia straightened her arm and asked the travelers, had they forgotten who they had met not so long ago? She then created a huge ball of magic above her head. The old woman said that even Volm had described her as the only equal opponent, so the question of moving could be left to a powerful witch like her. By this point, there were numerous victims of the first minutes of the attack in Durham. On one of the major streets, a merchant lying on the ground tried to call for help. Three unknown hooded men stood right in front of them. These strange people had spiral masks instead of faces. The closest of the subordinates prepared a spell to finish off the victim. The merchant looked on in horror at the madmen and begged for mercy out of his last hope, shouting that he would do anything. However, he soon groaned in pain, and those sounds echoed over the main character's guild base. At this moment, Lyra was inside the building. She could hear that the sounds outside were getting louder and louder, and it scared her. Out of curiosity, she ran out the front door to see what was going on. The girl looked up at the blood-red sky. It was a frightening sight that alarmed her greatly. While Lyra was looking around, a man in a black cloak appeared at the other end of the alley. He shouted that he had found a new victim, his arm loaded with spells. Lyra was frozen in place with fear. She couldn't bring herself to move and watch the unknown man in horror. The frightening type ordered her to pray and cry in anticipation of the imminent. The girl took a few steps backward. However, it was already too late to somehow confront these strange people. The masked type shouted that the girl would be food for their new god, then shot a spell at her. But no sooner had Lyra regained consciousness than her assailant was cut down by Ark with a single blow. After a successful hit, the guy pushed the body of the unknown man, which flew off into a neighboring building. However, the spell still didn't stop either and continued to move towards the girl. But at the same instant, Mina appeared right in front of Lyra. She created a shield, shouting that those who used forbidden techniques were complete weaklings. She then strengthened the shield aura, dispersing the unknown dark matter to the sides. Lyra looked fearfully at the boys who had arrived in time and thanked them for saving her. Ark smiled at the girl, but immediately there was a rumbling sound off to the side. The boy saw Mistress Belgadia standing off to the side. The witch said that Volm had changed the nature of her body after all. Now she can't go back to the workshop. The old woman reminded the boys that they were risking their lives to save the people of Durham. Afterwards, Ark thanked Mrs. Belgadia for being so helpful to them. The witch waved her hand and said that the name was just a relic of the past. She suggested that the guys just call her their friend. Meanwhile, the merchant moments before his execution hoped for no help at all. However, suddenly, all three unknown people were cut down by a single blow. It was Mr. Girai. The old man said in a calm voice that killing the innocent was a great sin for which he would punish. Turning around, the adventurer surveyed the results of his work. All three attackers were dead. Girai looked around and told the merchant to go to the Sword of Salvation Guild headquarters. 
all the survivors had taken refuge there. The old man promised not to let the monsters get in. As the merchant fled, the adventurer began to reason. The enemies he had encountered in the city ranged from about level 80 to level 100. It was all very depressing. Gire thought that he had never met anyone like them in Durham until today. Suddenly the clapping from behind caught the old man's attention. The unknown man called his work not bad. In addition, he was aware that he was talking to the head of the Sword of Salvation Guild. Without looking back, Gire asked the unknown man if he was the instigator of all this mayhem. The stranger laughed and the old man turned around. Standing opposite him was a pale-faced guy with long hair. He muttered that he loved to watch people's anger, and also complimented Gire on his good looks. Swishing his cloak, Volm Fortin mouthed that it was indeed he who had caused the bloody celebration that had engulfed the entire township. Gire immediately asked his opponent what it was all about. The madman explained to the old man that only humans can experience such a sweet cocktail of feelings. They can suffer, they can be angry, they can be furious. The madman threw back his head and shouted that the suffering and pain, combined with the rest of the evil feelings of the people, would serve as food for the new god. Then Volm laughed again and shouted that this was the bloody celebration. Gire was silent for a while, and then asked about the origin of the desolate curses. Volm scratched his chin, trying to remember who he was talking about. He then said that he was also behind the summoning of these creatures. All of this was to test the guild forces that the city has. However, the result did not impress Fortin at all, and he forgot about these bugs. Suddenly the madman smiled, and through his teeth, he muttered that he was even somewhat grateful to the people of this city. He then spread his arms and shouted that because the people of Durham had been saved that day, they could now be fed to the new god. Volm's eyes were filled with rage when he said that thanks to the protection of the townspeople, the new god of this world would be able to enjoy suffering to the fullest. After all this was said, the madman took a closer look at his opponent. The cross on his forehead suddenly glowed. In the next instant, Guirai used the legendary skill Demonic Adventuring. He said that he wouldn't let Fortin's dirty plans come true. Volm grinned, saying that even with the legendary skill, the old man's level only reached the 400th level. After that, the madman amplified his aura many times and shouted that Guirai was absolutely no match for him. However, the old man didn't seem to have any intention of stopping. He mouthed in a completely calm voice that he would make his opponent lay down his weapon in 15 seconds. Volm was shocked at what he heard. He didn't understand what this desperate suicide bomber could hope for. Suddenly, a calm voice behind ordered an additional 190 levels to be added from the vault. At the same second, Girai pounced on his opponent with incredible speed. Volm realized that all this time his attention had been diligently diverted. Turning around, he saw the same brat from the dungeon approaching him. Only now he had an incredible 600th level. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, a sweep of minions was taking place. Ein, as one of the strongest adventurers in the city, fought at the forefront. The sight he saw on the streets of his city shocked the lad. The guy couldn't get over the idea that someone was willing to make ordinary people suffer, just for the sake of his god. With hatred staring into the void, Ein shouted that it was simply disgusting. Suddenly the lad was called out by a familiar voice from outside, urging him not to yawn and help with the minions. It was Will. Will shouted that if Ayn was pissed off at someone, he should just punch them in the face and be done with it. The green-haired man turned around and agreed with his partner. A group of several minions surrounded them on all sides. With the advantage of speed, Ayn rushed towards the villains. At the same time, in the distance, the rumble of a battle that was taking place on the other side of the city could be heard. Suddenly, Will asked his companion where that kid in the black armor was. Ayn replied that Ark, just like them now, was fighting the evil that had overtaken Durham. However, this guy had his own, much more important battle to fight. Volm, who saw the danger approaching, was terrified. At the very last moment, he managed to put his staff in front of him and block the blow. Ark pushed his opponent back and pounced on him again. At the same moment, he called out for Mr. Guirai, hoping that he would be able to strike a successful blow in the back. The old man was already close to Fortin as well. He tried to intercept his opponent on the retreat using Black Flash. However, Volm dodged at the last moment. At that moment, panic was already clear in his gaze. But suddenly, the bastard smiled and snapped his fingers. At this moment, he was using Forbidden Technique number 74. In the same second, several minions from different parts of the city suddenly disappeared. A moment later, they appeared right in front of Volm. By then, the Black Flash created by Gire was still in effect. The full power of this attack was on the backs of the minions. The old man completed the attack in hopes of hitting the main target. What they saw, however, horrified them and Ark. Volm remained completely unharmed. At the same time, all the followers he teleported to him took the blow and died. The madman said that these fanatics would defend him from any attack at the cost of their lives. He then examined one of the dead and said that on one hand, it would be really sad if some old man and brat killed all of his minions. But suddenly Volm laughed and said that on the other hand, he didn't need followers who couldn't even handle lousy adventurers. 
The utter disrespect for his own allies infuriated Ark even more. Valm opened the information panel and said that right now he was more concerned with how the boy had raised his level so quickly. It just didn't seem normal. After reading the information, he looked at his opponent and muttered that he should have killed the brat back in the workshop. At the same second, Jure, determined not to waste any time, came at the enemy from the flank. He attacked Volm with lightning speed, however. The latter had no trouble dodging. Several retries of the strike also failed to bring serious success. Missing the advantage of the surprise effect, the old man moved some distance away. He then engaged his opponent again with another high-speed attack. With a final blow, Gire still managed to knock the staff out of the monster's hands. At the same moment, the old man said that everything had become clear to him now. Volm's forbidden technique was undoubtedly strong, but it wastes a lot of energy, so he couldn't use it all the time. The demon answered nothing and only looked at his opponent in silence. Hearing this, Ark pounced on his opponent once again. He shouted to his partner that they had to get rid of the bastard before he could recover in time to use the new forbidden technique. However, the guy's attack was also unsuccessful as Volm maneuvered towards his staff with incredible ease. The protagonist suggested that Mr. Gire punch together, and then this psycho would definitely not be able to dodge. The two adventurers came at the enemy from different flanks at great speed. They synchronously used the demonic black flash. Unable to dodge the approaching blow, Volm tried to respond with a spell of his own. Moments before he struck, he put up a mighty shield in front of him. Ray and Ark swiftly crashed into the barrier that had been put up. After blows of such power, the shield expectedly began to crack, causing Volm to panic. A few seconds later, the barrier shattered into small pieces. The bloody demon flew aside. Both stabbing blows hit right on the madman's body. The shockwave was so strong that it completely demolished the roads in some streets. With a powerful attack, the monster was thrown several blocks away. Trying to recover from what had happened, Volm looked at his feet and saw blood dripping from his face. He smiled and mouthed that the taste of blood was very pleasant after all. Then a blade appeared near the face of the defeated demon. Ark told his opponent that he had lost. The protagonists and the Lord of Heroes stood over the wounded Volm. The boy said that as long as they stood guard, no one was destined to destroy Durham. Fortin grabbed his face and immediately laughed at the top of his voice. Squinting, he looked at his opponents and admitted that he had indeed underestimated them. The madman examined the protagonist and said he was particularly wrong about him. Volm sat on the ground, unable to believe that he had lost. But suddenly Fortin's tone changed. He said in an inhuman voice that he had made enough sacrifices to awaken the new god. Then the madman smiled and said that it was far from over. In the same second, a rune appeared around him. One by one, the costumed minions began to appear around the perimeter of the rune. Ark and Giri watched in silence. They realized in their minds that they had missed their chance. The minions looked at each other in bewilderment. Volm said that the new god didn't care who was sacrificed. At the same second, he used the forbidden technique number 76. As he performed, Volm's face expressed the peak of possible insanity. In the next instant, glowing daggers rained down on the subordinates from the sky. This ability, called Mob Shout, causes cold weapons to rain down. The madman whispered with a satisfied face that now everyone around him would taste that divine flavor of his own blood. After saying those words, all the dagger-struck minions were immediately electrified. Many of them were grabbing their faces in panic, trying to rip off their masks, which were cracking from the exertion. The daggers plunged again and again into the already dead and still living bodies. The entire space around Volm was filled with the blood and bodies of the slain. Ark and Mr. Girai stood still for a while. They both didn't want to believe what was happening. Meanwhile, the demon began to feed on the blood of the minions, which immediately began to restore its powers. He thought it was likely that the prey he had gotten would not be enough, but there was nowhere to look for new ones. A short while later, Volm's aura intensified again. He was even more of a threat now than he had been before the battle began. Ark, who had gathered his thoughts, tried to pounce on his opponent, shouting that he wouldn't let him do whatever he wanted. Fortin didn't even budge. Smiling, he said the boy was very fast, but it was too late. Ark threw a slashing blow, but it came to nothing. When he turned around, he saw that the demon had easily dodged it. Realizing this battle was won by him, Volm held out his hand and said it was time. The red stone in the center of the staff began to emit a bloody glow. The monster began to soar upward, calling on all those around him to suffer for the sake of the new god. Following him, streams of blood began to surge into the sky from all over the city. All that was left for Ark and Giri at that moment was to stand there and be horrified at what was happening. Blood streams flowed into the staff and filled the stone in the center. Even the blood from Volm's wounds was partially seeping into the stone. However, the demon was no longer paying attention to it. Ripping off his cloak, he shouted that the staff could taste his blood and flesh as well, if need be. In utter madness, Fortin said that if his body was needed for the new god, he would give whatever he could. A short while later, the bud that had been covering the bloodstone began to open. After a few seconds, the tip of the staff began to resemble a flower with itself. Then the staff formed a special stone in Volm's hand. 
the demon said that it was the ripe fruit of suffering and human sorrow. This is the moment Fortin has spent years preparing for. Now the blood crystal artifact belongs to him. The monster took to the sky and holding out his trophy in his hand, shouted that now no one in this city would be able to stop him. He was jubilant that with this crystal he would be able to perform his ritual, which would fundamentally change the entire universe. Soaring even higher, Volm shouted that then a new true god would be born. Ark, wishing this would all be over soon, pounced on his opponent at the same second. They crossed their blades fiercely and looked at each other with hatred. The protagonist didn't understand how Volm was going to summon a god into this world. The madman replied that forbidden techniques are not perfect. He would not be able to resurrect a god completely, but Fortin wanted the new god to take his body as a vessel. Such plans horrified Ark. Volm broke away from the boy and shouted that very soon he would see a new god. Then he snapped his fingers and vanished, saying lastly that he would have to wait a little longer. At breakneck speed, the madman raced away from the city. Gire watched it disappear from the ground. From the trail in the sky, he tried to determine where the enemy might be headed. Very quickly, the old man came to the conclusion that this type was not going to hold the main part of the ritual in the city itself. There was only one place he could think of. Ark asked excitedly, Where is this madman going? Mr. Gwyri replied that there was a place west of Durham with abnormally high levels of dark magical energy. This location is called the Mausoleum of Palmyra. The red clouds were long gone from Durham's sky. Mr. Girai was angry with himself. He wanted to stop this dark wizard, but he let him slip away. Clenching his fists, the old man muttered that it was now necessary to gather a squad of experienced and strong fighters to stop Volm. But there was a problem. Even in his large Sword of Salvation guild, there aren't those fighters who can stand up to this demon on equal footing. The bastard was level 500. The maximum a person could reach was 250. After saying that, Gire turned around to Ark and said that the guy was special. The protagonist is the only one who was able to defeat this Volm. The old man said that he didn't know a single person who had the same level as Ark. Gureus then looked at the boy and asked if he would accept his personal errand. Ark replied without hesitation that he was willing to do anything. The supreme adventurer of the Sword of Salvation said that if the protagonist made it through, his guild would be allowed to exist. In that case, Guiresan would personally go to the central office to petition for the establishment of the guild. In addition, they will provide all financial support. The old man put his hand to his chest and said that Ark could rely on him. The head of the Sword of Salvation swore that he would fight alongside the protagonist against the forces of evil. However, no one is currently able to overpower Volm except Ark. The boy replied that he understood everything perfectly well and was ready to fulfill the duties assigned to him. Suddenly, the supreme adventurer asked his interlocutor about the name of his guild. The boy hesitated and didn't answer. He realized that they had not thought about it during this time. Mr. Guirai replied that it was very important to think of a name for his brainchild. Ark replied that no options had come to mind so far. The old man said he had some advice on the matter. The name of the guild should reflect the essence of its creator. At this moment, dozens of memories of the past days surfaced in the protagonist's mind. Mr. Girai said that the boy had become a support for everyone he met during his wanderings. Many people take Ark as an example, considering him their hero. The boy himself was ready to sacrifice his life to save others. Soon his friends did the same. While Ark listened admiringly to the old man with his mouth open, the supreme adventurer said he had one option. Girai said that it would be a good idea to name the guild Black Star of Hope. Meanwhile, in the dark hallway of the Palmyra Mausoleum, a girl was sitting. Suddenly, the sound of growling in front of her made her raise her head. Opposite the girl stood a huge creature whose paw was the size of a healthy man. The man received word from the creature that a band of adventurers was headed here. After this news, the girl jumped up from her seat and said it was about time to get ready. There was no way she could let anyone pass today. Measured footsteps were heard down the dark corridor. The only source of fire in the cave, the flames of the altar, lit up the huge room. Volma walked slowly up the stairs. Today would be the day he had been waiting for. A new god would soon arrive on this earth. The wizard once again examined the crystal in his hand. As he looked around the altar, he said through gritted teeth that he had been carefully preparing for this day. It had taken a long time to create the blood crystal and prepare the forbidden technique, but the ritual will not go quickly it would also require a considerable amount of time. With that thought, Volma looked to his left. A girl with a short haircut stood near one of the columns. She told her partner that he could rely on her and she would finish off anyone who dared to set foot here. The wizard said it was wonderful, and he wasn't wrong to make that very deal with her. He then threw the blood crystal into the fire, shouting that it was time to begin. From that moment on, the ritual to summon a new god into the world began. Meanwhile, east of Durham, a column of wagons was moving along the dusty road. The small detachment of the Black Star of Hope Guild fit into a single cart. Curious Mill asked the protagonist where he got the money for such a fancy carriage and horses. Ark replied that their application to form a guild had been approved, and now central control would support them financially. 
Ein told the girl that their guild was now called Black Star of Hope. Mill replied that it sounded really good. The protagonist apologized to his companions for not being able to come up with a more normal name. Mana replied that they didn't expect much from him. The Enchantress also noted that from this point on, Art could officially be called a guildmaster. The guy really liked the way it sounded. He turned to his partner and said that was great. Even Ein prodded Mina, saying that she couldn't call Ark that way since she was already a member of the Sword of Salvation. The girl angrily replied that she could get out of there whenever she wanted. Suddenly the cabman called excitedly to the adventurers. Everyone immediately moved closer to see what was ahead. The column gradually approached the mausoleum of Palmyra. If Mr. Gori is not mistaken, this is where Volm should be. Belgadia said that surely this mausoleum must be protected by a barrier. She offered to teleport them all there without much effort. Then the witch took a closer look and said that they had been expected for a long time. A startled mill pointed her finger toward the entrance. There was a group of Volm subordinates to that side. These were the same masked men who were the most rank-and-file henchmen. Ark was both wary and pleased that they had guessed right. At the same moment, all the minions almost instantly raised their hands. Just like when they attacked the city, they created many magic waves of incredible power. The dark matter rushed towards the wagons with great speed. The cart carrying the Black Star Hope Guild's guild troop was luckier than those following them. After the first synchronized attack, most of Volm's subordinates moved into close combat. Turning around, Ark realized that the attack was mostly on the Sword of Salvation wagons. The protagonist wanted to jump out of the cart to help his co-workers deal with the attack. However, Ein stopped his partner by grabbing his arm. He said Ark should not enter the fray early, especially since the Sword of Salvation didn't have the easiest guys. Ein convinced the protagonist that their guys could stand up for themselves. The remaining wagons that were not attacked made it safely to the main entrance. In the first echelon were the elite units of Sword of Salvation and the entire Black Star of Hope Guild. After a readiness check, Ark looked around at those present and announced the start of the operation. Today they had to catch the dangerous criminal and dark wizard Volm Fortin. A group of adventurers had made their way into the main corridor and were rapidly traversing it towards the halls. Thus, the squads reached the first major room. It was a hall with numerous small burials. Mr. Girai ordered all the fighters to be on guard as the enemies could attack at any moment. The strangest thing was that compared to the battle that had occurred at the entrance of the mausoleum, this room was suspiciously quiet. Suddenly, Ark heard the shuffling of feet behind him. He realized that his assumptions were not in vain. Turning around, the protagonist saw a henchman running at him. At the same moment, several more sectarians jumped down from the ceiling, hurling their blades at the uninvited guests. Already a few seconds later, the entire group was taken in a complete encirclement. Giray ordered the first unit of the Sword of Salvation to stay here, while the second unit continued to move along with the main group. Ark was very much surprised that the old man was throwing a small detachment into a fight against an ambush. Seeing that the boy was shaken, Mr. Girai ordered him to move on, for the capture of Volm was now paramount. He convinced the protagonist that his men could handle the attackers without difficulty. Thus, seven people managed to get through. Ein also tried to cheer up the guildmaster by saying that if Volm's words were true, then right now he was summoning an evil god into this world. That's why they don't have a minute to try and deal with the minions right now. The green-haired guy said that when the time came, Ark would have to single-handedly deal with Volm while the others would cover for him. The protagonist tried to object, saying that it was wrong to leave his men alone to be torn apart. However, Ein calmly looked into his partner's eyes and asked, did he really think he couldn't handle a bunch of some mages alone? Ark frowned and said he hadn't said anything like that, to which his interlocutor replied that was fine. A few seconds later, another squad of minions appeared ahead. ML noticed that they were being pressed from behind as well. There seemed to be no end to their edge. Mr. Giray shouted to Will that the remaining minions should be taken over by him. The thug turned around and glared angrily at his opponents. He smirked and asked if they thought they could handle him. Ahead of the main group of adventurers, the henchmen reappeared. Ark overtook their position with a single leap, and with a swing of his sword cut all of his opponents down. Armor stated that it was impossible to absorb the level since these people had been poisoned by dark magic. The protagonist chimed in that it didn't matter, because his current stats were enough for him to overpower Volm. Ark shouted to his partners that the path was clear, and the group headed onward. Suddenly there was a breach to Geary's right, and bony hands tried to grab him. To his great surprise, the old man found the desolate cursed one across from him. The hero stopped to take the fight to the sudden enemy. But suddenly the neighboring parts of the wall also broke through, and more monsters came out of them. Thus, the supreme adventurer was facing three desolate cursed at once. Ark tried to shout for the old man to come to his senses. However, Jurey ordered the rest of the group to run on and not wait for him. He shouted one last time that all responsibility was now theirs. The remaining adventurers made it to the next room without much difficulty. Mina looked around the walls warily and whispered that all the air here was saturated with dark magic. She complained that even breathing in here was getting harder by the second. 
Belgadia told her partner that it wasn't surprising. This room was quite unlike the others. His main attention was drawn to the large double door at the end of the room. It must have been the passage that led directly to Valm. From experience in the previous rooms, the protagonist thought they'd better not linger here, and ordered the squad to hurry. Suddenly a woman's voice spoke out, saying that he would not allow them to pass through those doors. At the same second, there was the sound of a jump. In the next instant, a huge monster appeared in front of the heroes out of nowhere. After that, an unknown girl approached him and stroked the beast's fur. The minion said that this wolf cub's name was Brish, and her name was Merim. She then stroked the creature on the head while saying that a new god would be born very soon. The next moment, the monster opened its jaws and pointed a huge cannon at the strangers. Merim muttered that they had not invited any uninvited guests to the celebration. The wolf gave a fierce howl at her words. As the wolf howled, he thought about where he'd heard Marim's name. From the old witch's account, this was the girl she had taken in. As he prepared for battle, the protagonist took the time to look back and watch Belgadia's reaction. The witch stood there with her mouth hanging open and didn't move. The boy once again confirmed his hunches. But now he didn't care who he was fighting. Now Ark was ready to kill anyone who tried to stop him. This time, a level 450 level Baresh Iron Wolf and its mistress stood in his way. Merim said she had heard of an adventurer with an abnormally high level for the average person. The girl looked angrily at her opponent and said that she was a simple engineer and she could not defeat him in a fair fight. So on such an occasion, she had something special in store for the offenders. After these words, Baresh howled and the room filled with magical light. The adventurers had the feeling for a moment that this entire room had been designed solely for this fight. Mina suggested that it was some kind of magic technique. In turn, Ein replied that he didn't feel anything special. The protagonist, on the other hand, felt like his body had gotten a little heavier after the wolf howl. Merim retired to a safer place. She called Baresh her perfect creation and said that these people were left for him. After saying those words, the monster slowly began to move towards Ark. Before he knew it, the monster was pouncing on him a second later. Ark managed to block the blow, and the dog's claws dug into the blades of the blades. This attack was much stronger than what the protagonist expected. But then he thought that an opponent whose level was 150 points lower than his own would not be able to win. Shifting his fulcrum, Ark threw Barish off of him with a powerful jerk. Before the creature could recover, its main vulnerable area near its neck was exposed. It was at this point that the protagonist unleashed the full force of his punch, an attack of such strength the monster shouldn't have been able to withstand. However, the dog's eyes suddenly lit up in a different way. The disoriented guy didn't have time to realize anything, but at the same second, a huge paw swept towards him. Ark put his blades in front of him again, and the monster threw him back a few dozen meters. Immediately afterward, the dog began moving around the room with incredible speed. These lightning-fast maneuvers were intended to confuse the enemy, and the adventurer really did not immediately realize what Barish wanted to achieve. Suddenly, a huge wolf's mouth appeared out of nowhere near the guy's left ear. There was a huge gun sticking straight out of that throat. At the same instant, the wolf shot his opponent at point-blank range. Ark squirmed and screamed in surprise, but still managed to put his swords in front of him again. There was a huge explosion in the center of the room, throwing both opponents aside. Mill cried out in fright, trying to see her leader in the cloud of dust. However, to my great joy, the boy survived. He was sitting on his knees near the rubble of the column. The shards of his blades lay right in front of him. The protagonist looked at his opponent in fury, not understanding why such a thing had happened. Ark was confident that he had hit the exact target. He then rose to his feet and picked up one of the pieces of his sword. He thought that with the difference in levels, this monster should have died by now. However, Barish was still standing confidently in front of him. Something unusual was clearly going on here. Merim saw her opponent's surprise and grinned. She asked the boy why he was unable to defeat an opponent with a lower level. After a brief pause, the girl replied with a smile that it was simple. She didn't call Barish her best creation for nothing. The thing is that the skill of this monster reduces the levels of all its opponents within the radius of the energy field. Simply put, Ark's level at the moment is equal to the one possessed by the dog. In addition, the monster's skeleton is made of high-quality durable steel, which allows it to withstand very strong blows. Merim looked at the adventurer with disdain and said that he would sooner run out of breath than be able to overpower such a powerful monster. And even if the guy still manages to defeat the dog, by then Volm will probably have finished his ritual. Ark looked at the girl fearfully. Then he restored the swords to his hands again. Utterly confused, the protagonist once again pounced on the monster. He attempted a swift attack, but the monster managed to maneuver and jump aside. Ark realized that at Barish's 450 level, 
it would be difficult for him to win using all his skills. In such a situation, the guy would have missed precious time. While the adventurer was thinking about this, the creature began its attack again. The dog pounced on his opponent, clawing at his blades. The protagonist struggled to block the blow, unsure of what to do next. But suddenly, a red beam flashed from the side of the fighting men. In the next instant, Lady Belgadia flew past the guy. She delivered a swift kick to the monster's body. The monster had no time to react to this unexpected attack. The monster's carcass flew helplessly into the wall. After that, the witch landed right in front of the stunned Ark. She looked at the guy and said she would take care of the problem on her own. Merim stared in bewilderment at the robot who dared to get into a fight. Then Belgadia looked at the girl and said that Ark had better things to do than mess around with an obnoxious child. The shocked boy asked the witch what had happened to her all of a sudden. The sorceress said it was all about her new body. She explained that this shell works the same way as that wolfman. Being here, Belgadia felt an incredible surge of strength. Perhaps now she would be able to defeat this monster herself. Ark tried to object and say that she was not adventurous at all. Suddenly, however, the leader of the group was called out by Ein. The protagonist turned around and saw that his partner was looking at him seriously. Then the adventurer calmly said it was time for the lad to move on. Ark looked at the friends left behind with some concern and said that they had no right to die here. Ein smiled and said they understood perfectly. Immediately after these words, the protagonist rushed into the next room to meet Volm. Seeing this, Merim realized that the situation was getting out of control. She ordered Barish to rush after the boy. In the same second, the monster turned around and, ignoring the rest of the adventurers, followed towards the fleeing Ark. The bright light in his mouth lit up again. Immediately after that, the dog started shooting at the fleeing guy. Suddenly, however, Belgadia appeared right in front of the creature's muzzle. She struck a fighting pose and said that it was their time to fight as equals. The robots stood silently facing each other. The room was completely silent. Realizing that they were now in control, Ein looked away. The guy realized that the monster's owner was completely defenseless and pounced on her in the same second. The adventurer intended to kill his opponent with a single blow, doubting that she would be able to counter him. However, the girl created a protective aura and evaded the attack. Looking at it, Ayan said that Merim had created the perfect conditions to apprehend their leader. Realizing that the surprise attack had failed, the adventurer jumped back. He approached Belgadia and together with her blocked the path of the opponents. The boy said that their task now was to keep the girl and the dog here. Meanwhile, the protagonist had already run into the double doors. He paused for a moment and glimpsed behind him. Ark gave a last shout out to his friends that he relied on them a lot. The adventurer then turned around and headed straight for the next room. At the same moment, a fight broke out right behind him. The monster came straight at the witch. Fending off blows with the blade built into her arm, Belgadia realized she didn't stand much of a chance. However, right now they needed to apprehend this creature at all costs. After blocking the attack, the monster once again jumped back and moved back a few steps. Merim walked over to her creature and stroked its muzzle. She said she couldn't just look at the ugliness. Gritting her teeth tightly, the girl explained that she had created similar misunderstandings in the past. Merim glared angrily at her opponent and said that the mere sight of the monster annoyed her. Belgadia calmly replied that it was the girl who created this body. Merim said that she didn't believe in this nonsense because previously she could only create 150th level dolls, which were all the more impossible to be endowed with intelligence. The robot replied that the girl was certainly right. But then the witch asked what would happen if such a useless doll had a soul. After a brief silence, Belgadia looked up and suggested that suppose an old witch were to be placed in this body. Then the robot's aura intensified manifold. Merim looked fearfully at her opponent, not realizing what was happening. Suddenly, the girl realized who was across from her and opened her mouth in amazement. Belgadia explained that because her soul had been sealed in this world, due to the forbidden arts, her level had been augmented by the power of this doll. The witch now had a level 450. She looked at the student calmly and added that the girl would have to answer for sealing her soul. Merim knelt down in surprise and asked if she was talking to the master. After the robot nodded its head, the girl wondered what the witch was doing here. At the same moment, the doll headed towards the child and replied that it was obvious. Belgadia said she was ready to teach a lesson to one foolish and negligent student. Hearing these words, Merim lowered her head and trembled, repeating after her teacher. Then, barely holding back tears, she looked at the witch and cried out that all she wanted to do was save her master from death. The girl stood up and said with clenched fists that she had no magical abilities, so she had to make a deal with someone who could save Belgadia from death. 
Doll looked at the student upset and said she understood why she did it. However, the witch then said that she had never asked anyone for anything like that. The witch looked at the surprised Merim and explained that death was the natural end of every living creature's life. And a true magician must accept the laws of the universe. However, her favorite student and daughter broke all these laws and became a follower of the new god. In doing so, the girl deprived her mother of all the privileges that come with the normal departure of a soul from this world. After a short pause, the witch sighed and asked if Merim remembered what she had told her before she died. At that time, Belgadia wanted very much for the girl to live a good, happy life and not dwell on the past. Merim sighed and said that she had originally understood the master's will, but had never been able to accept it. Dahl clenched her fists and said she could see it. The witch then spewed a tremendous amount of energy from her body and said that as a master, it was her duty to insist her apprentice to the true path. She would not give up on it, even if she had to die again. With those words, Belgadia swiftly attacked Merim. The huge dog immediately reacted and covered his mistress from the blow. Immediately afterward, there was a massive explosion in the air. Staring into the dust cloud, Merim couldn't tell if her creature was alive. But then two bright eyes flashed in the darkness. The monster burst out of the cloud and pounced on its opponent. Belgadia had time to react and put her blade hand out in front of her, blocking the blow with her claws. Then she pushed the dog and tossed it aside. Despite the apparent equality of power, there was a clear advantage in the witch's hands, which was the presence of magic. Dahl counterattacked the enemy, creating a huge fireball. There was no way the dog could block such an attack, so he only jumped aside. The witch fired a few more shots, however the monster dodged time after time. Realizing the futility of the venture, Belgadia made a few maneuvers and found herself behind enemy lines. Examining the dog's back leg, she saw that there was something that looked like a reactor or core on it. The witch immediately rushed towards the object, extending her arm with the embedded blade in front of her. The blade effortlessly passed through the metal sensor and pierced it. Sensing this, the huge dog turned around in the direction of the adventurer standing aside. The boys looked helplessly at the creature they were not destined to defeat. But at the same instant, a witch moved directly towards them, realizing who the enemy was targeting. Immediately, the cannon's reactor glowed brightly in the dog's mouth. Belgadia reacted instantly and slapped her hand on the ground, creating a wall of ice between the adventurers and the monster. Already a second later, the dog fired at his opponents. An energy beam of incredible strength swept away the pavement around it, forming a huge vortex. However, the barrier remained intact. Astonished, Ayn turned to Belgadia and said she was just an incredible fighter. Immediately, however, he stared at the doll's body in horror. The blade that was replacing one of the witch's hands was covered in cracks. Chips were also visible all over the witch's body. It seemed as if the doll was about to fall apart. But Belgadia didn't seem to care at all. The witch explained that the number one forbidden technique was called I am the Seed of Destruction. This technique had been thought of at the very last moment. With this thought, the old woman looked at her hand. Belgadia said that the point of this technique is that it will raise her level until she dies. With her past strike, the witch had managed to damage this wolf's mechanism. Now his ability won't work against someone who raises his level in exchange for life. Looking at her crack-covered hand, Belgadia was glad that her long journey would finally come to an end. Moreover, in her final moments, she will teach a lesson to a student who will surely remember it forever. After saying that, the witch turned to the rest of the adventurers and asked them to deal with the girl while she herself fought the wolf. Ain and Mina shouted that they understood and immediately pounced on their opponent. The swordsman was the first to try to hit the girl, but she managed to put up a protective barrier. A stunned Merim looked at the master and motioned for her to stop. However, the witch pounced on the monster at the same second. She delivered a fist strike to the creature's jaw, saying that every masterpiece has its flaws, which means it is possible to defeat it. The witch then looked at Mill and asked if she agreed, and at the same time, the girl who possessed only level 10 pierced the sensor on the monster's leg with her blade. Immediately afterward, Mill used an ability called Thunder Flash. Immediately, the wolf's entire body skewed from the energy release. From the ensuing explosion, Mill couldn't stay on her feet and her body was thrown backwards. Now, the device responsible for lowering the opponent's levels was finally destroyed. Belgadia walked over to the girl who was just getting up from the ground and praised her. After that, the witch increased her level even more and glared angrily at the monster. It was her turn to give the wolf cub the final blow. Meanwhile, the adventurers were holding back Merim, unable to do anything about what was happening. The witch pronounced that all the girl has to do is watch her wolf be destroyed and Ark save this whole world. 
Merim gaped her mouth open in horror and watched the teacher helplessly. Belgadia rushed towards the creature, shouting that very soon she would finally be free. The girl tried with her last strength to stop the wizard, shouting that she shouldn't do that. The apprentice tried to convince her opponents that she would have nothing to live for after the master's death. Belgadia replied that it was time for the girl to stop talking nonsense. She remembered the day she had picked up her daughter by the river. She wondered for a long time if she could be a good mother to the child. But nevertheless, the old witch made up her mind and took the girl in. Belgadia concentrated on her opponent and said that she saved the child and gave her a beautiful name for the one to live a happy life. In that same instant, the sorceress began to raise her level to unbelievable levels. She said that as a master, she was obliged to save her student from evil. The monster immediately pounced on its opponent. The witch swung around and prepared to deliver a single blow. Shouting that it was time to call it a day, Belgadia attacked the wolf a second later with incredible force. The explosion that occurred at the same moment created several shockwaves that spread throughout the room. The adventurers and Merim watched in horror as debris from the walls and ceiling flew in different directions. Mill, who was even closer to the epicenter of the explosion, gagged and helplessly covered herself with her hand. Moments later, only Belgadia remained in the center of the battlefield. The doll then turned around and looked at her daughter. Her body had already begun to crumble. The witch asked the girl to give the world another chance. Merim's mind immediately flashed back to dozens of good memories from her life with her mother. The girl screamed the witch's name, barely holding back tears and not believing what was happening. At the same moment, however, another explosion occurred in the center of the room. Belgadia's body shattered into tiny pieces. Merim lowered her head and sobbed. Now that even the master's soul had left this world, she was alone again, just as she had been then by the river. Meanwhile, Ark was moving swiftly down the corridor toward the final room. At some point, he found that his level had recovered again. He seemed to be out of range of the energy field. That added to the guy's confidence, and he looked straight ahead of him. Right in front of Ark were the next doors. Now he was confident that he would stop Valm for the life of all mankind. Bursting into the aisle, he shouted his opponent's name. Right in front of him, Valm was sitting on the edge of a brightly burning bowl. When he saw Ark, he said the boy was late, and that was unfortunate. Smiling, the villain explained that the preparations for the ritual had already been completed. Swinging his legs and throwing his head back, he laughed and shouted that the new god of this world was finally here. However, the protagonist still did not move from his seat. This surprised the villain very much, and he jumped off the bowl. The madman looked at his opponent and said that he was amazed that even though the adventurer's attempt had failed, the kid still wanted to challenge him. Veins immediately appeared on Volm's arms. He swung around and said it was time for the forbidden technique number 100. As he soared into the air, the fiend asked God to let sinful men know suffering. At the same instant, a strange magical circle began to form over the demon's head. Volm looked at the boy and said it was his time to crack before the majesty of the new god. The madman laughed loudly as a blob of incomprehensible mass formed behind his back. Suddenly, something burst out from inside the ball of strange consistency. It was something that looked like a very dense blood mass that had logical sizes and shapes. The red matter soared high into the air and hung above the stunned Ark. Volm said solemnly that at last the true god of sinful humanity, responsible for all pain and suffering, had come to their world. And the name of this creature was the Abyss of Evil. More and more hands kept bursting out of the huge mass of meat. However, then some of the limbs suddenly began to fall off and fall to the ground. Volm, who saw this, looked puzzled at what had happened. He had never seen anything like this in the ancient folios he had read. The entire huge carcass slumped to the ground. Ark asked why the creature had become so shapeless. Arms that had a very flimsy and fluid appearance continued to grow out of the dense mass. Volm also didn't understand why this was happening, since he had done everything as instructed. But suddenly, a realization came to him. It seemed, as the madman had suspected, that he simply didn't have enough blood. Apparently, because the blood crystal wasn't powered up all the way, the ritual failed. But suddenly, an inhuman voice spoke out that it was not, and right in front of the protagonist, there was a massive explosion. Ark covered himself with his hand against the air currents and looked straight ahead in bewilderment. The biomass lying on the ground began to gradually come to life and become covered in strange crystals. The boy saw images in the matter that once again confirmed that he had encountered something unfathomable. Suddenly, a strange face appeared in the center of the huge dark mass. The creature finally took its final form. It was a huge body with an immeasurable number of arms, above which hung a golden circle like a wheel. 
It was in this image that the god of pain and suffering appeared before the observers, possessing an incredible one and a half thousandth level. Ark, who had opened the information panel, looked at his opponent's data in amazement and gaped in horror. Neither at this moment nor under any other conditions did he have a chance to overpower this enemy. The creature said that the imperfect forbidden techniques had caused his body to become so ugly, shapeless, and rotted. But then the god spread his largest limbs out to the sides and shouted that even in this form he would succeed in plunging this world into an abyss of despair. Flying around the monster, Valm said that was correct. And even though the ritual didn't go according to plan, the result was still excellent. The madman then offered his master the use of his body as a vessel. Valm looked at Ark and said that if the boss fused with him, they would have no problem defeating these people. However, the god of suffering swung his hand at the same second and slammed his servant's body into the wall with all his might. Ark was still staring at his opponent in amazement, being overwhelmed by such incredible power. The monster replied to his awakener that he could manage without some pathetic worms. He didn't need human helpers. The villain looked at the lord perplexed, not understanding what was going on. He then shouted that the god of suffering had no right to say such things to him. The madman said the monster couldn't handle a body like that without him. He asked what his role was as a loyal subject in the destruction of this world. The creature replied that the man had already had the great honor of being reborn into this world, so let the wretched creature be proud. Valm gritted his teeth in anger, disagreeing with every word God said. Then, he instantly activated forbidden techniques numbered 24, 63, and 78. After that, the madman's body transformed. Abandoned by his god, the madman shouted that he would show the monster how imperfect he was in front of humans. With those words, Valm directed a huge magic beam towards his master. However, the creature didn't even turn toward the pathetic little man. Suddenly, the god of suffering used the purification skill while saying that no mortal was unworthy to touch his face. After saying those words, to the horror of both people, the beam of magic simply vanished into thin air. Suddenly, one of the hands rushed toward the uncomprehending Valm with incredible speed and squeezed him tightly. The god of suffering looked at the man and said that since he owned all the pain in the world, it would not be difficult for him to bestow his mercy on a faithful follower. However, the wretched worm should not expect anything privileged. Any mortal should realize who he is dealing with. After that, Volm's body was illuminated by a bright light coming from somewhere in the ceiling. The madman shouted that he would never accept it, for his summoning was to sow in pain with his patron. Volm argued that he didn't deserve it, but the god interrupted him, saying that all mortals are equal before him. Then he repeated again that he would give his faithful servant something incredible. Then he said again that he would give his faithful servant something incredible. Making sure the ritual was done, the god tossed the man aside. As he fell to the ground, Volm immediately tried to get up, saying that it hurt a lot. His whole body was covered with strange scars. Suddenly, the protagonist saw how the absolute madman, who had previously shown no emotion towards the people he was killing, was now crying like a child. The man looked at his body and saw that his trembling hands were covered in crystals growing from within. The pain of what was happening was so incredible that suddenly, Volm started begging God to stop it, saying that he might just kill him. The monster said that the follower was beginning to forget who he had awakened. It was not his duty to bring death, but only to bestow suffering. Immediately afterward, purple crystals began to sprout from the madman's entire body. He jumped to his feet and, throwing his head back, screamed with renewed vigor. What was happening right in front of him convinced Ark that further battle would be on the verge of impossible. Now the adept of all forbidden techniques, Volm Fortin got what he deserved for the atrocities he had committed. However, the protagonist could no longer watch everything that was happening. The guy decided that since their moral principles did not converge, he would show mercy and grant the enemy salvation. With those words, Ark stabbed Valm in the back with his blade. The madman fell almost silently dead to the ground. The armor announced to the wearer that since Valm Fortin was the creator of the forbidden technique, the level up restriction was lifted upon his death. Hearing this, the protagonist ordered his level to be raised to its maximum levels. Suddenly, the guy heard a rumble right in front of him and immediately opened his eyes. The god of suffering bowed before him and looked at the man. Ark told the armor that he would need all available reserves to win. Suddenly, hearing this, no human voice said that all efforts were futile. The monster rose to his full height once more and said that no human could defeat the deity. Immediately after these words, one of the monster's arms cracked and fell off. She flew helplessly to the ground and crashed with a horrible squelch. Unexpectedly, Ark about the armor commented on the situation. 
the low voice noted with disdain that such a wretched wretch was unworthy to be called God. Immediately afterward, dozens of levels acquired by the protagonist started flying out of the body of the defeated Volm. The boy looked puzzled at what the armor had done. A voice announced the absorption and said that the wearer was level 710th. Plus, there were an additional 500 points in the vault. In the same second, two panels appeared in front of the guy's face. Armor offered the recommended skill and weapon for defeating God. The system offered Ark a divine ascension that cost nothing. In addition, the second panel had a special sword called Divine Eclipse that cost 400 levels. The guy was greatly surprised that one of the skills offered was not worth anything at all. In the same second, the monster shouted that he was a god, bringing terror and suffering to people in his perfect image. In the next instant, the monster's arm came down on Ark. Seeing this, the protagonist realized that he should deal with the cost of the ability a little later. For now, his main problem was still the seemingly invincible god. The boy jumped aside, and at the same moment the creature's arm collapsed to the floor where he had been standing a second ago. Armor said he needed the owner's approval to purchase a divine eclipse weapon. The guy sent a confirmation and immediately put his hand out to the side. He was now in possession of something that could kill a god himself. One of the hands immediately reacted to the protagonist's maneuver and pounced on him. Ark changed direction in midair and flew past the limb, slicing it in half. Suddenly, the flesh of the monster, whose level was much higher than the guy's, succumbed to the impact and shattered into pieces. Ark landed on the ground and watched the huge biomass fall right in front of him. The hero realized that with this sword he would be able to chop the monster to pieces. Pointing his blade at his opponent, the guy said that if the monster liked pain and suffering so much, he was willing to grant it to him in its pristine form. However, the god of suffering looked indifferently at the blade and said that it was just a waste of time. Then he lowered his eyes and added that no human could ever attain the strength to kill a deity. According to the monster, humans are created to glorify them. In turn, the gods bestow their favor or cruelty on their followers, and no one has ever provided the reverse analogy before. Hearing this, Ark swung his sword and said that they could check it out. He waved his head in the direction of the severed limb and added that he had already managed to cut off one arm. So it was only a matter of time. After saying that, the monster kneeled down. He said that since the wretched little man had dared to trespass on God's body, he should be punished severely. Something like a strange aura began to form around the creature's hands. The God of Suffering said that anyone who was not his follower became a common sinner to him. The monster shouted that it was his duty to banish such pathetic humans from this world. At the same moment, blue rays flew into Ark's body one after another. The boy struggled to dodge the numerous blows. He realized that even though the monster's body had almost completely rotted away, the difference in their levels hadn't gone anywhere. After assessing the full power of the God of Suffering's blows, Ark came to the conclusion that a single blow could make a corpse out of him. Suddenly, the armor told the wearer it had a message. A low voice reported the decrease in the enemy's stats. At this moment, the level of the God of Suffering had decreased to 1,450 units. Dodging the incessant attacks, Ark wondered why this was happening. Armor replied that there were fragments of blood crystal in the hand the wielder had cut off. It is these small shards that summarily give the monster such immense power and infuse it with divine energy. The crystal fragments are located all over the enemy's body, and if the bearer can cut off the parts where these stones are located, the monster's level will drop significantly. After this message, Ark was finally able to decide on his battle tactics. Now he had to get to the limb somehow to cut off all the crystals once and for all. The armor immediately confirmed what was said, and the protagonist swiftly pounced on his opponent. With a few maneuvers, the guy approached the first limb and swung his sword. With a powerful blow, he severed the arm, and the armor announced another drop in his opponent's level. The creature, for its part, seemed to have no intention of responding to such attacks. Ark took advantage of this and began chopping one limb after another. His attention was also drawn to the bright glow in the center of the suffering god's chest. Deciding that there is some sort of core there, storing the crystal's energy, the protagonist decided to attack the place. After a swift sweep of his blade, the armor also announced a drop in level, confirming Ark's speculation. The boy jumped back to catch his breath. The work was going well so far, but suddenly Ark realized that he was really screwed. Two huge limbs pounced on him and the lad had no choice but to retreat. The god of suffering looked at his opponent and was silent for a few seconds. Then he was surprised that the man had figured out how to weaken his power. At the same moment, all the wounds Ark had created healed. God said that all the attempts of the wretched worm were in vain. He cocked his head up triumphantly and said that it was time for the mortal to recognize and accept his punishment. 
A second later, the circle above the monster's head turned around and directed a huge purple beam at the protagonist. The god of suffering shouted that such sinful people had no right to live in his world. A brightly glowing orb flew towards Ark at an incredible speed. The protagonist realized that he had no chance to dodge, but suddenly the orb opened into several beams that formed a cage-like shape. The frightened guy thought that he had already weakened his opponent a lot already, however. Apparently it wasn't enough. After thinking over the situation, the protagonist realized that he had no election. He shouted for the armor to give him all the levels available in the vault. However, at the same instant, the light beams converged and formed an explosion where the guy was. But suddenly the flash dissipated and the body of the hero appeared in its place. The god of suffering was very surprised that the man was still alive. Meanwhile, Ark threw his head back in pain and screamed violently. The armor announced that there was nothing left in the vault, and the protagonist was now level 910. The god of suffering didn't even move, and at the same moment, a bright scarlet ray flew towards him. Ark moved at an incredible speed while still screaming in pain. With his blade, he began slashing the monster's limbs with renewed vigor. After a few blows, the monster realized he never solved the problem with the pathetic human. Waving several hands at once, he said that he was disgusted with the sinner who tries to attain God's power for no reason, going into a beastly rage. The limbs then swung towards the protagonist. The monster added that he would not tolerate such treatment of himself and his power. However, Ark escaped all of his opponent's attacks without the slightest difficulty. After just a couple seconds, he was right in the face of the god of suffering. The creature tried to cover itself with its limbs so as not to lose the battle completely. Ark began to land punches on its arms. A few more seconds passed before all of the suffering god's limbs were severed. He now only had a mere 1,040th level. Realizing that the enemy could no longer block his attacks, the guy rushed to his chest and pierced the crystal that was there. After that, the armor said that the god of suffering had once again received a decrease in stats and was now level 950. The monster used one of his few remaining hands and attempted to strike Ark, but he dodged. The boy looked at his opponent and realized that his mind was beginning to go blank. His thoughts were jumbled and his body was turning inside out from the pain. Mashinally maneuvering away from the monster's continued counterattacks, the protagonist wondered what was happening to him. In the flurry of battle, the armor said that the wearer's body had reached its physical limit. The voice added that if the battle continued, it would cause irreparable damage to itself. Ark tossed his sword aside and stood in place with his head tilted back. He thought he wanted to do something, but he no longer remembered what it was. The god of suffering realized that he had a great chance to deal with his rival. He said that the sinner had given in to primal desires, and that was very foolish of him. The monster approached the man and said that only death could cleanse him. The man's body emitted incredible power, so the god of suffering did not dare to touch him, hoping that he would die on his own. It was as if Ark's body was at the center of a scarlet red vortex. The guy was still trying to remember what was so important he wanted to do. But then he came to the conclusion that it looked like he was finished after all. But at the same moment, the rest of the adventurers arrived at the battlefield. They are horrified to discover that an unknown creature of incredible size is bent over the defenseless protagonist who has fallen into madness. Ayn began to call out to Ark in desperation, screaming to stop this force from consuming his thoughts. Mill and Mana also began to encourage their boss, telling him not to give up in any way. Only Marim remained impassive. Staring at the floor, she was still thinking that this man was responsible for her master's death. Master Garay shouted that Ark should remember who he really was. Through the madness gripping his mind, the protagonist heard familiar voices. At that very second, his hands shook. The guy started struggling, remembering more and more facts. Suddenly, Ark clenched his fist and thought he had finally gotten to the truth. He asked the armor to release all the levels from the vault, and that power consumed his mind. With that thought, the protagonist finally regained control of his body. He lowered himself to the ground and straightened up, glaring hatefully at the opponent opposite him. Ark bent down and picked up his sword from the ground. Just then, he asked the armor how much longer his body could hold on. The voice replied that at this rate, the lad would not be able to last more than a single blow. Ark said he understood and added that that should be enough time for him. The god of suffering said he was amazed at how man could fight such things as madness. After that, the monster looked at his opponent and said that it was time for him to prove who was stronger. With a wave of his hands, the god of suffering ordered the sinner to come over here. The glowing circle above his head lit up even more. The creature said that mortals were never capable of killing a god. It was a taboo that no one could ever break. 
At this moment, his power was simply terrifying. The God of Suffering said that they would decide everything here and now. Before entering the fight, the guy opened the information panel. It said that it took a minute to replenish energy and use the Lord's Punishment ability. It was disappointing information, however, the guy thought he could handle it. Ark decided that while the energy was building up, he would use the wings of Seraphim's sword. The armor, however, forbade him to do so. Deciding that now was not the time to clarify the reason, Ark prepared for battle, realizing that there was no other way out. Now he had to dodge the attacks for the next minute to decide the outcome of the fight with a single blow. With that thought, the protagonist activated the energy gathering for the Lord's Kara. The monster once again created an energy field in his hands, saying that it didn't matter what power a mortal had. He shot a multitude of rays into the sky, saying that no man could ever defeat God himself. At the same moment, the creature ripped several huge boulders out of the ground. The stones immediately began to fall on Ark, who tried to dodge them in every possible way. The God of Suffering said that these attempts were foolish, as he could not be killed. He tried to convince the guy that even if his body was dead, his spirit would never disappear from this world. Ark replied sharply that he didn't care about that at all. The monster said in bewilderment that he didn't understand why people wasted energy on pointlessness and why they couldn't just accept the inevitable. Ark replied that those words sounded very blunt, for if he surrendered, those dear to him would suffer at the hands of the monster. The guy then looked angrily into his opponent's eyes and said that he was fighting for the bright future of all mankind. At the end, he added that he himself was the master of his own destiny, and no entity could instruct him what to do next. Immediately, the monster attacked the protagonist, saying that all humans were very stupid. By that time, the skill charge was 30%. The boy was successfully maneuvering away from the shots when the monster's arms entered the fray. Ark didn't have time to react to the sudden use of physical attacks by his opponents. Just then, his body flew across the room after a powerful blow and slammed into the wall. Numerous hands that grew straight from the body of the God of Suffering immediately rushed towards the disoriented adventurer. Realizing that he was finally in control, the monster said it was time for the suicide bomber to say goodbye to his life. His limbs then slammed into the wall in front of the terrified adventurers. But suddenly, a bright purple light flashed in the dust cloud. The protagonist immediately burst out of it. The boy said that the God of Suffering was right about something because it was really time for them to say goodbye. Ark began to accelerate down the monster's outstretched arm. By then, the ability charge was at 82%. All of the monster's hands were near the wall and had no way of reacting to the approaching enemy. Being right next to the creature's face, Ark swung his sword and said that this time it was over. Armor announced a 100% charge of the ability as the blade already approached the forehead of the God of Suffering. The sword entered the monster's face without difficulty. The creature once again reminded the man that God could not die at his mortal hands. However, at that very second, there was an explosion of incredible proportions that blew the creature's face apart. There was nothing left of the head of the God of Suffering. His huge body finally swayed and fell to the ground. The fight was over. After a while, the adventurers walked down the corridors, gradually moving away from the final room. Ayn was dragging Ark's not-so-light body in his arms. The adventurer was breathing hard, but he kept moving. Mana saw that her partner was getting uneasy carrying the protagonist, and offered to help. She said that even though she had put a spell on Ark's body beforehand to reduce his weight, it could be seen that Ayn was still having a hard time carrying him with those wounds. However, the green-haired adventurer flatly refused to help. He said that although Valm had been defeated, it was still a mausoleum with dozens of monsters lurking in it. Ayn said that those who were not injured in the battle should be on guard, and he himself would keep an eye on Ark. Suddenly, the ceiling behind the traveler's backs cracked and something fell out of it. It was another desolate cursed. The only thing that remained unclear was what he was doing outside the dungeon. Jiraeus, who was already beginning to be annoyed by these creatures, was surprised that the monsters were hoping to handle them. But suddenly, several more of the same cursed ones sprinkled from the same hole in the room. The old adventurer looked at the monsters in bewilderment as they began their attack. Cutting through the flesh of his opponents with incessant blows, Gairi shouted that there were too many of them and he needed help. Mena also entered the battle. Using explosive magic, she joined the guildmaster. The old man shouted that they should never let the monsters near the arch. However, the enemies were getting bigger and bigger. Girai shouted in horror that they would definitely break through at this rate. A few monsters that the adventurers didn't have time for did make their way to the rest of the group. Ian looked at the creatures worriedly. He realized that the situation was rather dire. 
But suddenly, Mill came out to fight the opponents. The boy looked at the girl in bewilderment. She said in a trembling voice that she would not let the creatures break through any further. Three weakened versions of the desolate cursed were advancing on Mill. She explained that Ark had single-handedly defeated the god himself and saved everyone from being killed. However, now the life of the protagonist hung in the balance, because if he is not assisted, he will never wake up. So it was time for the people he saved to protect him. And Mill also felt a responsibility. A second after saying that, the girl made a powerful throw, slashing all three opponents at once. Ein looked at what had happened with confusion. He couldn't believe that an adventurous who had been very weak not long ago had done such a thing. It was a technique from the lightning strike technique called Thunderflash. Seeing her partner's surprise, Mill said that she hadn't wasted her time all this time. And indeed, the girl now had an incredible hundredth level. Ain asked if Mill had been able to make that kind of progress in one hike. The girl smiled and said she did, though she added that the epic skill she had learned came to her aid. Ain was greatly surprised that Mill had raised her level with such ease. He had never experienced such rapid progress before, except in the case of Ark. Ein looked at his partner and thought about the situation. He was now confident that this girl would become a similarly strong adventurer in the future. Meanwhile, Gureus was finishing off the last of the monsters. Finishing with a surprise attack, the old man turned around and ordered Ein to hurry up. They had to get out of here before more monsters came rumbling in. A few minutes passed and the group successfully made it to the exit. The surviving adventurers were waiting for them there. Ein explained the situation, saying that to save Ark, he would have to use his epic skill Life Splitting. This ability will transfer life energy from a donor to another person, but only with the consent of the giver. He explained that this skill would drain anyone here of so much energy that that person would not be able to fight for days. Ein clenched his fist and said that it was still the only option in which they would be able to save Ark. He then bowed to the adventurers and asked them to help him. The boy didn't hope for anything, because these men had already given a lot of their strength to do what they were ordered to do. They had lost many of their comrades in the process. However, then cheers of approval were heard in the crowd. People said that it was no problem for them. Ein looked hopefully at those present. The knights and mages standing right in front of him smiled, confirming their intentions. One of the adventurers said that the protagonist saved them all from imminent doom. They realized they couldn't have done it without Ark's help, so they don't spare anything for the sake of such a hero. Hearing this, Ain lowered his head and tried not to cry. He then extended his hand to the adventurer standing closest to him and thanked them all. After that, the men held hands and stood around Ark's body. Ein sat down and began to perform the ritual. Creating a small magical orb above the main character's chest, he activated the life-splitting ability. The people around immediately felt that something was beginning to happen to their bodies. However, holding their hands, they tried their best not to fall. Ein A.S. a guide had to transmit all this energy. He realized that all these people were some of the strongest adventurers, so he was receiving a lot of life energy. However, even that wasn't enough to bring Ark back to this world. Besides, Ayn lied about something. Previously, he had used this skill to heal the wounds of his allies. However, the adventurer had never used it to bring someone back to life. Looking at his partner's face, Ayn thought that he had already lost many comrades. Now he couldn't let that happen again. The energy vortex from the ability increased manifold. Ein decided that he would do his best. He realized that he would have to give up most of his life energy to Ark to do so. However, the boy didn't stop. After a while, the protagonist opened his eyes. He saw the desert in front of him. As he lifted himself up, he thought that he was still fighting God. But then, it was as if his mind had been clouded. At that moment, something heavy crashed to the ground next to Ark. The boy turned around and was horrified to find that it was Ain. He stared motionless at his friend's body and realized that he had stopped breathing. A few seconds ago, Ein stood with his arms stretched out straight in front of him. When enough energy had been gathered, he channeled all the life force into his friend's body. But suddenly, the atmosphere around him changed. The boy looked puzzled, staring straight ahead. Suddenly, he found himself in some completely empty space. There was not a single object around him. The adventurer continued to stand in the same pose, not realizing what had happened to him. Suddenly, he realized he couldn't feel his body. At the same second, some noise started behind his back. Streams of bright energy began to swim past the stunned Ein. Then the sound of human footsteps notified the adventurer that someone was standing behind him. Suddenly, a human voice asked Ein if he was going to die. It was only then that the realization came to the boy what had happened to him after all. Gathering his thoughts, he said he didn't care at all. 
The strange voice said that even if Ein was going to die anyway, he thought it was foolish to sacrifice himself for someone. The image of a dead friend surfaced in front of the adventurer's face. The guy said he didn't care about other people's opinions, and he didn't want to lose any more comrades. Essence shrugged and said that Ein was very troubled after all. The creature then snuggled up to the guy from behind, saying that it didn't want the adventurer to die. The spirit then stabbed Ein in the back and told him that he would have to give up some of his life energy. Streams of glowing matter immediately poured into the empty space where Ark should have been lying. The unknown man said he'd do anything for the jerk prince. Ein grinned and apologized to the entity. The voice responded by saying that the guy didn't owe him anything. However, that would only be half the help. After all, Ein will have only days to live if he shares his life. The boy said that it didn't matter to him at all now that he was sacrificing his life. The spirit responded by saying that this was not true, for he could still be saved. And for this adventurer, we'll need to use the help of friends who are always with him. The entity then turned around and headed in the other direction, telling Ein that they would see each other again. The spirit waved its hand and vanished into space, adding lastly that it would certainly wait for the boy on Ripialam Earth. Meanwhile, Ark was still looking at his friend's body in horror. Gathering his thoughts, he rushed over to Ein, but Mill immediately stopped him. The girl squealed that the guy was trying to bring the protagonist back from the other side of the world. Those words had a very strong effect on Ark. He had no idea that he had died. However, he now had his first explanation for what Ain had done to the owl. Ark thought his partner had sacrificed his own life to save him. Not believing what was happening, the adventurer rushed to Ayn and began shaking him, yelling for him to come to his senses. But suddenly, Ark's attention was drawn to a strange apparition on his friend's face. It was a bluish-colored stain that covered all of Ayn's cheek and part of his neck. The angry protagonist asked the adventurers if any of them knew what was even going on here. However, no one here had ever encountered anything like this before. In desperation, Ark turned to Mana, saying that as a sorceress, surely she must know something about this. The girl looked at her frightened partner in bewilderment and then at the dead Ein, but then she clenched her fists frustratedly and turned away without saying anything in response. After a brief pause, the girl apologized and said she had no information about the phenomenon. Suddenly, a voice from the crowd said it was a sickness of the spirit. Then approaching footsteps were heard behind the backs of the adventurers. People looked around and saw the strange girl in front of them, who marveled at the fact that Durham's strongest adventurers had gathered here and no one had heard of it before. Suddenly, it appeared that it was not the stranger who was saying this, but the head in her hands. She said she was disappointed and added that spirit sickness was a mystical disease in which the body would be permanently destroyed. It turned out to be Merim holding Belgadia's head in her hands. The old sorceress said that it was because the man had borrowed a lot of strength from his guardian spirit. After the general stunnedness gradually began to pass, the witch looked away sadly and said that she didn't envy Ein. Ark looked at Belgadia in surprise, not understanding what had happened to her in that time. He asked why only the head was left of the enchantress. After that, there was silence in the air again. This tactless question made the witch boil up and angrily apologize for what had happened. After that, she said it was better to listen to her. According to the old woman, this disease can be cured. Ark was greatly relieved at what he heard, though he realized that the price of extraction would probably be high. Right after that, Belgadia actually looked towards the lying guy and said that it wasn't that simple. Now they needed to act as quickly as possible. Otherwise, this ailment will destroy the guy's body until all that is left of it is dust. She also appreciated that the disease was spreading very quickly, meaning that Ayn didn't have much time left. When asked by the Arch how long they were talking about, Belgadia replied that the boy had less than a week to live. The shocked adventurers looked at the witch, not believing what she said. A short while later, the group reached the guild base of the Black Star of Hope Guild. Ein was alive, but his condition was gradually deteriorating. New spots appeared on his other cheek. Ark squeezed his friend's blue-tinged hand and asked him to bear with him a little longer. He promised that he would save the boy from the disease, but Belgadia, who was nearby, remarked that only spirits could help them in this situation. However, such creatures have not lived among humans for a long time. The only place where they can be found is the land of Ripialum. It is a spiritual retreat located on the very edge of the continent. The witch smiled and added that even the mere thought brought back wonderful memories, for she had previously been fortunate enough to visit there in her younger days. Ark repeated the witch's last sentence, jokingly marveling that this old woman also had youth. He said ironically that it must have been a century ago. Belgadia immediately ordered the brat to shut up. She explained that, be that as it may, 
Only in the spiritual lands of Repialum would they be able to find the cure to save Ein from destruction. Those words had a strong effect on Ark. He realized that this was going to be a difficult walk. At the same second, the door to the room opened abruptly. Lyra and Guraisan entered the room. The girl told the guild leader that they had already prepared the wagon. The old man came over and took the guy's body, saying he would take care of loading it. Gire then gave Ark a serious look and said that they would head out as soon as the guy here was done. The main character stood up and headed for the exit. Then he turned around and told Merim to follow him. After hearing this, the girl turned around, however, she never followed Ark. After hesitating for a few seconds, she stood up from her chair, looking awkwardly at her feet. The guy was very surprised by this situation and stopped right next to the exit. A while later, the girl still reluctantly headed in his direction. Walking up almost closely, she held out the guild leader's head to Belgadia, who looked at her apprentice stunned. The uncomprehending Ark asked what it meant. Merim said that adventurers should only take a witch's head on a hike. The girl explained that she would only get in their way. Belgadia asked the student what she was even saying. Then she realized it was too late to teach the girl and said Merim would do as she wished. Ark was thinking very hard about what was going on, trying to figure out how he could convince the girl to come with him. Then he smiled and asked Merim what the problem was in the first place. The girl shouted that in the Palmyra dungeon she had nearly killed them all. Ark looked at his interlocutor in bewilderment and explained that she was probably doing it all for Belgadia. Plus, the guy was confident that she personally hadn't even hurt anyone. Though, despite his speculation, the protagonist then wondered if the girl as Volm's former subordinate had really taken many lives and felt guilty for what she had done. The girl pressed her lips together and quickly shook her head from side to side. Merim replied that it wasn't like that at all. She said that she had never been able to kill innocents at someone else's behest. She also said that she had often lied to Volm about doing his bidding. Merim grinned and said that she was the most common weakling who was incapable of completing even the simplest task. Ark smiled and said that in that case he didn't see any problem with it. The guy then extended his hand to his interlocutor and offered her a ride with them. He also said that he was sure Belgadia would not mind such company, to which the witch emphatically agreed. After hearing this, the girl smiled and became embarrassed. She reached out and shook the guy's hand, agreeing to ride along with them. After the handshake, Ark asked thoughtfully if Merim had stripped Belgadia of her body when the two of them fought against each other. The witch explained that she had used a forbidden technique to overpower her student. However, as her own surprise, her head detached from her body and the rest of the body simply exploded. Just then, Lyra ran into the room, wondering if the others were coming with them. Ark headed towards the exit with his companions, saying they were on their way. The uncharted spiritual lands of Repialum and new adventures awaited them. After a while, a wagon driven by Giraisan came out of the portal. Ark, Mill, Lyra, Mina, Merim, and Belgadia were also seated in the horse-drawn cart. In the middle between the heroes lay the gradually dying Ein. Ark looked sadly at his friend, not realizing what lay ahead of them. Belgadia decided to distract the dulled boy by saying that she had only teleported them to the outskirts of the spiritual land's territory. You can't just use magic to get there. After that, Ark looked around and saw clouds outside. He asked the witch if she was sure she had teleported them to the spirit land. Belgadia asked what was wrong. To which the guy replied that from what she had heard, the land of Repelium was a place where nature reigned supreme and crystal clear rivers flowed. However, there was literally nothing where they got to. Merim lifted the witch's head and she looked around. She said it was really strange because there used to be endless meadows and fields. Suddenly, Gurai, who was driving the wagon, sensed something wrong. He suddenly ordered the group to get ready and be on guard. The old man explained that if Belgadia was indeed right and they were very close to the spiritual land, they were definitely not expected here. Immediately afterward, a dark shroud covered the sky, gradually laying down on the ground. Ark looked up at the fog in surprise. Gurai asked the squad leader how they would proceed and if they should venture into this unknown. Ark said they need to go there anyway, but added that he realizes they don't know what to expect there. The old man explained that there were those in their squad who had absolutely no combat experience and didn't even know how to fight, so it all sounded like an unnecessary risk. Suddenly, Lyra interrupted him and told him that everything was fine and they could go. She explained that Ainu didn't have long to live anyway. So now, as true adventurers, they must take every opportunity to save their friend from death. In addition, Lyra added that she was now surrounded by the strongest people she knew, so she wasn't afraid for her own life at all. Ark realized that the girl had no idea of the difficulties she would face and tried to contradict her. However, then he smiled and realized that she really had nothing to fear. 
The guy then turned to Geary and said that they were willing to risk everything. The protagonist was sure that it was the land of Rifialum that was behind this mist that descended upon the land. Afterward, to show the old man his determination, he added that they had no right to retreat. The supreme adventurer clenched the reins tighter and said that he had heard everything perfectly well. Then the old man whipped the horses, which immediately sped even faster. The old man told the passengers to hold on tight, for from now on their trip promised to be a hot one. Immediately after these words, the wagon drove into a thick bluish fog. Around them, lightning flashed and rumbles rumbled constantly. Shocks of discharged energy pounded the ground not far from the wagon. The frightened horses surprisingly maintained their usual pace and did not swerve out of the way. Ark looked out of the cart and said that he thought they were only a short distance from their destination. Suddenly, a sharp roll of thunder sounded right above their wagon. Immediately afterward, a bolt of lightning shot downward. A second before the hit, the protagonist looked up and realized there was no escaping the danger. The next instant, the wagon was struck by a blow of terrible force. The cart was immediately smashed to pieces, and Ark was thrown aside by the shockwave. The guy did a few somersaults before he found himself on the ground among the pieces of wood. The protagonist's entire body ached after the fall. He struggled to get up and swore. Looking directly in front of him, Ark came to a complete realization. Opposite was a bear field, in the center of which stood a huge tree. He wondered if this was the Repialum. Suddenly, an inhuman scream pierced his head. Then an unknown voice said in surprise that the man had managed to get here after all. Turning around, Ark saw the monster attacking him right in front of him. The boy jumped to his feet and recoiled, surprised that such a creature was in such a place. However, the protagonist had no sooner swung his blade than the monster was immediately struck by someone else. Ark stood frozen as he saw an unknown man appear out of nowhere right in front of him. The stranger waved his sword and welcomed the traveler to Repialum. Slipping the weapon back into its scabbard, the unknown man introduced himself as the first prince of the spirit lands named Falk. Then he turned around and looked at the uncomprehending protagonist with a smile. Falk told the traveler that he had been waiting for him very much all this time. After the rest of the group got to their feet and recovered, the adventurers headed out to follow Falk Repialum. Their new acquaintance said he would escort the companions to a safe place to leave Ein. Then he looked at the adventurer's body and grinned. As the prince of the lands of Repialum had foreseen, the lad is sure to be rescued by his friends. Falk then laughed and said he was amused to watch the strangers ride through those storm clouds. Nevertheless, he was surprised that all the arrivals survived. Suddenly, Ark stopped and asked the stranger how he knew them all and including Ein. The spirit turned around and looked questioningly at the protagonist. He explained that it was a very old story, but travelers should listen to it. Once upon a time, the kingdoms of spirits and humans coexisted in the world. In order to maintain peaceful relations, the humans donated their technology to the spirits, and the spirits in turn swore to protect the humans and keep them safe. And that promise of peace lives on to this day. And the guarantors of peaceful coexistence between humans and spirits are Ein and Falk. After that, the prince explained that this particular guy had gotten an epic skill that was always related to Falk's power. However, the spirit had never personally granted Ein these powers. One day, he just wished that his portion would go to a man with a good heart. And that was the fate that forever linked Ewan and Falk. The spirit explained that the last time the adventurer had used his skill, he had learned everything from the guy's subconscious. So now the guy now has information about everything that happened with Ayn and who the people who came here are. Shrugging, Falk addressed Ark by name and said it was very simple. The stunned protagonist stared at the stranger for a few more seconds, trying to comprehend everything he had said. Suddenly, angry Ark asked the spirit why he hadn't stopped Ayn, since he had seen it all and knew the outcome. Falk waved his hand and said irritably that he had tried, but his advice was of no avail. He explained that at that moment, I knew and was willing to risk his life. However, Falk himself had intervened and lent his spiritual power, and thanks to that, the guy had at least survived. These words struck the protagonist to the core. Then Falk turned around and, waving his hand, said that when the asshole woke up, let the guy thank him for saving him. A short while later, the travelers arrived at the site. Mill looked around and said, It's just a simple wasteland. However, the spirit snapped his fingers and said my lady should take a closer look. The next instant, a passage appeared out of nowhere right in front of the travelers. The adventurers followed Falk, not realizing what lay ahead of them. As they entered the door, the travelers looked around in amazement. Falk pointed with his hand toward the beautiful forest the creatures walked through. He welcomed the travelers to what he called the last stronghold. The spirit explained that this was only a single scrap of what Repialum had originally been. Some time later, the adventurers reached the house. There, Ein was put back on the bed. 
Sitting next to him, Falk put a glowing hand to the boy's head. Immediately afterward, the blue spots that covered most of Ain's body instantly disappeared. Spirit squeezed his hand and analyzed the data collected. Then he exhaled and said that the guy was very lucky, as the disease had not had time to spread throughout his body. Falk looked at the travelers and said that now he had only to rest, because now his life was not threatened. The adventurers rejoiced greatly when they heard this information. Ark asked if it was really true. The spirit smiled and said he gave his word of honor. However, now Ein will have to stay here for a while. Even though Falk has cured him, the disease still keeps the guy from regaining consciousness. It is the spiritual forces of this land that will draw the remaining contagion out of his friend and restore him. Suddenly, the old witch's head said that she remembered this land as a place where spirits and nature lived in harmony with each other. Then she asked what it was about the desolate land they had seen. At this point, the spirit fell silent and groaned. It was clear from the look on his face that this was a very unpleasant story. Falk explained that 50 years ago a monster had invaded their territory. One touch of this monster made nature see, and animals die. The Duha had nicknamed this creature Galbadus. This monster was the worst of the worst and perhaps even the very embodiment of evil. Falk added that once he was in Owen's subconscious, he realized that those monsters the humans were fighting were followers of Galbadus. It was these brats that cursed the land where the spirits had lived all this time. The guy explained that the entire spiritual land was affected by the disease he was able to save Ein from. Ark wondered if there was no way to defeat this monster. Falk waved his hand nonchalantly and said it wasn't even worth thinking about, because Galbadus had a four-digit level. He wanted to say that there was no such person who could defeat this monster. But suddenly he stopped. The guy with a happy face turned to Ark and said that only he could help them. The protagonist responded to the spirit for saving his friend's life. That's why from this point on, Ark feels it's his duty to repay the spirit world in an appropriate manner. Suddenly, a frightened spirit ran into the room. He bowed to his majesty and said that there was an important message from outside. According to scouts, Mr. Galbadus' army has surrounded their hideout. Hearing this, Falk grabbed his head and said that he remembered that bastard for nothing. He then sighed and turned to the travelers. The prince of the spirit kingdom said that he didn't want to ask this of the people but they needed help to defend themselves. Ark replied that he had no problem being willing to help with that, but Falk had to answer him one question first. The adventurer asked why even the spirits call their opponent Lord. Realizing that there was absolutely no point in hiding it, the prince exhaled, saying that he would share the key information. Walking up close to Ark, Falk said that this monster was indeed named as he said, and it was this monster that destroyed the kingdom. However, the full name of their main opponent was Galbadus Repialum. Falk squinted slightly and said it was his father. Ark was greatly surprised that the Repialum Emperor was a monster. After saying this, Falk bowed his head. It was evident that he was very despondent. The spirit explained that his father had changed greatly. The entity inside him had destroyed his father. Falk assured everyone present that Galbadus was now nothing more than a common enemy to him, so there was no need to worry about him. Pointing to the door, the prince said it was time for them to go. The adventurers, along with their new companion, rushed to a specific location. Falk explained that the entrance was near and Galbadus' followers were on their way. Stopping in front of the adventurers, he explained that as soon as the gate opened, the battle would begin immediately. Taking his hand aside, the spirit explained that few would be able to fight in the location called the Last Garden. The spirit then put his hand out straight in front of him and wished the travelers good luck. Right in front of the protagonist, a huge portal opened up leading outside. The guy rushed into the resulting passage, shouting that all those monsters could be left to him. Moving to the surface, Ark stopped. The armor reported that he was at level 960. The voice also said that the host's body was adapting to the high levels and further absorption was possible. The guy grinned and said that was good to hear. Looking around, Ark saw a huge horde of unknown creatures right in front of him. He sighed and said that he had to get rid of these fools now. The monsters were the first to attack the opponents who escaped from the portal. Falk jumped out right in front of the squad, going for a counterattack. Gritting his teeth, he said it would take about ten minutes for these monsters. Besides, he was not about to surrender the last garden, which was the extreme barrier before the main settlement, to the enemy. With a swing of his blade, Falk struck the first creature that attacked him. After killing a few more monsters, the spirit thought that although he was an Ark, he was still a member of the royal family of Repialum, and some weaklings wouldn't be able to defeat him. Jureus was attacking the monsters on his flank in parallel. He answered Falk that unlike humans, spirits had no level restrictions and were even easier to evolve. 
after crushing the head of another opponent with his sword, the old man said that he was even slightly jealous about it. After chopping the last monster in half, Gyre noted that with his old bones, he wouldn't run a new level either. Falk grinned and said the old man was doing pretty well as it was. Meanwhile, on the other side of the defense, Meal and Main were working together. The sorceress attacked her opponents with a fire spell. However, some monsters jumped into the wave of fire and pounced on the girl from above. At the same second, her partner was covered by Mill, who used an ability called Thunderstrike Line. The young adventurer twirled the dagger in her hand and said that she wasn't going to die here so easily. However, there seemed to be no end to the enemies. More and more hordes continued to advance. Ark looked at the monsters with hatred and said that he would have to destroy them all at once. Turning around, he motioned for his partners to cover him in case of trouble. Falk and the adventurers nodded in response, and Ark thanked them for their understanding. After that, he bared his blade and charged at the advancing monster army with incredible speed. The level of the monsters wasn't even close to that of the protagonist. Nevertheless, the creatures continued to advance from all sides. However, this time, Ark could even afford to take some liberties and not immediately react to the attacks from the flanks. The more so because those weaklings wouldn't even be able to touch him. Suddenly, a monster that was several times the size of its brethren landed right in front of the guy's face. Ark was startled and swung his sword in surprise, slashing his opponent's throat before he realized it. The defeated monster rolled over several times and flew far to the side. The protagonist exhaled and stretched his slightly bruised leg. However, the hordes of monsters kept arriving and surrounding the adventurer, and still in sync, they pounced on the guy from all sides. But with each new wave of opponents, it became easier and easier for Ark to kill them. A while later, when there weren't any living monsters left around, the guy used level absorption. Numerous glowing beams immediately rushed towards him from all sides. From that moment on, Ark possessed an incredible 2960th level. Meanwhile, the battle was being closely watched by someone sitting on a throne. He tapped his finger nervously on the armrests, realizing that all the followers had been destroyed. The spirit was convinced that their main adversary was not nicknamed the Abyss Suppressor for nothing. Suddenly, the creature clenched its fist and said that very soon not only Repialum, but the entire world would be in its power. Spirit Emperor Galbatus Repialum said that if anyone got in his way, he would personally get rid of that insolent person. He then looked at the Abyss Corps opposite him and asked if it was satisfied. At the same moment that Ark raised his level, the armor suddenly called out to its owner. The voice said it wanted to talk about what had plunged this land into terror. He asked to be rid of the tyranny of Galbatus Repialum. At this point, Ark was greatly surprised that the armor was asking him for such logical things. Suddenly, a voice addressed the guy by name for the first time in all this time. He asked Ark to fulfill his request. In return, the armor told him that his real name was Abyss Suppressor. He has ruled the Void Realm, where true evil resides since ancient times, and has kept it in check with his powers all this time. At the same moment, Falk said it was all very suspicious. By then, the group had already reached the huge tree. They had officially entered Galbada's territory, but no one met them. But Ark no longer cared about what was happening. He was interested in what was happening to the armor. The voice explained that they didn't have time, as surely the opponents already knew they were here. Armor explained that they would be sure to deal with Galbatas first, and after that, he would tell the owner everything. Ark was completely confused about everything that was going on. Everything the voice had just told him was intertwined in one incomprehensible web of facts. Before the armor finished speaking, he didn't utter another word. The protagonist closed his eyes, once again realizing that he had no idea what that voice was even talking about. Suddenly, the lad was pulled back by Falk, who eyed the brooding hero suspiciously. Then the spirit smiled and held out a fist to his partner. He lightly nudged Ark in the shoulder and told him that he should pull himself together. After all, they were all relying on him. The boy sighed heavily and apologized to Falk. After that, the spirit looked around and explained that there were usually huge hordes of monsters around this tree. They protect their master in every way possible and don't even let them get close to the entrance. Afterward, Falk explained that this was originally their family's castle and he lived here. However, it is now the Galbatus' dwelling place. After pondering what he heard, Mr. Girai said that if there were no soldiers here, they must be trapped. Mael excitedly said that maybe they should back off then. But suddenly, Mina said that there was a possibility that this was their only chance for an attack. It was possible that all the forces were focused on destroying the shelter. Falk agreed with the girl's musings. He confirmed thoughtfully that there was a high probability that they would not have another chance to kill Galbatus. 
Otherwise, if they retreated, they would be unlikely to be able to repel their enemies and defend the last garden next time. Therefore, the prince resolutely said that this time he wanted to take an informed risk. Ark looked at Falk with a smile, though there was some uncertainty within him. After the group came to a common decision, the adventurers and spirit headed for the entrance, determined that they would end this for good. Upon entering the castle, the travelers found that the inside was also completely empty. Looking around, Mina assumed this had once been a ballroom. Falk had said their family used to hold receptions here. Suddenly, the door on the second floor opened abruptly, and a dark figure appeared on its threshold. The travelers immediately prepared their weapons to defend themselves. Galbatus Repialum arose in the passage and asked the Abyss Suppressor if he liked his domain. The Emperor's spirit looked at his opponent with contempt and said that he was not surprised in taking his friends to certain death. At that moment, of the entire group, only Ark realized that the spirit was not addressing him, but his armor. The Emperor slowly began to descend the stairs. He said that the Abyss Suppressor and his friends were threatening his plan. Galbatus Repialum amplified his aura, saying that he would destroy anyone who interfered with him. Suddenly, Ark interrupted his opponent, ordering him to answer why he had betrayed his people. He asked a few more similar questions, but the Emperor immediately grabbed his face and started laughing. Galbatus's laughter became so intense that it simply overpowered all of the main character's words. Suddenly, he looked at his opponent frantically and said that he didn't even know anything about what had happened. The Emperor did not stop laughing, shouting that he had gotten some fools as opponents. Suddenly, his body began to change its shape. Strange-looking tentacles began to emerge from beneath the cloak. The Emperor's face was covered by a dense shell, yet had only one eye. The monster loomed menacingly over his opponents, shouting that the only thing they could do right now was to die needlessly and uselessly. Almost immediately, Ark decided he wasn't going to fight from defense. In the next instant, he pounced on the monster. The creature backed off a bit and sort of deliberately put its arm up to hit the guy. However, the blade did not sever the Emperor's limb. Galbatus looked at his opponent with his one eye and asked if that was all the boy was capable of. The monster then swung away from his opponent, knocking him backwards. Ark slid across the ground, keeping his footing. Galbatus said the boy would never beat him with that kind of strength. The monster laughed and said that he had expected much more from the Abyss Suppressor. By this point, the Emperor had 3,200th level. Ark's similar score was 240 units lower. Galbatus reached out to the boy and said he would personally destroy the Abyss armor and its owner. Just then, a bright beam shot out of the monster's finger in Ark's direction. The strength of this ability made the ground beneath the guy's feet crackle. Ark managed to bounce to the side, and the laser passed him by. The monster swept the beam across the wall of the house, shredding the room in a single motion. Debris began to fall from the ceiling, which Mill dodged with great difficulty. Seeing that the girl was hidden behind a cloud of dust, Ark turned around and asked if she was okay. Mill yelled that she was in one piece and she was fine. The incident had a negative effect on Falk. He gritted his teeth and apologized to the travelers who had been caught up in it. However, Gurias, who was standing nearby, patted the spirit on the shoulder. He said the guy shouldn't worry about it, since they agreed to it themselves and went after him. The old man pointed to the main entrance of the building and added that it looked like they had some guests they had to deal with. He looked at Falk and asked if he wanted to help him with that. Hearing this, the main character said that the level of the main boss was 3,200 units, so anyone who was much weaker than that value had better really get away from here. Falk looked at Ark excitedly. However, the guy showed the glowing crystal on his armor and said he didn't have to worry about him. The protagonist assured his new friend that he would surely defeat the evil that had ruined Repialum. Lastly, he said he would fight to the end, so no one should worry about him. After the rest of the group left the outside of the building, Ark looked over and saw that the candles on the chandelier were lit. He pointed his blade at Galbatus and asked if he wanted to dance with him now that they were in the ballroom. The monster once again aimed its laser beam at Ark. This time, however, the guy was dodging very diligently, gradually getting closer to the enemy. Getting as close as possible, Ark soared into the air and swung his blades. Flying directly over the Emperor's head, the protagonist delivered several powerful blows, but all of them were without results, as the monster covered himself with his hand. Then the creature swatted the guy away again like an annoying fly, knocking him to the ground. The claws on Galbatus's feet dug into the floor as if growing into it. In the same second, several tentacles erupted from the ground next to the nearby hero. While the guy frantically fought off this unexpected attack, the monster asked if the brat wanted to surprise him with some worthless attack. In flight, Ark didn't notice one of the monster's arms coming close to him. The creature opened its mouth, looked at its opponent, 
and simply snapped its fingers. After that, a terrible scream was heard in the house. Ark sat on the ground, tired. Sweat trickled down his body. He was exhausted after a few minutes of fighting. With a snap of his fingers, the monster threw him off with such force that a huge dent was made in the wall the guy had slammed into. The situation was getting worse. After struggling to rise to his feet, the adventurer asked the armor if there was any skill that would help defeat the emperor. However, the voice did not utter a word in response. Ark called to the armor of the abyss once more irritably. He repeatedly shouted his question, but the suit still remained silent. Almost desperate, the guy said that the opponent in front of them was the one the abyss suppressor wanted to defeat. Suddenly, after a few more seconds of silence, the armor announced that the capture of the enemy was complete. This was the first time Ark had heard such a command and asked what it meant. Unexpectedly, the Abyss Suppressor said that Galbatus was not their main target originally, but he did ask to overpower him. However, the Spirit Emperor is merely a blank slate. He has been granted incredible power, and it is this beneficiary who is their main target. Ark asked Suppressor in surprise who their main enemy was. Armor replied that he had been doing just that all along, and so he didn't answer. Yet still, after many years, he managed to find a source of strength. Suddenly, a crystal appeared in purple fire in front of the protagonist. Armor said it was the Abyss of Destruction, and it was their main enemy. Crystal leaned toward Ark. Then a strange voice said that it seemed the jokes were over. Suddenly, the Spirit Emperor's body began to change. The Abyss of Destruction announced that it was granting Galbatus even more power. The monster examined his hand again and muttered that it was indeed a godsend. His body began to increase in size even more. The Emperor finally felt the gift filling him with new power. The Abyss of Destruction announced to its follower that it had granted him even more power. The crystal then ordered the bug to be crushed in a single blow. In the next instant, the huge monster pounced on Ark, who out of horror had no time to react. A blow of tremendous force came straight to the chest of the guy, who had no time to do anything. The protagonist immediately dropped his sword and felt incredible pain. His body flew out of the window of the mansion with great speed and flew far into the field. After doing numerous somersaults, the guy stopped and stopped moving. At the same instant, another explosion occurred in the building, destroying a huge portion of the mansion's wall. In the next second, the monster was right in front of the guy's body. Realizing that his opponent had finally been defeated, Galbatus raised his head and roared loudly. Meanwhile, Ark woke up in an incomprehensible space. The boy looked around in surprise and asked where he was. A familiar voice from behind said that the main character was currently unconscious. Ark turned around and saw a strange creature in front of him that looked like his armor. The Abyss Suppressor said that as long as he wore this suit, he would not be harmed by Galbatus' attacks. The entity explained that the host would wake up very soon. The guy asked if he was really talking to the Abyss armor. He then clarified, saying that it would be more correct to call his ally an Abyss Suppressor. The creature moved closer, reminding him that it didn't matter, for Ark should realize that when he woke up, he would have to rush back into battle. The Suppressor sat down right in front of his partner. He finally decided to tell him the whole story. The entity asked if the protagonist really wanted to know how the Abyss armor was born. Ark looked seriously at his interlocutor and nodded his head confidently. After a brief silence, the suppressor said that in ancient times, this world was ruled by beings called the Abyss. He recalled that one of them Ark had recently defeated. These creatures wreaked havoc and destruction across the world, and their paths were lined with mountains of corpses. And to end all this suffering of mankind, a hero god was born. He volunteered to get rid of all these creatures by sealing them in another dimension. It was this god who created the realm of abyss and void. However, it wasn't enough to send all these creatures to another dimension. Their power was so great that they made it out of there into the human world time after time. Realizing that these escapes would never stop, the hero god himself went to the world he had created to ensure that, from now on, not a single spawn would leave the intended dimension. That was how he came to rule the realm of abyss and void earning his title of Abyss Suppressor. Gaining more and more levels time after time, the hero god became so omnipotent that he himself could create skills at will. Even this kingdom itself was created because of his ability. However, the most important skill that the hero god had created was called Level Absorption. He was going to use it to reduce the monster population. However, the creatures in the realm were immortal. For some time after the defeat, they would rise again. However, every time the enemy was killed, the hero god still absorbed his level. By doing so, he grew stronger and stronger, having lived in such a restless rhythm for several centuries. Ark was now satisfied that the hero god and the abyss suppressor were one and the same person. Armor said he wasn't smug enough to call himself god. 
That's the nickname people gave him. However, based on his line of work, the name Abyss Suppressor fits better. Continuing the tale of his realm, the armor told that 500 years ago, a creature appeared in the abyss that was able to escape from the dimension. This crystal was immediately dubbed the Abyss Destroyer. He was the one who granted the strength to Galbadis. This was done because, in the human world, the Abyss Dwellers had no bodies of their own and could not survive. Each such monster needs its own vessel. Suppressor suggests that for a time, the Abyss Destroyer protected the spiritual lands and granted them power by becoming their guardian. However, he gradually drove the ruler of the lands mad, promising him incredible power and authority. Since then, the Destroyer's power has encompassed almost all spirit lands. The hero god had to leave the dimension for the first time in years, but he also had no body. Therefore, the Suppressor found nothing better than to place his soul in armor, thought he could quickly find a suitable owner and start chasing the Destroyer with him. However, that was a big mistake. Anyone who tried to put it on over the years would eventually fail with the power bestowed upon them. People who received the level absorption ability ended up just going insane. As a result, the life of any wearer turned into a nightmare and ended in imminent death. People began to bypass it, calling the suit the cursed armor. For many years, the suppressor existed, hidden from human eyes as a dangerous artifact that everyone was afraid to approach. But one day came when the dungeon in which he was kept was attacked by the destroyer of worlds. In the rush of battle, the dragon devoured the armor. As expected, no one was able to defeat the creature that day. The monster flew away with impunity. After a while, the creature settled in a cave near the village of Rakura. It was there that an adventurer named Baldar caught up with him and cut the dragon's life short. The rotting but still alive monster continued to lie in the cave. Some time after this incident, the first meeting between Ark and the suppressor took place. Ironically, someone who possessed the zero experience skill was the only one who was suited for this armor. After finishing the story, the hero god stood up and thanked Ark for the fact that thanks to him they were able to cleanse this world of evil and finally the root of all problems. Suppressor turned his back to his partner and said that all they had to do was take the final step and kill the monster. Otherwise, if they missed the destroyer this time as well, the creatures of the abyss would break into this world once again. And in that case, there's a good chance that humanity will be wiped out altogether. Immediately after these words, the suppressor reached out to the protagonist and said that he wanted his only owner to help him in his final battle. Ark returned the handshake and took a deep breath. Suddenly, he heard a great roar and opened his eyes. Abruptly, the protagonist stepped out of the killing blow and said that he understood everything perfectly. Stopping where he was, Ark realized he now had something to thank his partner for. It was this armor that made the guy an adventurer, and now, when it comes to saving all of humanity, he has no right to lose his last battle. Pet the cat!